welcome to Making Comics for the First Time. I am going to be your presenter and host today uh, for part one of two. Dom is also here. He'll be also be taking control of everything uh, tomorrow for part two of two. He does the art stuff, but he definitely is here to give insights and comments as though we are working in a studio together, which happens a lot in different industries. So uh, let me see if I can get this working here. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to be using a PowerPoint as my main way of explaining things. Let's see if I get that there. Does everybody see that? I hope so. If you don't see uh, <laughs> a PowerPoint screen on your screen right now, do put your hand up or say something in the chat. Somebody will be monitoring that. So let's see. Come on. I'm trying to click through right now. Ah, there we go. So I'm Howard Wong, and today we'll be running from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're talking, we'll be touching upon world building, character development, which we did last week, but we, I'll be doing a quick version of it today. For those who didn't make it last week, and we're also going to be going through story to script. And then what I also need you guys to grab is some paper and something to write with as, we, as I banter off on what's going to be happening today and tomorrow. As like I mentioned, tomorrow will be Dominic's uh, session where we do part two of two. And then again, it'll run from 10 to 12. And he'll be taking whatever I write here today and hopefully <laughs> be able to understand what I wrote so he can make a great page layout and some design stuff and some artwork as well for that. So if you have any questions that I mentioned, always pop them in the chat and we'll get to them as quickly as we can. So today's run through, uh, I'll introduce myself and what I do in my background. So you can ask questions about that too. Going from ideas, story to scripts, on also talking about lettering, a little more detailed there, composition layouts lightly. Uh, as a writer, you'll understand why you'll need that. And something called story time, which we'll be talking about as I do this. And at the end, if you still have questions, definitely at the end, do ask those. Those are great and it helps everybody who's here too. So I work in comic books and I write everything from superhero books like Iron Man. Uh, <laughs> and those who are Star Trek fans from the original one, this is, is George Takei's uh, anthology basically about his life, which we did stories with theme based. So I have one in there as well. Uh, also, Giant Robots. This is actually for a toy company, which I'll get to in a second. And also wrote a, ch a children's book, which is interesting enough. And then horror and monsters and other things too. So you can write any kind of comic books uh, out there. I also work in mobile games, writing the stories, dialogues, and unfortunately naming every single item you have in games, which sounds like fun, but it is a lot of work. And trying not to repeat everything is one of the key things for that. Also work in toys. This was actually for Bandai 3.0. It's a giant samurai robot, um, which was a lot of fun to work on because as a kid, this is sort of a dream project. <laughs> on this. And when he found out I did comic books, uh, the creator of this toy, uh, Kuno-san, who is also the uh, mech designer of uh, Gundam, uh, asked me to write a uh, script, a uh, promo comic for the toy launch. So... It has samurai robots and also shinobi slash ninja robots as well. They are piloted by samurai ninjas back in the past. I also work on stuff like this. You probably under who know who this person is. That's like Dave from Minions. And I would write things for the app. Basically all the content that you see, instructions and the dialogue that he says because apparently they have a dictionary. And a, well, a dictionary of terms and also a translator kind of thing, but it's all on paper of what they say. So I actually know what they're saying for real, but I can't tell you because uh, we have something called a non-disclosure agreement. So I'm not really wanting to see Universal Ninjas pop down from my rooftop and get me. So I'll keep my mouth shut on stuff that I know from that. I also do copywriting, so websites and ads and whatnot. And also one of my favorite things I like to do is narrative con uh, concept and content development which I've done for Bungie and currently doing for National Geographic Asia uh, on marine biodiversity and other things that relate to the ocean. Um, because it's an active project, 
I can't talk about it. And for Bungie, their NDA is insane. So <laughs> I don't know when I'll be able to talk to it because it's still in development. So we'll see how when I can talk about that. Talk about what else Bungie has worked on and give them an eye, maybe a, an idea. Oh, of the realm. Uh, Bungie. Uh, they worked on Halo. And for those who may or may not like the word, but they also do Destiny as well. And they, and I can tell you right now, those who, who worked on Destiny, I worked, I basically worked with people who were, were on that team for Destiny, and I do apologize for that story <laughs> of having nothing at the end of it. There was no payoff for the original story. So they, re, they were trying to retool that aspect with Destiny. And one of the main caveats for me to jump on was to make sure that it had a beginning, middle, end for their new project. Um, I can't tell you what it's for or what's it about, but it's something completely different than what they're doing, and it's fantastic. It's one of those things where I didn't think they would ever do something like this, so I'm, well, I was really happy to be at least at the initial uh, development part of it. So um, I know I think they're having a, a Halo TV show, if I'm right. That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's uh, right. The Master Chief, and so I remember seeing some some footage of it, but I can't remember when it's coming out. But I think it's this year. I don't can't call it, man. No, uh, I don't work for my dream. They're, they're, they're filming it right now, and uh, the Halo series should appear and stream. Uh, I forgot which platform. Peacock? I'm not too sure. But oh. uh, sometime like the next uh, late spring, early summer. Wow, oh, awesome. So that's going to be exciting because they're going to follow the, I, I assume, the original Halo mm -hmm. series, the first one, and then move on from there, I guess. But we'll see. That's right. So if you want to find uh, find me anywhere on social media, this is the link to find me. Uh, it has everything from my blog to every social media uh, profile that I have. So it's Linktree, but with a period between the R and E's slash the real Howard Wong. And you can find me there. It'll link up to this page and it will, you can click on every, you can click on anything here to find me. So let's start going from idea to comic. So I'm going to talk about this, these two parts and lightly touch this because this is, this is Dom's, you know, domain for sure. But we'll get to why we should know that as well. And if I may, I'd like to add that this, uh, for all you guys that are attending this workshop, this is excellent because you actually will see legitimately, especially for the nature of this workshop from beginning to end their ABC, the whole creative process, especially when you're working like two creatives, two sides. If you do it yourself independently, this is still the same measure process where the story development wow. in order to attain that visual aspect. And then for me is to understand what fits best with the narrative of the story, working with the writer, and that will be tomorrow's session. So you, you guys are really going to see the whole process, like how a, like the two creators work collaborate together from you know, like a, a, a to Z. We also, you also see the banter that we'll have <laughs> and discussions as well. <laughs> so quick thing. I mean, I mentioned this actually in our last workshop last week for uh, creating, char creating characters, but this applies obviously to story as well. So inspiration can come from obviously any kind of media, books you've read, comic books, movies, music, toys, and video games. Uh, music is a is, is a, a ongoing thing for me because I usually t listen to different kind of soundtracks and scores um, when I write for like so I'm writing an action scene. Obviously, it would have something that that I remember from a film that I liked, so that gives me into the right mindset for things like that. Um, also, looking and making it art that's one of my favorite ones too. I mean, you don't have to purposely draw something; you can go abstract just to let your mind be a more flexible and ready to create something out of nothing and talking with others this is one of the things that i stress a lot um, a lot of us like to create things on our own and for a good reason because it's your it's your personal creation but when you start talking to people and this is why people work in studios and there's uh, creative hubs uh, all over the world is because you inspire each other and it makes you develop your idea much further than you would do by yourself so that's one of the things. And for those who are wondering, yes, doing chores really does help you. Um, people think I kind of laugh and I usually do this uh, with the younger crowds when I do, when the world was different and I was doing uh, tours here and here, here and there of schools and stuff. Why is doing chores important? Because you need that pause away from, believe it or not, media. 
and your cell phones and your laptops. You need that quiet time for your brain to create something. When your brain's too busy in being uh, engaged with things, you won't be able to create something. Because you always find that when you're t when you're like in the shower or going for a walk and you're not looking at your phone, you start coming up with ideas. It's because your brain will automatically do that. So it's sort of that weird reversal training where you have to disengage from the inspiration for a bit, sit down, be quiet, and let your brain do its thing. So that's actually an important thing that a lot of people have forgotten to do. So I mentioned about story time earlier in my in my uh, run through. So story time is basically when we get our pens or pencils and paper to do things, including myself. So here, because um, some people who did not be able to make the workshop yet last week, I keep saying yesterday here, but yet last week, we're gonna quickly build a character or two or three or four, if you are able to do that, that's totally fine. We're also gonna do a little world building, which, um, we're going to touch upon very lightly here. World building for me is actually a whole entire workshop, but we're going to do a quick version of it so we can get into the nitty gritty of today's uh, workshop. So we can, you know, let your mind go and let, you can create anything from people, aliens, robots, monsters. For world building, you don't, it doesn't have to necessarily be on, you know, on earth or in a city or a town that you know, it could be anything. It could be a fictitious place, it could be a planet, it could be in a fantasy world, it doesn't matter. It's really up to you. So we're going to put that together. So let's start with this. I'm gonna keep this up for a bit. Um, so if you have uh, something to write with and some paper, you can work with this as I talk. So do write or draw or both, because you don't, there's no, there's no set process for this. I scribble, I doodle, and I write. So I do both of these things. So write or draw the kind of, what kind of character do you want? Do you have a person, animal, alien, what have you, or mix and match, you can combine them. Maybe you have a monster robot or an animal monster, whatever it may be, uh, an alien animal, it's up to you. And then we'll look at the three core things that will make your character stand out not just the visuals so we're looking at their personality their background and what like what i like to call the important stuff so for personality think about things are they kind are they mean they're shy outgoing aggressive are they afraid of everything it's up to you you can make it you can this is obviously up to you to choose as well as their background that will define some of the personality that you just picked out. You know, are they in school? Are they working? They're an athlete. They're stuck in an office that they hate, or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and then you have important stuff, things that help your artist and reader understand who they are. What does that mean? Um, important stuff is key things that will make them unique. So, like for Batman, it would be the moment, the day his parents uh, met their end, which defined, which created uh, that path for him to become Batman. And uh, this kind of sounds sad. I, just, I thought it's Spider Man. Spider Man has sort of come with some of the same thing. Do we lost Uncle Ben um, or the Flash? Uh, he got hit, he was in his lab. He was a uh, CSI a criminal a scene investigator, and he. You, they work with different chemicals to look for evidence and then uh, lightning bolts uh, struck the chemicals when he was near it and they basically turned him into the flash giving him abilities of speed uh, so it could be a lot of those those kind of things uh, to things like uh, oh, I'll jump back to DC comics because in my head right now mr. freeze uh, Victor freeze was a scientist and he uh, well, uh, in layman terms, he froze his wife because she had an illness that was, could not uh, be cured uh, currently. So he was hoping that he could slow down uh, her death and in hopes that somebody can find a cure for her before that moment happens. But he had, had an accident so that he became a living popsicle, I guess if you can call it that. So he doesn't go out and start attacking people to be a villain because he's bad and evil. He's doing it because he's trying to find be it uh, things to make money or 
uh, research materials to find the cure for his wife. So that's an important thing that defines him. And his background, as I'm, his background would be like a scientist and also a loving husband. Uh, his personality is very determined and you know, uh, loyal and what have you. So those things will be your character. These are the three things that you know, every character should have for them to be functional in the story. And for those of you who did go to the um, workshop last week, you can definitely definitely use your character you created uh, th during that time, because I am. I'm going to be doing that with Dom, So because Dom worked pretty hard on that, and I don't want to waste his efforts. So I'm going to be using that same character, so I'm going to see if I can flip over to my screen to show you that one. Let's see, can I share that one? So don't worry, I'll go back to the other screen if you guys need it, but this is the detailed character sheet. This is not how I started. How I started, let me go back to that sheet if I can find that. Da, 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 da. Oh, I can't find it. So we'll stick here for a bit. I'm going to see if I can flip back to that in a minute, or maybe I can. But this is the detailed character sheet where I, bro I broke down uh, my chicken scratches I did on the piece of paper to give Dom so you can see you know, clearly what, what's going on here. So everything from the usual stuff, name, race, age, height, all that stuff. This is the visual stuff. I tend to do this last, especially the name. The name is always ongoing and changing. What I like to do is sometimes jump down to the, you know, near where I talked about, uh, let's see, the important stuff. I usually start here first um, because it defines everything else. So sometimes I'm like, what's important about this character? I'll make it stand out so I can build my character from here. So I look at the important stuff. So in this case, in the story takes place in the future, futuristic time when aliens and magic exist, along with the advanced tech and all that comes with it. And I gave him a little note. Think of Final Fantasy VII, which is a real game time, you know, mixed with Voltron. The Hagar aspect, which is actually a character who's a witch in the sci-fi uh, animated series, and a little bit old school stuff from mythology, Medusa. So I mix, I mix. We, we're going to mix these things together and see what happens. So he has a quick idea. Uh, then I start looking at maybe the background of the character. So I would write something, something like this, something short, nothing too long. I never give like a whole like essay for these kind of things to artists because I just want them to get the grasp of it. And as for yourself, if you're doing this for yourself, you can make this even shorter I guess, if you're the artist as well. But just a quick blur because questions can always be asked. Dom will definitely ask me questions throughout uh, after he reads it and it's like he'll make notes and he'll ask me things and I can fill in details. Maybe he'll ask me questions I didn't even think about dancing before and I'm like, hey, I didn't think of that point and now I've added. So as I mentioned, the background helps with a bit of the story as well. So this is sort of like the reversal way of making a story. It's a jumping off point. That's why I like doing the background first, because it makes me go, OK, this character will exist in this world. What kind of story am I going to do? I don't know. Let's, let's think of background. So I would start. I started off with which that who was in training. Uh, they were in love with a mage. I'm obviously not reading out what I wrote. I'm just giving a, a quick version of it. And she got tricked by her mentor and became up to, to become a monster. And she cursed her because she was also in love with the mage as well. Um, and then a little surprise part is that the mage uh, protected their unborn child and turned him into a uh, jewel that is a part of the now witch monster. So she can protect both herself and her their unborn child until they figure out how to break the curse. So that defines the story, but also defines my character of who she is and stuff. So I'm going to go back to here. Okay. Definitely different. All right. So there's any questions by any chance? I mean, I'll keep this on for a couple more seconds for people who just showed up. I think I saw, saw some people show up. I could be wrong. I think we're okay. Is everybody okay for me to move on? I know the other person there seemed pretty vocal. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. A little bit of personality trait right there, right? Eh? I just thought it was funny. It's like reading the description about like how Meta Ursa, they're the monster form. And then it's like, oh, you know, that would, that would actually be a good sound, maybe. <laughs> 
Well, like, you know, um, as I tell a lot of people, use everything you know and everything you you come across in your writing. So that may come up come up a pretty part of the story as well. Okay. So now that we're done this, and don't worry, if, if I'm going faster than you can do it, don't worry. I can always flip back if you need it uh, and you can get back to it. Let's see here. I'm making sure that it works. Yes, we're good. Now we're going to talk about world building. Now, as I mentioned, I usually do a whole workshop for this, but we're going to do a quick version. And mainly what world building does is to tell where the story takes place, especially for your artist and reader and yourself first and foremost, because if you don't know where your story takes place, it's kind of hard to write a story. So if we look at the blue here. There's a three core things that you should have. What kind of genre is it? What kind of background you're looking at? And what's the important stuff? So for genre, yeah, kind of story. It could be historical fiction, sci-fi, superhero, Western, or you can mix and match these things. Maybe it's a historical fiction Western, or maybe it's a sci-fi Western or what have you. So you can make it up. And if you're not sure, you know, what kind of genres are out there, if you have Netflix, they have more subgenres and genres you can you can imagine. Well, so what subgenres are are like so they taking superhero or something that you see here and seeing the other things that can come out of it. So uh, so the background we're looking at not the physical background necessarily. We look at events that change the world. Uh, if it was a historical fiction, obviously we will have made it like World War II, World War I, things like that. And then we look at geography, the actual lay of the land. Is it is, are your story taking place in a place like an island, or is it in the Arctic with just snow and ice? Um, maybe it's in the African field and plains and something like that. So you got to think of this as well. Technology is a key thing, what kind of technology there is. And then as well as uh, if there's if magic exists, will change your stuff as well. So anyways, so how, how is it so far for everybody? I'm going to quickly jump over to Dom and ask him how does he feel about everything so far? So uh, one thing is like what's very important with everything is that Howard is pointing out, but in terms of the world building is that there are our last weekend's uh, workshop regarding character development is that it's not just with the character, but like based on these details, how does that world react to that character? So it's like, you know, how does it react to the characters that they interact with? You know, it's all about like when he was talking about like in this case, the character that we were doing last uh, last week is the culmination of both uh, fantasy, magic and futuristic sci-fi. So it gives a lot of creative freedom. But you don't have to go that extent. You can go very, very realistic or very simple. But, you know, whatever fits within the context of the character, you know, it's that way that when they interact with that environment, it all makes sense and everything is uniform. And then the, it allows the readers to just, you know, be immersed in it. But when Howard writes these notes, it also helps me uh, to establish like certain details, like how the panels will work and how they react. So it's like a lot of these things are actually instrumental for combo panel layout so it's like if i really want to do a panel specifically that's, that's even though there's only like maybe two three lines of text but based on the description how it puts in it's like it establishes the world then i know how much detail i have to put in and then how big i have to do the panel which is something that we're going to cover tomorrow right all right so as he, as don mentioned that's the important you have to give basically <laughs> your artist and reader, the important stuff. So they understand what's going on and how your world affects the story and stuff. So the important stuff um, are things that your artist and your, your artist will need to to do their thing. It's not, you know, yes, to draw it, but to have that stylistic idea, the direction, the tone. I know that I, 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 I both love and hate that word tone because if it, it, what it means is that if it's like a dark, scary story and it takes place in a really dreary part of time or your story takes place in like a dark fairy tale, 
your artists would need to know that because if not, they'll start drawing, you know, rainbows and and unicorns in, in a in a dark story, in a dark story, which kind of may not make sense. So that's what the important stuff is about. So and uh, I'll refer we proceed. Rosa had a question uh, regarding that last uh, slide. There are those the three you know, like important points there for world building. Uh, you and I would I think would both agree that that is the perfect foundation to build like you're not limited to those three but if you start with those three the net the, the rest will naturally follow in terms of details yeah. or kind of uh whether or like you know the politics or like you know the 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 re uh, religions of, or the mythologies of that world or the terminology stuff like that that will all like naturally uh flow through as you develop those those three primary uh, ba uh bases <clears throat> I have a question here. Let's see if I can get back to it. Sorry about the, you know, the other person scribbling on the page. So let's go back to things if you guys need to. So Rose has asked, so when doing a quick world building, do you just get these three points? Uh, yes, I, I will definitely start with these three points. And you can definitely add a lot more to this. Um, both Dominic, between Dominic and I, we've worked uh, Almost in every freaking creative industry, I think. Holy fuck. Um, toys, video games, uh, animation, comics, obviously. Music. Um, it's all, music. That, that's the, between you and me, okay, you did music. You also did toys. You also did... What else did you do? Film, animation. Films. films TV. Some video games. I like say TV. Yeah, I wouldn't say TV show, but it's more like... Um, I guess VO... Oh. I was gonna say VOD, VO, video on demand. Yeah, I used to do quite a lot of those video on demand, old blockbuster, uh, yeah, <laughs> direct so, video, stuff like direct that. Yeah. rent. We're, we're, we're aging, I, I was we're aging ourselves. I didn't want to say that, but I was like, oops. But well, anyways, but so all of that has uh, those three core things I mentioned, but then you take it in different directions, um, like. A quick world building exercise I did last week is if you take a character like Iron Man and you know where he lives. He lives in on Earth. He lives in New York City. I know he can live anywhere, but as I say, he lives in New York City and 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 the Avengers Tower, which he owns. If you change one aspect of his world, say okay, now he lives underwater. That's where he starts and that's where he lives. Then you start building the world around him. Like how would he exist in that world that now he's you know he lives underwater? So, you know, you're looking at technology, you're looking at, you know, what part of the ocean on Earth he's living, well, you know, how does that affect other things? It's always, it's always, a, it's always like, um, like a puzzle that you're building together without knowing what the puzzle will look like. I know it's kind of, kind of weird, but you start feeding in pieces uh, that make sense. So if he was living underwater, you know, jets, you know, having little jets in his suit, probably wouldn't make the most sense because how would that, how would that really function underwater? So you would change that for a different kind of technology. He needs to breathe underwater, so that changes some different kind of technology. There's a density in the water so that he can get crushed. So his suit would have to, you know, be able to handle that if he's living there all in a full time. So um, where's the technology come from? How's it developed? Uh, was it developed before, you know, he existed? So your world building, um, is about the world but as you can sort of see as i talk about it it feeds into store it feeds into character because everything is interrelated so there's no such i know as though i'm teaching though i'm teaching it uh in compartmentalized sections all these things bleed into each other it's all gray area so you have to try to think it singularly first when you start doing this but then you'll start seeing how everything is like part of this and part of that at the same time it is because if it doesn't if your things don't start bleeding into each other as you do this, then and they're totally separate, then you have a, a bit of a struggle of how to put them together. If that makes sense. Um, but you, you'll see it when I start doing the story how that put, comes together. Um, so we talked about a little bit world building. We talked about characters. I did not talk about plot. I'm not going to go dive into this because as you do these two things, this is a sort of a, I guess tip or trick the reality is when you start world building and creating characters you already have a bit of this well no one's going to tell you that but you, you already have a pretty good part of this done the plot of your story um what we usually do from the plot we would write our story depending on uh, who you're working with or, or for you might have to create a synopsis uh or a slash breakdown 
Uh, it's kind of weird. Technically, these are two different things, but uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of people out there think, uh, unfortunately, in the businesses that we work in, uh, believe this is like one thing, and it usually ends up becoming this. Though this is technically shorter, and this is more preferred for writers. I won't for obvious reasons because it's shorter, but it ends up being this. That's that's okay. I mean, this helps you get to this part where you turn a story into a comic book script because. You, you, you know, when you start out, this helps a lot. So you can see your scenes, your scene breakdowns and where things flow. So do you need to do a synopsis all the time? No, definitely know how to do it. If you know, then you, because people might ask you for that. Uh, my, my lit agent says she wants this, but it always comes be always right afterwards and the same in the next email will be this. So I usually just go to this now <laughs> these days. Um, so as I said, it depends where you know where you are, and what you're doing, and who you're doing it with. That defines how that happens and where, how you do it. So, because I'm not going to jump into plot, and that's a plot uh, deeply today. This is a we're going to call this a plot slash story. Not really, but for today's exercise, you can definitely do the same thing. Write a sentence or two when we get to it. So this is actually from my Iron Man comic book called Iron Man Hon uh, Hong Kong Heroes. So this was like my quick one-line pitch uh, at the meeting when they asked me at the get-go if I had any ideas for a story for this. So Iron Man's in Hong Kong for a Stark Expo uh, when evil Hydra robots attack. A new hero emerges to help him and the Avengers. It's very simple. You can sort of see how it starts and sort of how it ends and you definitely know in the middle it's going to be a big battle so very self-explanatory we're gonna i'm gonna tell you i want to show be showing you guys how how this works and don't sweat this a lot of people when they see this oh my god what is this this is one of many ways of scripting a comic book so definitely don't sweat this part this is just one of the easier ways for me to explain this and i will touch upon um, the other versions, but not show them because you can find them online. So by the end of today, we're going to go from here to visualizing this because Dom's going to be helping you this because as a writer, you have a you have a concept of this. You, if you're an artist writer, and I hate you for your multiple skills, and you can definitely jump into this real quickly. And some of the guys who, who are artists sometimes do this first and then go here afterwards. Can you do that? Absolutely. I know a few artists ready to do that. So there's no like def definitive way of how to do this. Let's see here. So the first thing I want to talk about are these things. These little squares and rectangles I have on this page here. These are called panels. Panels are the small boxes that divide up the page, as you can see here. As you see uh, the last time, the last slide I had there, there were different shapes. And you notice that when I, if I do a layout, I would do this because it's just easier for me to lay out a page. But when the artist gets the hand, uh, hold of it, of the script, they can change it. You notice that the first panel is not a rectangle. It actually takes up the entire page. And then he also slanted these out a little bit more. I'm not going to go into shapes and <laughs> into shapes. Well, well, actually, we'll be covering that uh, tomorrow. Exactly. I'm, I'm trying to leave things for Dom to say <laughs> as, well, as well. Yeah, leave me some material. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Now, if anything from this part of the workshop, this is something that I still hammer into new writers and artists and some don't get it. Some of them are actually working, believe it or not, in the industries. You don't get it. This is the Z or Z pattern, depending which part of the border you're from. In Canada, we call it Z, and South is Z. So this is the direction we read comics from left, down, and right. Um, we write our kind of book scripts in this with this in mind. So if I wrote a lot of words uh, here and there, it won't be easy for this to flow to happen. Um, and it's weird because people think. When I when I showed this graphic, it's like this the whole page, just I just have to follow this. Yes, each panel that you do that you think about in your script and on your page should flow like like the shape of a 
I'm just going to use just said because it's just easier for me to not repeat both. So the Z pattern here, but each panel should have a Z in itself as well. So if I was in this panel, you should read from here to here to here to here. That makes sense. So each panel should have a, a, a Z pattern as well. Okay. And the most important thing as a writer is to that this is a team based thing. If, if unless you're the artist as well, then you know, <laughs> you're just arguing with yourself. The artist decides the page layout and where the panels will be on the page because the, you know, they are the experts <clears throat> for this. And I couldn't tell, I completely trust my, my artist. My, my artist uh, who's working on my stuff. Oh, you fool. <laughs> uh, I know. We'll see, that. we'll see how that goes tomorrow. So story time, people. So take out your uh, piece of paper, writing instrument. We're going to write a short story that includes these three things. A slavish your world type of story. A conflict. And a resolution. These three small things. We're not going to be writing a huge comic book. Let's Try to keep it to one page to make it very easy and doable. Think of it as like the 24 hour comic. No, no, that's, that's an a, excellent no, exercise. That's, it is, but that's like doing 22 pages in 24 hours. Yeah, we're just going to do, yeah. we're just doing one hour of we're the 24 one, hour comic. Hour, yeah, we're just going to do one page, one hour. Oops, I mean, let me go back there. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we're just doing one, one, one page. So don't sweat this too much, but this will give you a clear idea of how to do this for four pages for a 22 page comic to a graphic novel which is 100 to and up you can you know so it's exactly the same format anyways for that kind of stuff so establishing your world and type of story let your reader know what they are in for give hints about the story you're telling and introduce your characters these three things should be in basically in any be any start of any story be it a book movie, video game, everything. So if we fly back in our brains to world building, we're thinking about uh, the background. We're thinking about the important stuff. We're thinking about all the things we mentioned here. And we're also thinking about the character that you created, be it last week or even this week. So we got to think of all those things and stick it at the beginning uh, here. We established that and hopefully if you could do it in one panel, the first one, that's you can that's possible. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> um, you can do take two, three. Don't worry about how many panels it's going to be. This is getting your ideas out first. After you get through that, we're gonna go through conflict. Something that happens that will make your character do something. So I'm not going to jump into defining what conflict completely is because they'll be here all day long. But think of this. You're sitting at home and nothing's happening. Will you do something? Probably not. So conflict. Imagine somebody rang the doorbell. It's Amazon delivering a package, but you have to sign it. Oh, whatever. Or the mail, the mail person. They're delivering a package and you have to sign it. But for some reason, your door won't open but you really need this package right now. Now you have conflict between the door. You also have conflict possibly with the male person who's being really mean, what have you. It's basically, it's a problem that you have to solve. That's the most simple way for me explaining what a conflict is. And it can be with physical things to animals, creatures, monsters, robots, uh, physically, or they're having an argument. So it's not physical. And then, from the problem, we usually have a solution to the problem, which is why it's called a resolution here. How will your character deal with the conflict? So at the end of this one page story, they, hopefully they will resolve their conflict. It doesn't have to be big. It could be as simple as them trying to open a uh, bag of milk for the first time. Or like in the uh, old Archie comics, just Jughead trying to order a burger at Pops. Wow, that, yeah, oh my God, that's a throw. Yeah, absolutely, that's a throwback. Wow, Archie comics. And they're, and they're great because sometimes there would be one pagers and you realize like the burger of the day that he wanted there was not available. So he's like, I need my burger. Absolutely. And for those who, I guess you don't have to get the paper for this now, but if you go online, if you, in growing up, we had the newspaper uh, physically delivered to our door and we on the weekends, 
uh, we'd have the comic book strip uh, section, which, you know, uh, I would grab quickly out of the paper to read. Now they have them online. So if you look at comic book strips, not comics, comic strips. They're wonderful for showing conflict and resolutions really quickly because they have very few panels to, to work with. That's right. So you can see it work really well because, you know, traditional like comic book uh, writers and artists, they tend to unfortunately um, forget that you can do things quickly. And then they stretch something very long and it becomes very boring. And they're like running out of ideas. But if you look at comic strips, they might have three or four panels to do the to do everything we're talking about right now. They do in four panels. And it's Calvin a, Hobbes right. is a perfect example of that. Every every a strip of Calvin Hobbes, there's always a conflict and a resolution. Absolutely. So I'm going to start uh, my stuff here too. I'm going to go through a whiteboard. I'm going to try to do multiple pages. I don't know if I can. Let me try. I can do multiple pages. Can I do multiple pages? Maybe not. I thought I could. Interesting. Well, I'm going to do the whiteboard. Let's see if I can share that. Da, da, da. Hope you can see my whiteboard here. Ah, let's see. So Dom, unfortunately, is going to see me do this. And hopefully, because he's here, and, and like I said, it's like a studio system here. I may not have to write everything <laughs> back to him, but I might. might. So, um, boop, boop, boop. So my first scene would be Stumption World. So we'll have uh, the witch. Uh, you see my notes, so you want me to read these, sorry. This is a lot more common, guys, there. Like, it, like we, it's always like, first you just get the ideas straight out of your head so you do like a bit of chicken scratch and you know it's and then and a bunch of doodles you're going to see some of that tomorrow like from my perspective what i do and mine's of course more heavy in terms of the doodles but last weekend uh howard had his there so we had, it's like a like a mind map so like different traits and aspects yeah. of, the, of the character what? let me show that real quick as i can grab that out i mean do 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 where did i put that and even howard's like a rough doodle helped me to visualize like one form of that character so in terms of uh tomorrow which we'll cover like when i get the when we get a, like the rough script there for the panels uh it gives me an idea how to do like lighting or just how to place the character and some people can do like simplified artwork you go and do a rick and morty thing like uh, uh our friend troy little you know it's like you can absolutely do that if you want to do something that's more like i'll show you a few different styles and approaches so this so is, this yeah, is, this is how it always begins. <laughs> uh, I know it's kind of weird. I start, I, I started, I started uh, on the top left and it worked down, but basically these are just ideas and stuff for character development. And as I said, I also, you know, doodle here and there. And it's not about spelling. It's not about grammar because that will always exist and can always go back and fix things. This is more important about getting your ideas out as quickly as possible, though I just technically stopped doing that just now, but um, this is to get everything out on paper and then you work it. And then there's a lot of things here that you can tell I scratched out because I changed my mind because um, it's completely a different direction. So all the stuff, not all of it's gonna make it. And you'll see uh, Dom's version of this uh next next week as well tomorrow uh, yeah to actually next week sorry tomorrow oh, <laughs> it's one of those days my coffee's not kicked in yet so uh let's see let see hey, which argument mentor okay retro so right then and there when howard's just like displaying you notes, know, it tells me a bit of the direction of the first panel it's like okay we're we're doing a panel that's uh, not just world building, but we're introducing the characters interacting with each other. So it's the tone. So that first panel, you know, it's always like, you know, it's always for the reader, not just visually, but as soon as they read it with the visuals and that relationship begins, you know, you, 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 you just like you, you pull them into the narrative. So when I'm reading like these notes and he, he'll break it down for me, uh, panel one, two, three, four, it's, it's like the, like how in film and in video games, it's exactly the same process. You know, they just use different terminologies, but there's instead of panel one and then a movie script, they'll say scene one interior or like INT or EXT for exterior. 
to show like it's an outdoor scene. So that way from a storyboard, when I would do storyboards or concept art, uh, it would I would know what time of the day and what kind of coloring they would want to get that mood. So it, it establishes a tone. So when you see the, uh, the character interact with another or with the environment, you know, you get the essence. Sometimes less is more. So Howard can give me something that's like maybe two words of dialogue, but it's heavily descriptive in terms of the panel. And my duty as, you know, my responsibility as, a, as, as the artist is to illustrate, you know, the context of that narrative, a visual narrative, if you will. So when you hear a bit of the dialogue, even though it's just two words, like love you, or like, I know, like with Han Solo and Empire Strikes Back, you know, it's just like the, the lighting, everything in that scene was intentional. But it's like, you know, you see, you hear Leia say, I love you. And then Han's response, I know. But then, you know, the sense of dread and everything, it's all key. But it's like, as Howard, he has to write. He has to like set the tone and the pace for me. So I know like panel, like they'll say like uh, panel one is when Leia says, uh, I love you. And then panel two is Han like saying, I know. And then panel three is when he gets frozen in carbonite. You know, there's a conflict that's there. It's like, unfortunately, it's a sad resolution that no, Han's not saved, Han is frozen, but they, you know, able to acknowledge their feelings for each other. And just those three, like, you know, little scenes can be broken down to panels. And that's like, you know, like, like what you see here, what Howard's doing with the notes. So that way it helps me set the tone. So I know I can increase the space of the panels depending on the majesty of the scene, but he will give me that direction. He will tell me I want, I will need focus on this panel because it's the key panel on this page. And that's something we'll, uh, we'll, uh, well, 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 we're going to visually go through tomorrow. We're actually going to do that live. So I hope you guys are doing a better job than me. I'm like trying to write my screens here because I my, my second camera kind of went to heck. So I'm trying to see what else I can add to this. I might change. I'm not going to lie. I was only able to read half your script to scratch. So I'm going to need you to read oh, no, 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 the description. Like I got the first panel. So like it's just... I, I just switched pages because I'm adding more stuff to it. So I just added oh, okay. it to the whiteboard. So I didn't delete anything. So don't worry. If I delete it, I would have to rewrite. I'm going to be rewriting. I will be, re I will be rewriting this uh, on a doc and I'll send it to you so you can use it tomorrow as well. And guys, uh, there's no such thing as bad ideas. Like we just saw with Howard, the last week's character development, when he scratches certain ideas, because when we were looking at the character, the first instincts was, you know, to go with certain uh, details and certain concepts. But then when we thought about the backstory of the character, those things kind of like some things were added, some things were taken out. And the same thing here. There's no such thing as, as bad ideas. They can be, ideas can be repurposed and recycled and retooled for something else or just with the same character for further down the road for another story. So it's like, there's, don't think like anything's bad. Just like, it's just not ready. That, that idea is just not ready right now. You can always revisit it. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. There are some bad ideas, but that's another story. That's for another time. <laughs> yeah, I just saw some films now, and then now I'm not gonna start spewing. I was just thinking like <laughs> Spider Man: The Clone Saga. If anybody ever read that? Oh, like, oh my boy. God. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's in my head now. <laughs> yeah, just like that. That was like a year. People were forced to buy comics, and like, I don't know what's happening anymore. It's like they're making it up on the fly. Yeah, pretty much. And that was another one that uh, like we're writing where there's a lot of creators involved. There's no harmony than not like, you know, transparency where you have like an arc that's a story arc that's conceptually may sound interesting, but it becomes so convoluted that they've lost the plot, literally. I think I have something now. Yeah, I like this, like, and in, in, in the first line that Howard wrote, third person point of view for all your gamers. This is, of course, there's like very common. Now, this is a very common term. And it's funny because you'll have like uh, in movie scripts, they, they, they don't use, they use POV, but never third person. They'll have like American shot, which is like, you know, from like, like waist, like torso up, you know, for uh, how they'll frame it. But the, the approach to writing, the approach to how like the breakdown is very, very similar. So that's why you can understand how Howard was able to do like a, he and I were able to do like so many different industry projects. So just by him telling me this, it's like, okay, that's great. So I, it's, uh, 
that's like he's giving me the cue and i'll i'll look at the script there and figure out like how how much detail of the world i could sneak in because with third person point of view is like a bird view so that's like your you know like your 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 window your of opportunity if you want to show like a nice like you know just so detail like landscape in the background of where they are think of an idea on <laughs> i know that i'm taking a time for this but I'm going to be erasing this. <laughs> well, if it's like, you know, well, we can go a bit with this one. There's like, go a bit, like, I'm already thinking the way that you're starting to write your notes is the uh, Jean Giraud uh, uh, Mobius story that he did with Alejandro Jodorowsky for uh, Heavy Metal. Uh, wow. But it used to be originally published in Taboo. Taboo, there is like, you know, it was, you know, Taboo, as you know, it's that old Toronto indie publication. Uh, and it was the eyes, like the, you know, bring me the eyes of a child. And that was the only line of dialogue in this uh, five page comic. And it was beautifully drawn. And it's how Howard is doing the breakdown is, uh, is very similar. Tomorrow I'll show you uh, that comic because the tone in that world is similar to what uh, Howard is like writing and you'll see like from an artist my inspirations like you know we we draw from artists that inspire us and the way that the scenes and that comic that i'm thinking of is so visual but at the same time it's like when you think about it everything that howard has said about the how the panel structure the panel structure in that comic which i'll show you guys tomorrow is so beautifully simple that it's borderline cinematic and but it's the the way the details were done so you don't have to go like crazy, 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 every little minute detail. It's all about shapes, silhouette, like foreground, mid-ground, background, but where less is more, they could be one frame and it's just a simple leap in the entire panel. But it sets that tone and it flows your eye so well to the story and the narrative. So with here, it's like, you know, when he's doing the breakdowns, getting his notes there, he's almost like, you know, it's like Cecil B. DeMille, where he says like, my mind is of a move. You know, as a filmmaker, that makes perfect sense. So it's like when he writes a script, Martin Scorsese does the same the same thing. Martin Scorsese, when he develops a script, like Taxi Driver and some of his older classics like Mean Streets, even Goodfellas, uh, he would do storyboards himself like how Howard does. And they're purely 100%, nothing more than stick figures. But it's like comic. You don't have to do like Marvel realism, guys. You don't have to do like DC. You know, some of the best comics and most beloved comics in the world have a style of their own. And that's something that Howard and I would want to convey to you. And that's why we're so diverse in our fields is that, guys, you're only limited by your imagination. So it's in terms of this, you I can go simple, but writing strong, as long as the drawings there, you know, help you to tell that story and the reader doesn't get confused. And that's something visually we'll cover tomorrow. You know, you'll be fine. It's like, you know, it's like never doubt, like, you know, your potential to create a solid story. As you can see here, it's like with uh, with Howard, he's getting all these ideas there. It's like now he's developing like this narrative. Now, because we had some visual cues from the character that we created last week, uh, we were able to like certain details that I was like visualizing to integrate into this character's wardrobe and details uh, is actually adds to the lore of that world. Now you can absolutely do that. Like you look at like, you know, cartoon classics right now, like Rick and Morty. And since so you think about something, it was originally conceived as a back to the future type uh, demo reel for the creators. So they, you know, if you think about it, it's like Rick and Morty is Doc Brown and uh, Marty McFly. That was the inspiration. It wasn't meant to be a back to the future cartoon. It was just meant that dynamic, you know, that kind of approach, uh, kind of adventures. But you can't, you know, you can't really do time travel. So you do, What's, what are we going to do that's different? And that's something Howard talked about earlier in terms of the story. How, what can we do to make it different, like with Iron Man? What if we take, what if we took Doc Brown and Martin McFly, took away the DeLorean and the whole time travel thing, but they can still travel, but they travel different planets. Oh, even better. They can travel to different planets and different multi universes. Like who, Doctor Who? Like Doctor Who. Okay. Well, how did he do that? Do they have a, uh, do they have a device or something? We'll give them a portal gun, a portal gun. Nobody has a portal gun. That's great. We'll see. And so they just like, and then it, it, it just progresses. And you watch each episode in each crazy universe that these guys visit, you know, that's when that's your sandbox. But Rick and Morty remain the same. 
you know that's the, that's like your the way for the audience to you know to immerse themselves into that world and what we're doing with our main character here is that we want that our main character for this panel is the reader's outlet to be immersed into that world so that way it's like whatever this character does wherever uh she interacts with you know that represents you the reader and you know you're meeting these very other characters that she's interacting with for the first time and you're going on this journey with her but sometimes you may want to switch it up. Maybe you want to do like a documentary style where you're following this character and it's just like Kyle there, but it's like, you know, and you can absolutely take that approach. That is up to you. Think of it as, like, yourself as a filmmaker. And you can see down here, Howard's already breaking yeah. down some little panel breakdowns for me. I don't think you read my chicken scratches there, but I'm thinking of telling the story from the viewpoint of two characters going after the basically our you know the witch just becomes a monster because she got cursed by her mentor and the jewel is that's 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 part of her is actually the mage her, her the mage helping protect her unborn son so we have two people at the cave entrance this is present time so that event of the cursing happened in the past so i'm thinking of having two people at the cave entrance and then one person asking why how did you know about this you know this crazy jewel that we we're going to steal and become super crazy rich or what have you and then as the one as the other character starts explaining how he knows about it we go into i think i was going to go for a montage it became be kind of fun uh of that character retelling how uh, how the, the events that led to this which is basically the love the pseudo love triangle thing between uh the mage the witch and the mentor uh and then maybe use a different kind of panel design uh people can see that i wrote down fb it's that's just my own notes for flashback um i'm not sure it's a flashback or a retelling and then the panels don't have to be square or circle. It can be any kind of uh, shape that they would like, uh, meaning the artist. So that's that's why I put a question mark kind of thing there. So as he's retelling it, um, or telling his version of it, the thief is kind of you know then that's you know how do you know so much details about this? And then we and we'll I will reveal that the other character is not a fellow thief, but actually the mage who hi, who found this thief to help him. To retrieve his unborn child, so the mage will eventually have to confront his uh, the witch, his lover, and then sort of stop her from killing them both. As the thief will try to, I guess, grab the jewel out of her forehead. Um, most likely open-ended. We'll get to that point where they're doing that. Uh, the thief will probably be able to grab the jewel out and probably leave it at that point where it looks like the mage can't stop her anymore and that's how, how we would end the scene i'm thinking seven panels i you know, i don't that's, that's i know it's a bit much i'm putting seven because it feels on a more single page maybe maybe but i'm saying seven panels of question mark because if it's a montage Technically, it's like one panel, but a vault. It's think of like a long scroll Chinese painting where you have a bunch of scenes in one panel. Yeah, it's like yeah. we can. And so one yeah. thing is, uh, potentially we could do a spread, which is yeah. like based on no said now. Well, we're yeah, gonna yeah. cover that tomorrow, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's like, like, like you. Well, that's why. Yeah, that's what I'm talking to you now. And then when people, when when people come in tomorrow, the one page, understand. it's like. It might be one page. page. It, it might be one page where we have we have like the one inset panel of them like. I know on the uh, above, you know, above the cave on a cliff or something, and looking down at it. Yeah, uh, so, so yeah. Establish that, and then, then the, as they're telling it, we're look, we're going back. You know, basically it's a montage, and then at the end we'll see them doing their thing. Uh, free, you know, the mage stopping uh, his, you know, his lover from killing them, and then uh, the thief's trying to pry the jewel out of her forehead, and then you know, it's, it's it, I said we're 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 problem solving as we're doing it. Not everything I'm saying right now, even uh, unfortunately, the story as well could be changed by the time we get to tomorrow, even, uh, and it will. And that's the whole point of this is actually there's no set thing. I know I didn't write the story out completely because I'm just showing my my thought process and how I would discuss it with uh, with uh, Dom here as my artist. So he might go, "This is impossible." He just mentioned seven panels. Um, I mean. Yeah, it's tough. I guess I wrote down seven panels as as not literally seven panels, but that's the amount of scenes I would like to see on the page. 
And you can, you have to get a little bit creative because it doesn't mean like one, two, three, four, five, six, and like seven. That, I, that could mean that. It's like, oh, the seven one on the top one, a nice wide world building. And then that's your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now it's like, okay, but that's something that's like, you know, we're going to, uh, what's going to work out tomorrow. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, definitely have these three things, the establish your world type of story, conflict resolution. Uh, once you have these three things, no matter how you do it, you'll be okay. <laughs> and this is not just for the entire story. This is actually from scene to scene, believe it or not. So that's a tip I just threw out there. So I'm gonna go back to some text stuff, ten a tentacle act part, the formatting of comic books. We have things called word balloons. This is how we show people talking. So this is an actual page from Iron Man, Hong Kong Heroes. You can see there's a lot of, I'm a wordy per. I'm a wordy writer. So there's a lot of word balloons here. So how many word balloons? I work with wordier. <laughs> That's how many, all these arrows are pointing to word balloons right now. <laughs> so are all word balloons the same? No. Uh, in fact, there's actually three types. There's actually two types here and two versions of one type. This is the traditional word balloon. There's a, this is the balloon part, it's text, obviously, and this is the balloon tail that doesn't point the eye or nose or cheek. It, Point balloon tails usually point towards the mouth, but not in the, don't stick it in the mouth. It's pointing towards the mouth. And you you basically, the rule of thumb with the word balloons is never overlap yes. the drawing like this. So you don't want to look like it's cutting, you know, it's going like it's coming out of their mouth. It's the, it's just supposed to suggest that this is the person that's speaking. Yes. So that um, even if it's like this or like that, doesn't necessarily like to the mouth, but you don't, it's kind of weird if you have it like pointing like this, because normally when the head, you do the thought bubbles. Yeah. Yeah, so it's always um, around the jaw. Rule of thumb. So we'll, we'll, always, get the, we'll get to the uh, thought bubbles too. I have oh, I have comments for that. <laughs> um, so this is a normal word balloon. This is uh, if you look at it, it looks like it's uh, from like a radio that's coming out of his little earpiece here. That's why you have a we would call it a burst exactly. balloon. Exactly. And I just want to add the reason why there's no tail for that one is because that when you do that, that's your main character. That's the voice they're hearing. So that's yes. what you don't see because it's not like you know from another character you know unless they're in, actually in a dialogue but like radio you do something a little see a little, little radio wave so you know that's transmission that's something from a speaker so it's like that's why howard uh advised me with the, the direction for the artist saying i want the flow and he'll get to the point there's a in fully intentional purpose for the layout for the for the word balloons and it's quite brilliant and fully it's 100 intentional but that's why you see there's also another third like the bubble that where he has his cursor yes the tail is still pointing to iron but that's his speaker voice like from the helmet when he's talking not the inside voice where it has normal tony stark voice but the iron man speaker voice that people hear from the suit when he's speaking so that's why it's got that techie like energy like you know so that's oh. like yeah that's iron man speaking it's like a light it's like a, you know some people say call it a lightning bolt tail or the zigzag tail it's part of the burst balloon thing so making sure yeah, it's like basically a, it's electronic it's like yeah. digital or electronic uh word balloon exactly so here's the same thing you do the same there's different there's that. different word balloons you don't have to fight like mm -hmm. even though it's nice and round like you know rounded edges you can make any kind of style word balloon doesn't matter it could be squiggly lines doesn't matter i mean this is just this these are just the basic these are two basic ones that mm -hmm. most you will see most comics so you know this gives you an idea of how as a writer where well, word balloons could exist on the page you're writing now, if I wrote a lot, like have him banter like he does in the movies, this whole panel would be just like word balloon after word balloon. You would see nothing. <laughs> this would be all covered up. Um, so you have to find that balance and not overwrite. And a lot of people overwrite the beginning, and that's totally fine. You'll start learning how to limit your text space um, on your page and have it two to three lines and then you'll have space for the art to breathe. That's what we call breathe. So actually breathing means that you can actually see the art because <laughs> that's part of the storytelling of comic books is art and text combined. And so, now and I, we've both done quite a bit of lettering ourselves. Yes. Um, oh, man, if, if the lettering, I'm not even sure. I, I don't think I should. I'm not a professional letterer, so that's why I never teach it. But I do show friends and it's like this is not the best way to do it like, i know but it works i didn't letter this this is um our marvel letter company i forgot which one it was called that did this so 
all has two of them that they took my really bad script and made it look cool, I guess. Um, sound effects, where am I here? This is how we show, tell what stories are happening in a story, and that is a sound effect. So you would literally write your sound effects the way it would sound, phonetically. There is no spelling. You will not find this in a dictionary. The only ones that you would probably find would be things like boom or tick, uh, splat, things that are like, you know, somewhat normal in the vernacular of the English language, but most sounds are not. So you make them up. And mm -hmm. I literally just sound it out and then just try to spell it as best as I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is sort of, this, this, this was honestly, I, I, was, I think I was rewatching uh, Inception so that <laughs> that that ongoing sound that they use in every scene that burn I was like okay. yeah yeah that's, that's perfect because that's especially if it's like a sound there's like you repeat if you can word mouth out the sound then you're on the right direction because some people will sometimes come back to me as an artist and write script going and then there's like pulse sounds great so I'll go <laughs> boom 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 and like b r r r m and it's no it's different well what is it no, boom, 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 boom. Oh, it's more of a bass like pulse. So it's like, you know, one thing I appreciate with writers like Howard is that he'll write not only this this kind of sound, but he'll actually write the capital and lowercase to give the cues like you see here with the burn. It's like that way I know where to put the emphasis when I create those sound effects. And the sound effects is not only to add emphasis to the scene so you know what, you know, you know what's going on, but there's intentional. You see where it says burn, it it's going because we read left to right, top to bottom. With that dialog box, you see that's there. Go into the sound effect and with the drawing, it's bringing you as a reader to the next panel, the bottom right panel, which is what you always want to do. And that's why he's talking about the Z or the number two like configuration. It's always left to right, top to bottom yeah. and left to right again, because you want them to turn the page. So once they go to the bottom right, so that's yeah. why the box is everything that Howard did here. He even writes uh, a lot, uh, not all writers, but quite a few will write sh what was called sheet direction. And the same thing applies in animation. Animation, they would break down instead of like panels, they would do scene and do exactly what Howard's doing. And I would do the storyboard on the top and they will say the camera moves like this. So that way when the animator comes in and starts doing the animation cells, they know how to move the character based on my storyboard and the writer's note breakdown. Exactly. I mean, there's no set way of doing this stuff. I mean, I always get those people, I always get people messaging me freaking out like, I didn't do this, this format. Is it okay? I'm like, as long as you're an artist and you know what's going on, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the pattern. You said you mentioned a bad pattern. I mentioned every panel has one. So let me look here. I'm going to draw the Z right here. You can see it flowing right there, right? So top, left, right. Right. So no matter how I draw it, it will do it will do that so uh, if i write here boom here right and, and it matches here. the artwork which is my job it's like when the pounds are laid down yes. so the way as a reader you can see like with tony inside the helmet how howard wrote it down with iron man flying towards the foreground from the top you have that top to left and then he brings you down because the way the perspective of the angle of the drawing of his motion and that's why the angle panels is to help encourage that flow of both the action that Iron Man's doing. That's why he's coming off panel because he's flying. It shows like that illusion of speed and velocity. And then you're you're flying over his that point of view that like that third uh, that point of view third camera shot that Howard wrote earlier. That uh, second panel where you see Iron Man there and it says like on my reading show no people on board the transport ship. You have that camera so you're like flying with him. So you're seeing what he's seeing so your eye is going to that scene and then brings it to the next panel the action where you see iron man is reacting so it's an upward shot to get a different perspective but once again you still get that left to right and that top to bottom flow with the dialogue boxes and it helps the reader to navigate and know so that way it's not like disconnected like i i don't get this thing is this part of that or part of that so but everything just feels osmosis no, i'm just gonna like <laughs> show you the ropes for that for sure um it's a lot more fun guys don't trust me don't be intimidated we're gonna have, we're gonna have a lot of fun tomorrow oh absolutely so i talked about uh i touched up i showed this before the uh formatting there are different formats for scripting a comic book this is one of them 
Um, some people call it full script. I'll just use that because if I start mentioning them all, it doesn't make difference. It's just, this is full script. And what it is is it tells you what page number you're on, how many panels. Then you because it's five panels, you should have panel one all the way to panel five for this page. These are called panel descriptions. That's a character. This is what they're saying. So it's, it's almost like a film script, somewhat. So, and I don't know if you guys can see, this is what DC would do and see, it looks eerily wait, like wait, a wait, movie wait. script. Give me a second. Let me stop sharing so I can share it. There you go. Go ahead. Okay. Let me, the, 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 the is my camera screen? on? Is it on me or? Because oh, I'm holding it, holding up the oh, Okay. There you go. Just go because he has not scanned. But don't know if it's adjusting here, that, but you could just see the format just visually. It's DC Comics would give something and it's a lot like a movie script yeah so just like they would break it down and say panel two panel three and they have each character like cap or uh, you know like uh captain america or whoever like in this case you see batman and they just have the the dialogue and uh how it would actually do uh the breakdowns for me and say page two panel one panel two and all like this and then page three and then if, it's, if it opens up like as you know pages are like this but if a comic book you know you have your first page, but then you have a spread, page two and three. Sometimes we do like a, you see those nice spreads there. It's like, you know, it's like open up instead of panels on the side. And it's like a full drawing. It's like, we can do a big world building or big fight scene. Like Jim Lee, you know, with Justice League, you can introduce as many characters as you want. But it's like, but they'll put down the direction for us. And that's another thing that we'll cover tomorrow. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> and those who don't, um, <laughs> I won't go there yet so what we have here we have captain mary saying blah 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 let me see if we can get my protection back on is it working okay so can anyone tell me what's wrong with this word below you can say it in the chat or i can't let me see i can see everybody here let me go back to a grid here you know if you know what's wrong if you can tell me what's wrong with it throw it in the chat I'll give you a few seconds. From you know that. what? Yeah, well, hold on. I'm going to start a little timer here. Let's see what we can do here, folks. Now, there's a few hints there that we uh, that we hinted at uh, earlier. So it's like, you know, you may remember those, but uh, there's one key thing. So in the meantime, let's give you about 30 seconds. I'm going to just cue, put on some mood music there where you guys are at and study that. Hand. We have one answer. I'm going to wait for a few more, a few more if there's any. And then we can go through it as you, as you. <laughs> oh. Anyone? Well, we have one from Rob. Let me go open that again. Rob says it covers too much Anyone? in the center. So Rob says it covers too much in the center. This word balloon here. Howard, are you mute? Hang on. Am I in mute? Oh, can you hear me now? Start. My bad. You good? We're all good? Can you hear me? Not. Give me a second. Can you guys hear me? Or am I frozen? Can you hear me? It's all good. Okay, good. Um, so Rob said it covers too much of the center. Yeah, don't look at this red box. This is me. <laughs> this is me uh, showing you, you know, asking the question. So I'm going to go back a bit. So this word balloon, yeah, it covers the center, but it does one, it does one awful thing. We're covering Black Widow's face and pretty much all of Iron Man's face here. That's terrible. Why would I do that? Because I hate the artist? No, uh, that's just bad lettering. What you would do is move this. Now, there's a couple ways of doing it. You can put it here and have a long, you know, a, a long tail all the way here. You can sort of cheat it. You can technically put it somewhere here even, you know, because we already know this is going to be Captain America because of the shield and the big giant A on his forehead. So you can stick it either on the sides here too. I probably wouldn't put it near the bottom because it's going to read really weird to jump back up. So I would prefer it to be here. Um, I honestly can't remember where in the comic book where they put it. <laughs> I really don't. But I would, if I was lettering it, I would stick it here, have a, have a curved tail curved it from here and then stick it probably around here. Try to work around uh, War Machine here. So that is uh, something that uh, you would figure out real quickly. 
Uh, oh, you can see it. Let me, let me go back here, Rob, here. Let me, Rob, so you can see it. So let me see if I can. Ah, nope. Ah, what is that? Rob, oh, there, that's a Rob. really good point. So uh, Rob can, was just finished up bringing up text. So here you can see Black Widow. You can see Captain America. And now if I go forward, <laughs> there. That's bad lettering for you. So even as a writer, I would see that and go, no, don't do that. Move it somewhere else. Um, an artist would do that same thing. There's like, there's no, uh, ed an editor definitely should catch it, but somebody don't catch everything. So for me, I do that myself. Um, I want to jump back real quick into the panel descriptions. There is no format for this, zero. There, there, there are things that will help you so you don't like end up writing hordes and hordes of words that your writers, your writer, your artists will have to go through. First thing is to establish the you know period of time, location, maybe the shape of the panel if you want to. You don't have to. You can sketch out. You, know, you can do layouts of each page if you want to do a quick one to give them an idea of what you were thinking, who's in it, what they're doing, and as always, the important stuff. So for my important stuff was uh, Doctor Strange uh, spellcasting a portal, and <clears throat> this was before Doctor Strange movie. So ha. Or I did the portal first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no credit. Sling ring. Uh, but no, no, I had no sling ring though. So if I did that, that I would have been like, but no, no, no sling ring. So it tells you that's the important part. The other important part is that Captain America would, should be at the bottom leading the charge of the panel. So he would he would jump in through first. So not a lot, just enough so that the artist goes, okay, I get it. Now I could have went further and gave him camera directions, and those can be found online. If you look up camera directions or camera angles, I should say. You would have them all and they do the same thing except for a few comics is a static medium <laughs> you can't go you know uh chase camera and it follows him all the way through this corridor and no that doesn't work as comics don't comics don't move you can have a part of that scene and then you can do that so that's something to keep in mind so let's move a little forward um to caption boxes so this is how we give information to the reader and for modern comics, we also use this to show what the characters are thinking. Don mentioned thought balloons. I miss thought balloons. Like you wouldn't believe because it makes sense. And you'll see them in comic book strips. You have little clouds where above a character's head, which is basically like a word balloon, and have tiny little clouds that lead to not their mouth, but to their noggin, the top of their head here. So I would have a word, you know, have a little cloud beside your head and then it goes up to a big cloud thinking you know showing what you're thinking in modern comics they have forgo that for caption boxes and i'll show you quickly here why so first i mentioned that he used to establish an italian location so this is also from the same comic book that i wrote for marvel here and i have here somewhere hidden in the in the folds between dimensions uh, uh, truth be told, this is basically my version of Doctor Strange's uh, man cave. Um, that doesn't exist anywhere. <laughs> it's in between everything. And then you, these blue balloons, these blue caption boxes, sorry, are his inner thoughts. It's because his his main color for his uh, evergreen costume is blue. And here is basically AK writer slash editor, I guess you want to call it that. Some people say it's editor, sometimes you put an asterisk and say editor's note, and I didn't want that. It tells you who this person is, because I was writing this for first time peep readers of comics, Marvel Comics, for the Disney Park in Hong Kong. So I had to take it from the point of view that this might be their first comic book ever. So that's why I was like actually writing the character's name. Rather than that, I probably wouldn't, because you would. It's pretty obviously this is Doctor Strange. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should mention like the context of which this character, this comic was created for, which may, would make perfect sense for first timers. Well, um, really, really quick, um, I was asked by Marvel Comics and Hong Kong Disney uh, Land to create a comic book for their first uh, Marvel attraction, uh, which was the Iron Man Experience ride in, Hong in Disney Hong Kong. Um, the world that they built in these the Imagineers loved them to bits because they're super geeks. Uh, they created Stark Expo Asia that exists in Hong Kong and that exists in Disney. So when we were having meetings about this of how I would make this into a promo comic for that ride, I asked, it's like, you know, like when you're in the playground, you ask these kind of questions. I asked, does, so does Disney exist in the Marvel Universe? Pause. The lawyers went at it for a bit and then it came to yes, it can. 
I'm like, so it is. Okay, so Disney, so wait, did it establish it? No, but you are, you can do that. So I was the first, technically, I didn't, I can't, I couldn't use the word. But, hey, I'm gonna go in detail, but Disney does exist, like as in like as an entity in the Marvel, in, in the 616, the main universe of Marvel Comics. Um, the other thing I asked was, so the Stark Expo Asia here is for the rides. Like, yeah, what if we treat it as it's real? Like it's actually Stark Expo Asia as in it's real. And then we, we take it from there that it's taking place there. Great. All right. So what else are you guys doing for the for the summer event for for the rides? Like we're having this uh, uh, one time summer thing where we're bringing all these different characters from the MCU and having a little walk through. And it's like, well, cause so they, they, they give me the characters like Doctor Strange, and they're going to have this uh, portal nexus thing that you know uh, that Hydra is going to go after, and then and they have it. They can travel through dimensions and basically wreak havoc around you know the multiverse. I'm like, I'm gonna have that then. So my first scene is technically it feeds into that experience. So I was trying to like match it with the ride and their, you know, their uh, summer events and stuff, which was amazing. I was like one of the first people to do it on the media day. It was pretty cool. And I might have tried to steal a an Infinity Gem, but God, did, but Thor stopped me. Um, oh, it's just one of those no good variants from Loki. Oh no, it was it was supposed to be one of those things where you get. Uh, uh, people who are in, who come in like it's like a group always always a group right and when they'll choose a volunteer or two to do a certain a certain thing to unlock the next stage of the of the thing so i was the idea was supposed to you get the gem and you shove it in uh the uh, a box which will unlock the door i literally took the, the thing and it's stuck in my pocket but <laughs> it's in a finis. would you not do that i did and then uh, Thor was like, to, to move on, you must do that. Like, the, the actor was like totally, like, she didn't break character. I tried to break him because it was media day. So no, it was just no one else but staff and me and, and the media people. And I was trying to break him for fun. And he, didn't, he didn't break. He learned his Thor voice. And I was like, fine, uh, you did a pretty good job. So I took it out and I threw it in. And then it opened up the Rainbow Bridge, which was really cool, um, which you walked through. So. Um, yeah, so that was the thing I did. I worked on that and then got to experience Disney backdoor stuff, the secret uh, entrances and tunnels and all that stuff. It's all true. All of it, uh, right down to costuming and uh, where the actors and actresses. Uh, like a slash, city. It's like its own it, little subterranean city. <laughs> it absolutely is. Um, I'm throwing this up here in case people didn't get a chance to write their story. I'm going to give you. I don't know what time is it right now, actually. Tom, do you know what time it is? That's 11.30. Okay, I'll give you some time here. I'll give you, like, say, a few minutes in case you want to, like, add stuff or change stuff. Mm -hmm. um, wow, Disney, let me think about what I can talk about but not. Like, when so, it's, like, a, just to circle back to when you wrote Dr. Screens, like, for the comic, because with, yep. with a new ride, you know, there's, new, there's uh, not only new uh, attendees, patrons to uh, Disney in Hong Kong, but an introduction to the other characters in the, of the Marvel Universe. At that point there, of course, Iron Man was a, a phenom in terms of, yeah. uh, of course, the Robert Downey. Uh, uh, at that time, it was Iron Man 2 was out, right, Howard? Iron Man, uh, 2, Iron Man 3 wasn't out yet? Or was, it was about to be out? Because he was Avengers Age of Ultron, because obviously with the armor. I so he's already been like in four, four MCU films? I believe so. so. He Should was be. well established. Because uh, but Nobody yeah, knew Doctor Strange. Uh, not quite yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. It was pre Doctor Strange uh, film. Uh, well, so, that, your yeah. comic is almost like the some to some uh, some uh, attendees is their introduction to Marvel. Yeah. As a whole. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. It, it was a weird project because it was, sort of, it was sort of like from the Marvel side. It's like everybody, everybody knows our characters. I'm like, mm -hmm, they should. Uh, <laughs> But the Disney folks don't like even the Disney folks that were there. I won't mention who, uh, but these are like not everybody was a suit. A lot, of, a lot of them were the creative side of things, but they were like the creative uh, VPs of X and Y and things of Disney. But they were familiar with the MCU, but not Marvel Comics as comics. And so a lot of things they want us to do is like, can you make this look like, you know, so and so actor and actress? and before even the lawyers said anything, I'm like, no, because that's Marvel Studios, and I'm pretty sure we don't have the licensing rights to use our likeness. Uh, and then, you know, I was like, yep, can't do that. I'm like, that's okay. We'll use the evergreen version of them. Uh, when I say evergreen, it means like the the version that the, the, that the general public would know. So 
I'm trying to think of a character who has multiple looks. Well, Thor is. Well, there's one thing we were talking about this like last year for character development. It's like you can have as long as you have certain core key elements that the audiences will immediately recognize and define the character. It doesn't matter if you change your, your ethnic background or even a gender. If as long as you keep certain key core details, you know, fan base will be happy. You know, we've seen that, like, you know, like in the comics there, Batman has been, has not, hasn't always been Bruce Wayne. He's had replacements, you know, and other, uh, even Dick Grayson for a time wore the suit and there's variations. But he recognizes Batman because the ears on the cowl, the bat symbol, the gloves and the cape. And even Batman Beyond, it's the silhouette when he's gliding. You know, when you watch the old cartoon, even though it's a totally different suit, it's red and black and there's a mouthpiece. He has the ears, scallops on the gloves, and it's black. So he's patrolling Gotham City. And it's like, it's still like the bat silhouette. But the same thing with Iron Man, not always Tony Stark. Yeah, as we know, uh, in the films you, you've seen is Rhodey in Iron Man 2 takes the, the Mark 1 and becomes War Machine. Now, Rhodey did, uh, like, was Iron Man in the comics for a while. So it's like, you know, that was uh, one thing. It's like MCU, people think about uh, War Machine or Iron Patriot. But it's like, you know, for an introduction, when, uh, when, we're asked to like, you know, like to do lettering to put the characters, you know, we can't always assume that uh, everyone knows everything, like, especially for younger audiences. When I did some stuff for like uh, Batman animated and uh, those type of like, you know, kids, young teen oriented DC comics, uh, I would have to put Robin, the boy wonder when they would like, you know, come in, even though it's like, there's the art we would think it's okay. That's Robin. But I would have to ask him like Tim Drake, because it's like, which Robin is it? Because it's just yeah. like comics is three in the cartoon. At that point, they've already established that there were two. So I had to, this is clearly the younger one. And this is clearly, because if it's a flashback story, I have to go with this Dick Grayson Robin, uh, Robin Boy Wonder. Yeah, this, exactly. Exactly. You know what? That's even, <laughs> once you get into comic book stuff, it becomes weird and wonderful because. So for you guys, it, you don't have to worry about it. It's yeah, all original I mean, characters we're dealing with here. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't have to sweat that at all. But so that's when I said you used Evergreen, that's like sort of like, it's not an industry term, I guess, but a lot of people also use that because it's just easier to go, what version of this character do you want me to draw? Uh, and you say evergreen, okay. Then you have a pretty good idea where you're going with that. And it's much easier. And when the new Thor film comes out, you will probably see Thor Thunderstrike outfit. You keep, don't look it up now, but it's hilarious. You look it up later and it's like, wow, what, what the heck happened? And uh, yeah, we lived through that too. So some wait, wait. Some, so the uh, Eric Masterson Thunderstrike suit? Ponytail and all. Um, <laughs> the 90s are alive and well. <laughs> well, you gotta think it's Taika and Thor. Which version do you think he really wants to do? I mean, right? You know, it makes no sense, but the 80s uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and Ragnarok. Oh you know, that's another thing with world building. It's like, you know, where we're talking, like with Howard was saying here, like establish the world let your reader know what they're in for. It's like, you know, that's exactly right. It's like, you know, like with the, when you're writing, like when he, we saw with the Doctor Who, I saw Doctor Strange panel, it's like the other dimension. And he would write down the artist as they illustrate this other world place, but a familiar thing, that house, like that man cave, that's like a personal cottage. Like, you know, it's like a getaway place for Doctor Strange. And that's like establishes the mood for that page and with the color palette. And it's like, that's, that's something that's like, you know, for you guys, whatever, in the end, it's like, you know, uh, as you're doing your writing and sort of working with a writer, do what's right by the story, what you feel is right. Don't make, give yourself too, too, too much work. Just what feels, but trust your instincts is what I'm trying to get at. Trust your instincts. Okay. I think that's enough time for you guys to catch up a bit. And don't worry, if you need us at the end, let me know. Just come on. I'm just making, do, do, do. Let's move on to, so I mentioned this. So this is one version of the script thing. Dom showed the other one. The Marvel one is, <laughs> I haven't explained this without showing it. Think of a spreadsheet. Oh, that's a terrible way of thinking about it. But think of a spreadsheet and you have three columns. And then as you can see here, you have the panel description, you have sound effects and character uh, banter dialogue. Um, so each, each column would be one thing. So I don't know how an artist reads it easily uh, because it's, it's, it's an unnatural flow because instead of reading it down, you're reading it sort of down and sideways. But it is what it is. And, you know, did I write like that? Yep, <laughs> I had to for them. So let me break this down. This is like the full script version. This is easiest. Once you can, you can do this, 
This way, you can do any kind of script for comic books really easily. So I'm gonna bang them all out first and talk about them. Here we go. So first line is, where's my pointer here? There we go. Panel one by, sorry, page one, five panels. This tells you this section in the first uh, thing you see on the line, the page number and how many panels there are. All of this tells you technically which panel you're on as well as your artist instructions, like panel you're on, time of day, location, who and what is seen, camera angles if you want to, you don't have to. The artist, the technically, anything you put here, most of it the artist can change. Some that they cannot it would probably be location, time of day, depending on the scene, important things to see, important things seen. They shouldn't change that because that'd be part of your story. It's like this red shoe is going to play, you know, going to pay out, yes. you know, five years like later. Or landmark. Or something, right? Or, tat, you know, a little mark on the, per on the character's face or whatever. If, if you don't tell the artist that this is important, you got to draw that. They won't. Um, but you go, okay, it's in a, in a bedroom and there's stuff in the bedroom for a, in a typical teenager. Don't worry about what it is. And then you come back to the artist, like, oh, by the way, we need like a purple teddy bear because that's 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 going to play out, you know, later on. They won't know that. It's in your head. You know that. So you well, got to write that in. For if them. I may uh, share one little thing that's just like a funny little anecdote. Well, when I was 16, I apprenticed at an animation studio and we did some uh, relief, uh, some uh, uh, some work there for Fox Studios and Nelvan and all like that. One day as a, as a production assistant, I'm getting breakdowns. So exact same format that Howard's describing, just like a spreadsheet and go scene, exterior, and then here's the instructions. And have the dialogue, and I would listen. And uh, like an old, like, you know, like a like P3 player, uh, the voiceover. So that way I know the emotions and the delivery, the timing. The timing, so I would write and do a storyboard. And this description, when he said about the bear. So in this one particular scene, I had no idea. All I know is that in this particular episode of a long and still running beloved Fox and Fox uh, cartoon series, anime series, uh, involved a scene which I thought was a different context. In this scene, the there was a young child in a flashback in Depression era, and uh, was uh, supposed to have uh, this teddy bear. And then I had to draw the same teddy bear, and I was doing not only sheet direction, I was doing the prop design. I had to. Oh, Rob. Okay, close. Close. Yeah, you're, yeah, I think you're I think you're on the same wave like Rosebud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know where I'm going with this. So <laughs> I had to do uh, a modern, uh, like there was the new mint, 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 mint version from that era. And I had to do an aged, withered, and moldy version present day. I thought I was doing baby Maggie's teddy bear for a one scene gag. I did not know that I did. Oh, what was his name? Mr. Burns' bear. Teddy bear. So anyway, Boo was like, he, and he tried to steal it from Maggie. And the whole episode was based around this teddy bear. So when Howard's saying about this one prop, this one thing in the background, it's very, very key. You have to draw this. And you have to design it. I said, like, okay, okay, I'm doing a teddy bear. It's just we drew up, drew props like you know, kids. It's like you know, giraffe, whatever is in the background. We we gave it no mind. Now here's the reason. If you look at future episodes of The Simpsons, when that teddy bear, the color has changed in some details. We, I did all hand drawn. I was a kid, the character model sheet, and I faxed it so that it's like then these they got the originals are eventually, but they were pretty damaged. So then the original character model sheets I did for Mr. Burns's bear are, are lost, but it's based on my design, and I did not know how. Uh, it is boo boo, okay, because I called my dog boo boo bear, and I thought it was it's a boo boo, it's a boo boo or boo boo, it's boo boo, isn't it? I think it's boo boo, boo -boo because he was all mini and missing an eye and they flipped yeah. they flipped it because my character sheet if you look at the newer episodes and he, mr burns still has him the button eye that's missing it's flipped from my original one so it's actually because when they scan it kind of mirrored so it doesn't it's not like it's not the same as that original episode but that's the oh, thing no. that i did not think of when i looked at the sheet direction about a prop in the background draw this bear i just new brand new cute teddy bear and look generic and then the nice wither version to show it aged. And it's like, you know, it was key for the for scenes. And I didn't realize it was actually key to the plot. So that's like when Howard says, like, yeah, little details like this is very key. 
absolutely you want to make sure the audience is like you know stuck on that and that repeats and they'll recognize it like the one ring like no matter how you draw this gold simple band on all the characters if it's illustrated lord of the rings or in the movie this one simple little thing it's so significant that's when the shot it focuses on it everything's monochromatic around it you know it's like the, your emphasis is on that and when they see the writing light up the one ring in lord of the rings it's like this one little prop you know it's so significant it sticks out on the panel oh my god uh, now i'm thinking of simpsons that's great so we're, we're, we're so as, as, as we as we stress the important things seen in your in this panel and every panel definitely add them in um that's one of the most important stuff because then it messes up the entire story to be honest yeah <laughs> um sound effects i don't you don't usually write the whole word sound effects so we use F, sfx for that because it just saves us time you technically don't have the right panel one you can just put p1 i mean most people would know what that is i just do this so that you guys can see it um characters when they talk um write their full name instructions wise um you can put a bracket with brackets after the name and say whisper or shout yell and i'll tell the letter to make the word smaller or bold you can even say can you bold all this or can you bold this name when they say it just put it in there because mm -hmm. they, the letter won't know why they're stressing it you do and then it'll flow of the art so you can do it's basically it's, it's very much uh, I, I call it, it sounds so bad when I say this, this is your Ikea way of doing a story. You're telling the instructions of what, how to put things put together so that it hopefully at the end becomes a, a, a beautiful cabinet. I don't know why I'm thinking that because I just built one, I think, recently. So here, yeah, I, I, there's there's two ways of, you know, a couple, multiple ways of writing the, the dialogue. One is just to write it, you know, so it's like in the left and write it. Because I letter as well, and Dom knows this too, I center all my lettering because when I copy it, and you, you know, that's what letters, they copy it and they throw it into whatever program, be it LW Illustrator or any publishing program, doesn't matter. It's all centered already, so, they, so it saves them an extra step because you're copying and pasting all every single text and it's not centered. You have to recenter everything. <laughs> it's a real pain in the butt. So I usually be very nice and I center my, my stuff for my letters. And, some of them thank me and they're like, you're the, oh God, thank you for doing that. And I'm like, I let her too, so I get it, you know. Um, let me get through some uh, some tips and tricks. You don't need this, by the way. This is, I don't know where I grabbed this. I think I found this online somewhere. This is obviously for both artists and writers. Um, and actually for anybody, to be honest, even letters, maybe not colors. Letters can be used as too. So, you know, it's page layouts. Usually, so you can tell here, notes for page number, whatever. And, and if you guys are curious about those blue lines on the outer edge of the page, it's when you take your ruler and no, it help you me, to get stop. your perspectives. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, Dom, Dom, you don't have to use it. I mean, I'm throwing it on there because it's just easier to visualize. That's right. Um, and truth be told, I use scrap paper. And if you really need the need these lines and stuff, if you're an artist, just draw them on your page or. <clears throat> photocopy or print this from you know wherever you craft it online you don't need to buy this from a shop or no. online store you, you can create it if you have if you guys if you're using photoshop or uh procreate or sketchbook just create a layer and set it as an overlay and block it and yeah. that way you know you're not going to draw over it and save it as a template so that way you can always drop it in png you know as a bitmap is transparent you just drop that into your work file or you just create it there if you if you doing like here, like customized panels, like you see what Howard's doing here. You set your guide, lock it, set it, the, the layer option to overlay. Yeah, uh, I mean, we can go into all the technical stuff and then the bleeds and stuff. We're not gonna go there because- uh, the, the, well, Just like, in case some are doing it as we speak. Well, you can do it tomorrow. You can talk about the bleeds. Oh, that's true. That's the art, that's a visual thing. <laughs> that's true. But technically, it sounds so bad to say that. Technically, the writers doesn't have to care about that. Technically, I do because I want to, I will make sure that all the production flow is well flowing, if that makes sense. So we talked about panels. They can be any shape and size. Technically, technically any kind of layout, but don't forget you have that Z pattern, right? The Z pattern, you know, top, left, right, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. So- Oh, and to answer your question, Rob, the answer is yes. And normally we use Bristol board, uh, like a card stock uh, for the inking and some of the lettering. Uh, for final artwork. Yeah. Well, yeah, because some uh, some people go traditional, go hands-on. I know some artists still who still do that, and some go digital. So it depends on how you work this, and some people do both. 
-hmm. So there's a lot of ways of working it. Now, this is one of the tips and tricks. After page one of a comic book, like a normal book, you have page two, three, four, five, onwards until the last page, which is also an even number. You always end on an even number in comic books. So from after page one, if I may interject, comic books in printing and publishing always goes normally in rule of thumb. You go in sequence of pages of four or eight. Yeah, you know it's like one layout. That's why the even number because in terms of the production, like when you do the final product, like if you're doing a PDF, be it digital or print, when you're flipping through it, you, know, you want to know that that's front cover, that's the back cover. So you always go in segments. Think about it of uh, your page numbers, like total pages. When you think about total breakdown in sequences of four or eight, it's generally real of thumb. It is. Um, I want. I want. I want to dive in too deep, but if you if you're not sure. <laughs> how to script your pages when they're facing each other. You just look at your, just open up your hands, put them side by side. Those are your two pages facing each other. And as you see your two hands, that's how a comic book reader will see your pages. No one's gonna purposely ignore the other page. It is human instinct to see it all. So you keep that in the back of your mind when you script it. Um, is it weird? It is what it is, right? So um be it uh you're gonna use it or ignore it but if you want to go fancy this is called a two-page spread um this is when two pages are facing each other as i mentioned two three four five and yeah so on and so forth you can actually stretch your panels across both pages um, and then you have a lot of crazy space to do a lot of crazy action Right? You can see this is like two pages worth of space for the artist to go nuts on. And also for your words, your word balloons can be like nuts, but still, you're still following the Z pattern, regardless of how many panels or how big your panels are. Here's one tip. This is called, the, this is in between, this is the middle. This is where the spine is of your book. Yep. It will fold. It will fold into itself. So therefore, when we talked about bleeds and safety areas of, of lettering and art, um, I keep that in mind when I script that. I don't go, I'm going to put a word balloon in action right in the middle here. It's not going to look really good because that's a horrible place to do it. Lettering will mm -hmm. never work here. You have space in the middle. Art can, but that's really mean on your artist. It's best to have just background so that if it folds in, it doesn't make a difference. And no one is going to really care. So, depending on how they lay out the panels, it can be very tricky. Like this is like this is okay. This might be a problem because if I have a word balloon here, it's not going to work. Yes. Right. So yes. Right here, this would be a problem here, and this would be a problem here. So I would tell, I might go, okay, shift the word balloon onto the second page of the two-page spread to the, to the letterer so that they don't, you know, mess it up. It would read it a little weird, but because I know this will happen, I I, I would put that as an instruction. So that's a tip right there. For you. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Uh, well, when you let her <laughs> <laughs> and experience that. Yep. So, you never want it to be in the crease because, you know, if it's printed, of course it bends. So it's hard to read any caption box. But even if it's digital, if it's flat, it looks like it's cropped and it looks, well, it looks odd. So you, you know, it looks like it's what I call, what we call pinching. Yeah. So it's like you have a caption of a panel and that dialog box is there and it fills up half that panel laid edge. It makes it very difficult to read in the rear kind of has uh, read exhaustion when you're doing that. So it's like it's, it breaks up the flow of the spread. Exactly. So where am I here? So this is for you guys to copy. You can take a screenshot. Uh, basically, it's the basically the description of, well, the full uh, script version I just showed you of the script. So uh, hopefully I have everything that you can use here you can mention before the page number and the panels panel the inscription stuff caption boxes is short form is short formed into cap so it's not captain america i know a lot of people ask me that one for some reason because i showed captain america caption cap means caption boxes and if you want to make me well, if you want to be specific to your letter put these put these in quote in uh brackets after cap so if i had cap and then have brackets character thoughts then it'll be like AK the, the thought balloon, but the thought caption box. I really honestly I hate these things, but it's for honestly for lettering, it saves so much space and it actually allows the art to breathe a lot more. I, I know I hate it personally, visually it's it, it's really distracting for a reader, but 
for production va- for production speed and value of what it does, it's pretty but good. It sometimes it fits within narrative. If you do something that's a little bit more a tongue in cheek, you know, you do this old retro things like a little box and go. Meanwhile, dot dot dot. Yeah. Absolutely, it, whatever. If it fits, you can go absolutely full retro. I've seen Howard and I have seen many graphic novels that still use this approach in a clever way that just fits so well with the narrative. Oh yeah. So as I said, there's no there's no set rules of how to do this, and you know, caption boxes can be any shape and size. It could be a rectangle. It can be you know a blob, I guess as well. You know, it could be anything. Uh, well, even things- Mobius, some of the French comics to do like a space where we showed like it's an alien world. Uh, Mobius, like Inca, uh, at one point there were triangles. They were yes. triangles. Yes, which was, I, that's so mean to a letter, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, made, he made it work. He figured it out. It's, it's so weird. I'm like, ah, why? But it, yeah, he made it work. But I, I don't know. When I started lettering, I'm like, no, don't do that. Ah, it's just evil. But it, it can be done, but it's going to be a lot of work. Um, sound effects, there's no rules. It can be any shape, size, color, fonts, whatever you they feel like it's really cool. You can, for like something like Crash, you can use a font with cracks in it or just, if your artist is really good, they can draw it and integrate it into the art. And personally, I love when the sound effects is integrated into the <laughs> art. Personally, um, it's because uh, in today's time, because we have digital lettering, um, I call them stickers and a lot of letters hate me and I, because I letter and I do the same thing. You slap them on to the art, like stickers, because it's really hard to integrate something, uh, like the sound effects into the art and make it flow. It's much easier for the artist because then the perspective and the color and the values of the color uh, and i'm jumping into tech stuff but will match properly versus like that purple is way off and that purple there and doesn't really work out so it's better for the artist if they're doing if they're doing inter- integrated sound effects it's best like, for the artist oh yeah it. like one thing uh, is like when howard writes uh vfx visual effects and it's like it could be there's no dialogue in that panel but it's like someone's like ryu and and street fighters is is is, is charging his hadouken so it's like for that i try to integrate the sound effect into the illustration as it's like you see it woom, 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 like i'll write all those letters part of the waves that that's radio is like charging so that way it's like it's not just like you know like an overlay it because it'll fit the scene so it's like it's like part of the energy it's part of the effect it's part of the illustration as it's like before he unleashes it and then um then when he when he releases it next panel like this I'll do a like you know illustrate big bright light and that way the sound because you know it's so much energy and i want the sound to be emphasis and then i'll do like the what howard's explained like a, a variant with the sticker with the perspective the show and it's very nice full colors so you can read it and it's uh, like you can have a lot of fun with that guys uh look at like old comics like even asterix and obelix which did just black sharpie like you know lettering for the uh for the sound effects but they're so well done and some of them are so clever where especially when they get injured like did the Romans take a look at some of the old like retro comics. There's some clever, clever stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Like, abs- oh, well, I'm going to be showing some books in a second, but let me get here because I want to make sure you guys remember to sign up for part two of two with Dom. He's actually wearing the same hat. I just realized that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, this is the blue one. The blue one? <laughs> I'm so sorry. He's wearing the blue one today. So tomorrow, uh, December 12th same time same channel um from 10 to 12 you'll be seeing dom take my script which i'll be writing uh, after this i'm going to do a quick full script if i can hopefully if not you'll be seeing the mobile version of a script which is basically honestly plot it's terrible actually it's plot with die of holding dialogue but it works and there's one person i know who still uses that in the marvel office which is dan slot He's the only one. Oh, yeah. he, he admits it too. He, well, he was trained that way. So yeah, yeah it just it. makes sense. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right, that's the way he writes. And there's, I think it's like one or two artists yeah, that will work with him on that. But that said, I have, yeah. I have <laughs> seen scripts from famous writers, I won't say who, that basically is a stream of consciousness. There's no breaks in scenes. It's just literally scene after scene and holding dialogue. And it's just like a, you know, a 50 page document for a 20 page comic. I seen that from our, my artist friends. And he's like, check out what I'm gonna have to do in the month. And I look at him like, I would burn it. Um, my <laughs> God, you can't, how 20 pages? That's not 20 pages. That's like a graphic novel crap they stuck in there when I read it. And it's like, wow. And 
that's why I always keep in mind when I write um, to to not do that, to not kill my artist and stuff like that. Um, let me stop sharing here for a second. I think you guys got that part. And I'm going to move the spotlight off your face. I'm sorry. I'm going to... So you guys can see me. All right. So yeah. So keep that in mind uh, when you write that you don't want to destroy your artist and give them too much instructions and stuff. Let them breathe. Um, I'm going to share some books. People have asked me in the past what books that I usually have and used in the past. So I'm going to share them on the screen here. So the first one. This is the first one. Understanding Comics: The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. And this has been read to death uh, on my part. It's amazing stuff. Um, he writes it like a comic book, so it's not really like a manual. Um, you can see that here. I don't know if you can see that. I'm showing this in front of my face, so I'm, hopefully I'm showing this in an intelligent way. Um, let me see if we can find anything really smart here. Um, da, 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 da. And one of the good so, things is that it's like you show like you know, those comic yes. accounts, all hand lettered. Yeah, so he'll, he'll, he basically breaks it down so that it's easy to understand. He reads like a comic book. Um, he talks about the gutter, which I love. That was my life favorite things about the gutter. I can't find it here. I can't remember the chapter is, but gut, the, you know, he goes really deep into theory. If you want to get there, right, for this book, then they can find it in the library and stuff and bookstores. Because understanding comics, Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. The other one he did, uh, which typically sounds so bad. He stripped all the theory out. And so there's all the practical stuff, and now he and then and, and made making comics by Scott McCloud. So and right there, same? you see the panel layout, left to right, top to bottom. Yeah. So you can see, I'm just open some pages. So it's exactly the same thing. It's like a comic book, right? No, it's no difference. But he basically just, I don't know, he tore out all the theory and then made this. So um, if you're gonna read his stuff, this first, so you get this. And this becomes your 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 tool and Bible, I guess, for for going back to like, what should I do with this scene? And I don't read I don't read them anymore. I flip through them. I always like flip through my 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 books of writing and stuff or I think wherever I'm working on just to pop up some ideas. Um, the other books that I I have. Let me grab them. Oh, they're really heavy. Will Eisner's graphic storytelling and visual narrative. Yeah. This is a, a book uh, I would say you should have too. And for a Schuster Award nominee, highly recommended. I'm referring to you, Howard. The show yeah, Schuster. Uh, I am. I am. So his examples are the same thing. It's in the comic book form as well. Little old school, some people say, but it applies uh, forever. I'm trying to see if there's anything neat quickly enough. I didn't mark down pages. I'm just just. You know, he talks about Rodgers, writer, see, same kind of stuff we're talking about today, even, right? Um, so this is a good one too, and the other one that he wrote, oh, let's grab it. It's so big. Here we go. Is Will Eisner? Oh, reflection here. Here we go. Will Eisner's comics and sequential art. So it's because comic books is sequential art, and it's exactly the same thing. He writes it like a comic book, and he shows examples and stuff that he actually used and published comic books. Um, why do I have these four books and I have other ones too? It's because you learn from them. Um, here's an example of something that's really great that both of them talk about. It's about the, as I mentioned, comic books is not a film. It's a, a static image thing. So he talks about using immediate action and showing how to break down of what you can do with your panels and what would it, what would convey that kind of uh, scene, that kind of action. Um, Again, these are usually can find um, in well all bookstores for sure. You can find digital versions of if I'm right. Then try your library. Oh, this is great. This is like an old script from that he has in his book. You can tell it's not really different from <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's you know? that's old school. And you see the two whole rings because it was in a binder. Yeah, they had special binders for that. So it's really weird that you know like we haven't changed the format so much, but. Um, because of technology, we're able to do crazier things. And I, I had some, some. It has, he had some really good stuff here that um, that helped uh, for artists here. Stuff like this, you know. I don't know if you can see that or not because I can't see my screen when I do this. I'm like showing right from the camera, so hopefully that's something you guys can see. Mm -hmm. um, so those, like I said, these four books: uh, Will Eisner's uh, 
uh, uh, uh, comics and experiential arts. Will Eisner's graphic storytelling and visual narrative. Scott McCloud's making comics. And Scott McCloud's understanding comics, the visible art. That's a great book, too. Um, those are like the four I would say start up with. Are there more? I show a few? Yeah, give me one second. I'm going to. Actually, no, yeah. Go and ahead. the fun thing is, it's like the next logical step to what you just showed. And some of these I know you're going to be very familiar with, Howard. Go for it. Okay. I mean, there's, there's tons of books in the library. I started my stuff and research and learning in the library. I mean, it's the resources are, are vast out there now these days. Can we? Do, uh, can you do a spell on me? Am I? Do I do a spell on? I'm, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna try to. I I can. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha you here. There you go. You're spotlighted. Okay. So this is uh, the DC guide to creating comics. Now, in terms of like for like we're talking about difference, like you know between like um marvel and dc similar yet not now dc is like because i was old school when i was doing work for them they were still like you know they were still at the time time warner publishing still printer man magazine all like that but Jim Lee, they made an entire set that i was very happy that they they sent me uh, uh, the whole process about how they do things now you start off with this basic one creating comics they have one for writing for penciling but i find like with this uh they show like some uh action poses like you know how to do some sequential breakdowns uh when uh like you know action scenes like you know like superman like flying but in terms of like you know for the layout like you see here for panels like even new formats for overlapping if you're curious about that this is great for the mainstream uh dc comics process for you indie makers like howard and i and like you know this this, this whole fluff for like independent original content uh, this one I found was really cool. There by Daniel Cooney was writing and illustrating uh, your graphic novel. Right. Now for this one here, it's like it's a little bit more old school in terms of illustrations, but uh, I find like you know it, everything that we covered is essentially broken down here, including like you know when you get the script, you see your panel one, panel two, the optional layouts that you can do to play with your composition. And that way you think ahead like for next page uh everything here from like the breakdowns for see it's not like the you know, format that works for for him and one thing about this book it does showcase other independent uh, graphic novels that you would see in the comic book convention circuit now in terms of art this one here he's a legend steve rude sketchbook and uh you can you can order from his website but anything with steve rudy's collection like you know and on, on amazon chapters about like uh comic book illustration and anatomy and the one thing is that I, I i but one guy my personal guy that i thought was really well done was by uh brian uh brian hitch now the only thing is that there's a forward here by joss whedon so that's <laughs> that's a little odd but this is for uh like in terms of world building i thought this was excellent it's for the, the the ultimates and you can see like early on when they were doing for marvel the early meeting phase with the script and all these little scribbles and notes from that to do something as detailed as like here's this where you see like photo references to get like certain shots and angles oh that's nice and then he even explains how to do from pencil to digital. This oh. book actually covers the entire process, how they made the Ultimates comic from beginning to end. For those heavily. who don't know, for those who don't know, who are fans of the MCU, I meaning the films, it's heavily, heavily taken from the Ultimate series. Uh, amazing stuff. Uh, they sell it as uh, true paperbacks. I th I'm pretty sure you can get that digitally from the library. or actually bought it from the library do it uh art's beautiful but the way they retool the characters for anybody to start up and read is why the mcu decided to uh to start up with that um let me move the spotlight for a second real quick here so um one quick question from everybody did anyone get a chance to scribble down a story or not they would like us to take a look at it and give some critiques on the fly it, obviously it's a work in progress everything in comics is a work in progress until it's sent to the printer to be honest um <laughs> this is not, not even a joke like uh as people decide if you want to share or not i mean like even my book here 
uh, that I lettered to. I wrote it with one of our co-wrote it with one of our friends, uh, Josh Stratford, and the artist is from Singapore, Robin uh, Simon Ng. It's a horror book, and it's just black and white. It's nothing, nothing like colorful and stuff like that. It's a horror book, so I don't know if there's any kids here, so I'm not going to show the any content inside. But um, it is a horror book, and lo and behold, I found a spelling mistake. Um, the day it was going to be sent to the publisher, I mean, sorry, the printer. So I changed it and sent it. So yeah, you're not done until you can't change it anymore, really. So if you if you guys are have anything written down or even if it's handwritten, please. Really, share. Any thoughts you like want to share? Like we're not yeah. necessarily here to critique. We're just being a, a creative group. Yeah, we're trying just to give exchanging some ideas. Just a bunch of creatives, kind of pointers and stuff. And for for those who. Are starting out to be in art and stuff and it's like how do i draw something that's in action or whatnot you take something like a like a figure it doesn't matter it's like my i just grabbed it back there you can see this is a pose I, and i can rotate it and with my camera my camera is my if you can if a camera you can actually move the camera around whatever take a photo of it and then it becomes a flat image it's much easier to draw because if you see this that's right. eyeballing it it's really difficult to draw for some people but if you take a photo of it it flattens down the image then you can see your, your perspective lines and whatnot. Um, and sometimes, uh, I already had an excellent point, sometimes for lighting, if I'm, if say it's nighttime. Yeah. Like even for like objects, right? Mm. There's, there's this really weird uh, shapes and shadows, right? I think that's not really zoom. Like, there you go. So it's like- You can shine a flashlight, figure out your shadows, like, oh, it's high noon. So you know yes. that so you have to put the suns yeah. up here. So you just on your figure, shine them down. So you know, cast shadows are going straight down and it helps you with that. I've done that. Uh, last week, Howard and I shared a tip from uh, legendary Marvel illustrator uh, Eddie Grenoff, who designed the look for Iron Man that you see in the films these days, through especially in his uh, Iron Man Extremis uh, story arc, which is a really interesting animated comic that he did that you can you can watch. Like I think it's on Netflix still. But uh, when he did design, and people were wondering, how do you do such great looking metal? And his trick dumbfounded me it was so brilliant it's like uh, why is it that no one's ever thought of this before so he goes in like yeah i go with pencil and i go with some acrylic or like a light wash but how do you know how to set your shadows he has a spoon <laughs> at his desk and he will look look at it with lighting and say okay that's how it curves the arm and he'll put his arm and he'll just like oh okay and that way he just holds the spoon and then he'll draw it that way he knows how to do the metal shine and the gradient for the curves a spoon ingenious yeah it, don't don't be afraid to use things from your home everything um like even for writers out there who are pure writers i look at those this is why i do all the junk uh, partially why i have stuff in my back i get inspired sometimes i go how is this going to really look you know, like it's easy just to sort of imagine it but then when you start looking at a physical object like oh, okay that's going to look weird if i ask him to draw you know ask him to be drawn like this and then they'll change the angle or something um, it helps. It helps you visually. Having visuals helps. You know, the music helps set the tone, the feelings. Use everything. Um, once again, if you guys have any story, if your stories that you out there, definitely feel free to, you know, be it pop in the chat, share it on the screen, or if you want to do that, um, just really just to you know, you, just to see what you guys are doing and what you're working on. For me, I did like somewhat of a thought process towards a story. I have an idea for my my you know simple plot. And then um, I'm going to be changing that, converting that to a script. Uh, hopefully, that's going to be doable, um, which I showed on my last, one of my last screens to ask for a screenshot and break it down in full script for Dom, who's going to art it up tomorrow. Um, basically, do the layouts, breakdowns, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, tomorrow, the guys, if you're if you're drawing by hand, freehand, you know, it's, uh, oh. that's great. If you guys are doing like digital. So okay. like, uh, hear about this. Hey, Rob, go ahead. Try now. I see. I think I got it working. Now I'll spotlight Rob. Give me a second here. Where are you, Rob? What are you doing, Rob? Where's Rob? My audio's on, but my camera has been disabled. The Who's host it? has stopped it. Yeah. Boo. Okay. <laughs> oh, can you, can you tell us like uh, what you have? You can okay, share so now. You can oh, you can share now. It. Try, right, try it now. See. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I can see you. All righty. All righty. Okay, so... All right. All right, can you just... All right. That's all right. great. I, I, I spotlight Rob. There you go. Right. Okay, so where am I? Uh, whoa, sorry. Right. So the idea of the witch from last week, yeah? 
Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so established world, modern, uh, uh, normal, but there were witches, other supernatural elements also possible. Uh, the conflict at the beginning of the story, uh, the heroine, our heroine, uh, OH, I have no idea what I'm going to call her, has outsaved her purpose, is about to be executed. Solution through either supernatural or normal means, the OH disarms the executioner, the conflict is resolved. Uh, so... Oh, hang on a sec. There it is. From last week. Uh, yeah, I thought, well, just as a play about the same character. Personality, nervous, scared, driven by reactions. Background, a, gu a gurach, daughter of a long line is a Welsh word for a witch. A long line of gurach women who have passed on their knowledge onto their daughters. Suffers from light sensitivity, sensitivity only ever active at night. Uh, important stuff had been used by an unscrewable organization for dark deeds uh, and now she's out, out used or outlived her purpose uh, her, uh, her usefulness now on the run and looking for revenge so okay. that's uh, what i've got with that so far yeah love it i love, love it. it that's great so just, i yeah, love just, the fact that you you that you, you took it and made it your own that's the whole point yes that's awesome. Yes. Like well, There's a whole point. That's great, Rob. That was a whole point <laughs> last week. They're saying take an element ah, of a character and make it your own. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else want to share? Oh, somebody shared that they're on tap media. Yeah. Somebody yeah, I have it open here. Let's take a look here, Alfred. Thanks. I'm clicking. I'm right. loading really slowly. <laughs> I don't know why it's so slow. Uh, I'll share. I'll try to share my screen. Let's see if I can do that real quick. Oh man, I love the drawing style. It reminds me of like a lot of stuff that, like from the seventies that's now becoming trendy again. Like those, oh, like yeah, it's kind of what I was going for. So I'm sharing. Al I'm sharing my screen. I'm looking at Alfred's stuff here. His Tapas Media is. Uh, I guess I'll stuff the cookies here. It is a digital platform for comics where it reads differently. He reads from top down versus left and right. If that, I'm trying to explain it as best as I can. So you would read it like the way I'm scrolling it. So the word balloons still do the Z pattern, but instead of going from from the left page to the right page, you're actually going going down. So I'm, uh, I'm digging this. Like the job um, of the house, Alfred. Having the focus there for the for the reader. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there and then yeah, then in the bed, then feeling trapped, and then the balloon stuff is great. I love that. Yeah. Oh I, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm feeling it right now. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is clever how you did the, the 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 thought bubbles, like you know, like that with the scratch there. I yeah. really, yeah. really dig. This is Absolutely. this is the epitome of of indie comic books, like especially for yeah. graphic novels. But it's 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 allowing me left to right, top to bottom. So I'm following the story, and already you you've succeeded in that. The fact that I can look at this thing right away and follow the narrative. And already be immersed in the artwork and style with the writing that's that i consider that success thanks i really appreciate it yeah i mean it's 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 i mean my first exposure to tapas me tapas media was before called that actually i was doing a talk at now that the funk it sounds so bad the funk uh scad uh uh hong kong uh school scad uh, is is a school in scad where the hell are they Shoot, I just forgot what SCAD stood for. <laughs> oh my God, it's an art college. I just forgot the whole name of it. But I was there and it's like, how many people are doing comic books in this comic book? It was a, it was a course for uh, sequential art. And then the professor asked me to come in and do a talk and then do some critiques. I'm like, how many people are doing comics? Everybody's hand up. How many doing traditional comics? No one put their hand up. <laughs> how many people doing digital comics? They put their hand up. I'm like, what kind of digital comics? And then they should talk about webtoons and what we're called now, Tapas Media. Um, it's a different kind of flow. You're still using a lot of the things that we talked about today, but you're not going from page two to three. There's no facing pages. It's more top, the bottom of a page and the top of the other page, if that makes sense. But technically, you don't have pages in quotation, so it's a different uh, way of formatting your story. Uh, I've seen some people who use that to advantage and like have vines and trees growing all the way down the entire chapter they have, and as you go down, it becomes more rotted and stuff. So it's really cool. So there's a lot of things you can do depending on the format of your sequential storytelling. So, you know, it you know, 
there's no restrictions in that sense. You can no. do it digital. You can go traditional. You can go like digital, but still traditional. Two pages facing each other. So, no, go at it for sure.、Um, if there's no one else who wants to share, I'll give it a quick minute, maybe Andrew, for any questions that people. Yeah, we'll give it、have. two minutes, and that will be twenty after. And then, well, we'll give it to、uh, yeah, two minutes, and I'll just、uh, give a little brief there what to expect for tomorrow, and then we can wrap up. So, so anyway, tomorrow,、uh, if you guys don't have your store ideas or concepts there、uh, ready now, don't feel pressured. It's perfectly fine.、Uh, we're gonna we're gonna revisit it、uh, tomorrow morning、uh, for tomorrow's、uh, workshop. Tomorrow's workshop, what we'll do is that we're gonna take Howard's script and he'll he'll brief me, and you're gonna see the whole process of like the initial meeting between the writer and the creative, and then it, you'll see like he's gonna you know, read me the script so I can I can have a visual of what it is. Because he, as he's reading it to me, and it's like it's not always the case. Most time, I have to read it myself. But one thing I like with Howard is that he'll set set the tone, like how the dialogue is supposed to be. So that way, it's like when I'm doing my quick little thumbnails, great. That's out of the way, so I know like minimal lighting or or a high contrast scene or what have you. So like we're talking about that with challenges, like with you guys with your story ideas tomorrow morning, and now、uh, while I'm working on my exercise with Howard. I'll also be any questions、uh, during the live session. You ask me, we're going to be working together, like we're in a bullpen, and it just happened to be that I'm I'm sitting across Howard. We're working on our thing. You guys are in the next、uh, cubicle, and you guys are doing your own thing, just like if we're like you know in DC or Marvel or in, at Image. So that's how their approach. We're going to go with tomorrow. Some like cross, like you know, I'll be sharing my screen time time. Like well, obviously for the most part, but we'll be sharing with each other, and then we're just going to help to strengthen each other, give a little feedback. And I'm going to be doing stuff. I'll be honest on purpose because I want you guys to give me some feedback. As a reader, it's like, what do you think of this? Is this too much? Is this too little? Howard's going to do that too. So it's like, you know, it's like I want you guys to be involved with a bit of the process and feel confident in recognizing these things. Because if you recognize some things that I'll intentionally do wrong tomorrow, it makes you help, feel more confident when you're working on your own.、Thing. So、yeah. tomorrow, guys, don't feel stressed. I will have my little friend, Tiny Bob. Honey, <laughs> Bob will be with us. Did we do some happy、oh, drawing?、Man. So we're gonna do some happy drawing.、Uh, and that、nah. panel's gonna have a little friend, and maybe we can add a little squirrel. So don't feel bad. Another thing too is that we actually will talk a bit about box cuts because it's like in terms of theory、uh, for you creators and drawing, you know, even psychologically in the background is noise. But if you actually listen to the man and pay attention to his studies,、uh, if you're wondering for like how do I do the world shot, you know, from background, mid ground, foreground. Uh, his approach, Bob Ross, is brilliant, and it's subconsciously that in school we're still using these things. We don't acknowledge it, but we have him play in the studio or all like this. Is that it does help? So it's like I want you to get into that same rhythm as Bob, and get into that joy, and just do some happy doodling. Oh, happy little trees are gonna happen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so guys, we look forward to yeah, happy little lines. Exactly, Rob. It's all about the happy little lines. Lines. Yeah. So if you know, don't worry if you don't have any questions today. You can still shoot them out to me tomorrow, or I threw my link in the chat, so you can always message me in any social media that I'm on. If you have any questions,、uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow, same time, same channel. Same channel. And then you'll see my first draft of a script, and then seeing Dom Carrot Hart, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. It'll be all a true blue reaction. <laughs> oh my god! Can't wait. So, but so Howard's、much. a good writer. He's just—he's he's known no. what I had to work with in the past. <laughs> no, I, I I fake it till I until I make it.、Um, <laughs> I I want to appreciate. I want to send out my thanks. I appreciate you guys for showing up, especially in the morning with us. And、uh, hopefully, you can enjoy the rest of your weekend. Looks like in Toronto, it's a beginning to be a beautiful day. I want to be out there now. <laughs> so, you know, thank you very much, and we're. Very much for that wonderful introduction, and welcome to part two of two of making comics for the first time with、uh, myself, Howard Wong, and Don McShern. Hey, sorry, I just yelled at your name. That's so terrible. But I'm just gonna leave it like that. It has、uh, gravitas and drama. It, it is. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is run through really quick, and don't worry. As, as mentioned, it will be shown、um, on a recording sometime next month.、Um, What I did last week, so I'm not going to go through too、yeah. much, real too much here. But we talked about character development、uh, and the three different things that 
three things that you should keep as a core base to create character besides the visuals, personality, background, and some important stuff for your artists to draw and know about. To touched upon, it's clicking really slow. Why is it clicking slow? Here we go, world building. Again, three things that you should keep in mind is the kind of genre you're working with or subgenre, background, meaning you know, significant events that happen that will dictate the kind of world that it is, the geography, the layout of the land, technology that affects it, or magic. Again, important stuff as well for your artists and readers to know about as well. So those two things, let us, boop, 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 where am I here? I'm going too fast myself. Here we go, story time. So we got everybody yesterday to write a short story that includes these, these three things, establishing your world and type of story, uh, introducing a conflict, something, a problem that will be resolved, the resolution by your character, hopefully by the end. And we try to keep it as a one page story uh, so that we can see it all come together. Now, I had some messages for some people who said, it's impossible to do. It, it's difficult. Nothing's impossible in my mind. And I'm going to sh share a script uh, that I'm going to be giving a Dom in the chat so everybody can see it as well. Um, it's a first draft, meaning that there's things that need to be fixed. So I didn't expect anyone to actually complete a finalized draft in a, in a, in, a, in a less than less than 24 hours. Can it be done? Yes, both Dom and I know that it can be done. Do we prefer it to be done less than 24 hours? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> we like to have time to work on it. So um, that's what we got. That's where we left off at the end of yesterday. And yes, we did talk about uh, different things about kind of book specific things, which Dom will go over today. So I wouldn't worry about it too much today. I am going to, let's see here if I can do it quickly. And then I, oh, hang on. I'm going to share, I'm going to try to, the script with everybody. I wonder if I can just do that. Oh, here we go. It's loading really slow. So <clears throat> as I talk and wait for my Dropbox to load, um, I can tell you right now that Dom did not see the script uh, yet, um, partially because I was still working on it uh, today. <laughs> um, and I am going to pass it off to him here if I can find it. Oh, that's weird. Do, 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 do. Huh, interesting. Did you know? Oh, I know what. You know what, Dom? Take it over for a second. I need to wait for my Dropbox to uh, sync. So you can talk and show some stuff for a bit. Okay, so in that case, I'm just going to show some about uh, some basic theory there for combo panels. Okay. Yeah, you got to definitely do that. So I'm just you do share screen thank you guys so this was here is an interesting site now as you know the comic book page uh, now here in the gold ratio they, they actually did a pretty good interesting like breakdown here i'm just using this for uh visual reference now as you know comic book is is quite small but the original production size it's a uh, tabloid size 11 by 17. we normally use uh crystal board or a form of hard stock uh some people like uh like if you hear the term cold press or uh, hot press, it's how it's how how the paper's treated. So it's like cold press. It's uh, it's gonna have a toothier note to it. So that way, if you're inking and you like certain like textured lines, uh, then then the type of ink you're using, then you would get you know some people like to use like a cold press board. If it's hot press, it's smoother, it's slick, and if you have a nice ink that's very you know dries almost instantly and it's solid black. This is the type of like, you know, you would get a hot press. So some people are very comfortable working straight with ink, but generally it's fine. It's like, if you're going to go, you can ink digitally, but uh, the size would be 11 by 17 and the same applies to digital. So you can just set your digital template to 11 by 17 for production. You would assign like a, a 0.5 bleed, but this here, see your work, your safe, what we call the safe zone is 10 by 15. So that's like, if you're doing to set your inner margins in your digital template, you would do the, the artboard or document size 11 by 17 and your actual work area at 10 by 50. And that's why you get like longer. But then again, if you're an independent combo maker, uh, whatever you uh, arrangement you have with the printer in, time, in terms of like the publishing, you can go any size you like. But as you can see, like as we initially, we always break down in three segments. 
So when we're, we're trying to lay out a composition system of thirds, you know, it's like, okay, first row, second row, third row, beginning, middle, and A, B, C. And we always, in human nature, like we can, we can modify these if we have to based on context, but if they are too tight and depending on the information that it's trying to convey, you know, we can get away with it or not. That is some of the challenges we have to face based on the script. Now, here is where the, what we, I call the tic-tac-toe plaid effect. And it's just like, this could work. There has been comics where I have done this, where there was just like no background, where just some dialogue, where there are just, you know, two people, tense moment, or this, I made this cleverly into one overall illustration. And, but it was easy to break apart with, based on the script, all the word balloons and dialogue. So this was one page that had a significant amount of dialogue. This is actually one clever way how you can break it up. You have one word balloon that's here, connecting to another one, to the other one. So it's a back and forth between two characters. This established some kind of scene that they're in. And then we're gonna get into, based on the script, like prioritization, which one that we, panels that we want to emphasize more for the story. But the general rule of thumb in any comic book page is that you readers always read left to right, top to bottom. So uh, one thing that uh, Howard strongly emphasized, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna confirm right now, is that the 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 rule of Z or the rule of Z or the rule of two. So it's like your eye travels like this naturally. You always kind of start from left to right, and then from here you return back to continue the next line. And you know, and then back to you always want that in the bottom right hand corner of this page. Whatever you draw, whatever you do for a dog, it visually in terms of narrative, you want that reader to turn the page to see what's going on. So it's like it draws your eye to here so they can turn the page. So that's why you have certain approaches like this here is like a river. This is just a little too convoluted when you do it like this, if you're trying to break it up. This would be more make more sense how your eye travels when reading like you know the the panels same like here see the fish are looking over to this character character has a word balloon you're reading left to right and the way the fish you're not you're not even realizing it the way the fish is looking bring your eye down here just bring the reader it's almost like you're guiding the reader oh now the fish the action's going from left to right again and sees a turn it's like it's just everything's like you don't have to think it becomes i i promise you guys as you work there in your comics it, it just becomes so natural uh, you don't even have to think it you just l you let your eyes tell you where you want things to go and your drawings will fall this is here's like you know one guy that we use for not only for for comic book panel layouts for some composition but also comic book covers so that way we can know it would like you know proportionally how to lay out like any tech like any items that we want to have focus on as you can see like from here get a nice proportion this is a nice panel they, because they want to have a nice big background like that takes a full page artwork and then you can use these little ones to help establish your visual narrative and this grid here is like it's like to do the circle and just like box it in to get your proportions see it still has a three system three system there but the, like you got these three rows and you just like connect these circles and then yeah, and you can have here a video layout and then you can see you make this digital you can find this grid here this is the like a circle linear composition guys as you can see right here but i like to make my own so if you have like a digital file you can use it as an overlay as a layer and that way you can use that also to help but although in this case here i'm like you guys i'm doing everything on the fly from scratch but just so that way you guys have a bit of understanding of my approach when I look at how a script and how I have to figure out the action. Like here is an eagle landing. As it lands, it perches and looks over. Your eyes bring it bring, bring back here. Oh, there's fish. It's fishing. That's what it's doing right there. And the angle where everything goes down to the bottom right. So as a reader, you want to flip the page and see what's the next part of the story. So here too, it's like, you know, see when you're establishing your world, but the fish, even though it's a lot, it's very empty and calm. Little fish right here, bring your eye to this panel. So it's like, as you're looking to this and taking this whole panel in, reading left to right, top to bottom. 
And even the fish are looking here to the right. So it goes to the next page. There's your layout. So as you can see, that's here too. And so it's uh, working with the motion. So it's a play on perspective. But even though you play with the perspective and this camera angles and the and layout, it's still taking into effect how see the main focus down here in the bottom right. So they can want you want them to turn that page. And the thing is with word balloons, guys, as we were talked about, never ever have the word balloons do this right into their mouth. Never over the face. It's always suggestively pointing to the person. So you know they're talking. It's not their head thinking. You don't have it up here. It's not their ear. They can have a, 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 a certain, like, you know, they're listening. But as Howard discussed, there we will visit those again. But the word balloons, that's why they laid out. And you can see here in this panel, when there's a lot of dialogue, you can break it up. And it helps with the composition. So hey, I'm going to return it back to Howard. I shared the uh, script into chat for everybody as a PDF. If anyone has a problem downloading it, let me know. I also have a little message for everybody to follow uh, your process, but also to do their own. And they're welcome to ask me questions as though they are, because they are working on a comic book uh, with me. So you can treat it as though you are now an artist working for whatever publisher you would like to call, uh, to be your dream publisher and you're working with a writer. Fortunately, it's me. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're trying to decipher what I've written for you to draw. So Dom, can, we'll look at that. And then because uh, for those of you just who joined us, we're going to be doing it uh, live back and forth, which is usually done through emails or through chat functions because most people work internationally. It just so happened that we were able to do it here live so they can see the process before you. So I will let Dom download that first. And if you have any questions about uh, things yesterday or things uh, during this session, let me know. I got the copy opening up now. Rob has a question I'm going to read out. So he's joined late. He asked me to share a script again. I'm not sure. Can you actually screw up in the chat or you can't see it? No, uh, if he just joined, then uh, uh, he wouldn't see the uh, older, older. Uh, no problem, Rob. I'm going to share it again and I'll share the message I sent out once more as we wait for my really sluggish computer to load that back up. <laughs> so, um, Dom will talk about uh, his process and everybody, you know what? Uh, I should mention, mention it pretty clear that everybody has a different process. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's sort of like art. Um, there you go, Rob. You shared it. I'm going to share the message again. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste my message as we talk. So for those who are wondering, um, and then people have asked me in the past, is there a right way or a wrong way to do comics or anything? Any, and for most things, uh, no. There isn't. Um, it's like when I say I work in mobile games, I kind of laugh because a lot. Most of the games I worked on, the game design is done. The and the animatics, or you want to call it animated, animated sequences in these games are done, and they have holding stories and holding dialogue, meaning that they just made it up on the fly. So I have to work within those parameters of this game is done. The animation is done the lead up to why there's action where the care player actually performs the action is done now to put it together so it's contextually makes sense and that it's enthralling for people and nine times out of ten i uh i love game designers but not all game designers are writers i literally just did bomb their script and then rewrite from scratch um still keeping the core ideas of the game designer uh his vision and stuff of course so I've done it a few times, uh, and it's it's not impossible. It's definitely challenging, uh, especially when it's a long scene when it's technically should have been a short scene, and you really can't cut the animation and stuff like that. So in, in, Reading in your script. Yeah. I, oh, you you got it. So I'll let, I'll let you take over because I wasn't sure if you were able to open it or not. So if anyone has any issues opening or want to, you know, you need me to re reshare it, definitely let me know. So. Back to Dom. Okay. Dom's, now having, Dom's now having an ulcer being built up from now my script a bit, but um. <laughs> oh, it's not the skeletons that uh, I'm worried about. 
Look, don't worry. I have it's like I start. I just started reading this, so I got this draft uh, Tale of the Witch Monster from Howard. So I know now. Okay, so characters. Okay, we got Mediarsa. That was the one from last weekend. We have a mage and uh, young and older. Okay, so we have a mage that has two modes. We have a great serpent sorceress. Okay, interesting because this one here is like, well, this uh, could be. Let's see what's in store for this scene and a thief. So page one, four panels, not actual. Okay, four panels for a first page. That's not bad, but I'm always worried because that means like how much detail is in the scene. So in terms of dialogue, okay, panel one. So here I know that it's daytime. Great. So I know this like in terms of like this uh, mineral shallow, very bright. Uh, it's well lit. Remarky ledge near cave where Medi Ursa, the witch monster resides. So two men are looking over the edge ledge at a cave below. Reference black sand beach in Iceland. Have photos we'll send later. See, that's that's great. Uh, whenever a writer says like, you know, when they do that, when they get too poetic uh, with the description of the panel, it's not necessary for, for the artist, because if it goes like you write something like in the sands, the Beko with like, you know, whispers of past fallen comment that doesn't, you know, it's, it's like just what caused the sand and all like this. This is fantastic. So that's like when we when um, and that's how efficient when it's like if we're work, working live, like these little 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 details are key to for a really solid work relationship. There were skeletons littered uh, before the opening. OK, one of the men is the mage. The other is the thief. At this time, the thief doesn't know that the one he is with is the mage. Okay, so we got a buddy. So in terms of body language, you got to do two travelers. I guess I'm going to go Frodo Samwise with this. All right, well, I can have some fun. So dialogue connected one to two. So that means connected. It means like the dialogue box. I, I have to bear in mind that how I lay them out, they he's going to have two word bubbles, the bridge, and then he'll connect to that character. So that's fine. It just tells me that, you know, I can't bring him up too much and I have to give some room. So it's like, it's, well, we're going to get to that in a minute when I get to the thumbnail. Uh, you weren't very good. Okay. So that like one is, so how is it that, you know, the monster with a gem on its head and uh, where exactly to find it? Okay. It's not in a lot of dialogue already. I knew from there. So it's like, that's, that's great. Uh, you weren't very concerned. Okay, good. I'm a sober thief now. Indulge me. Excellent. So to me, it's like, you know, that's it's not too complicated panel. Now, the next one leaves me a little bit concerned, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I took a look at advance. So the first one, incredibly straightforward. Wonderful. Wonderful. Not a problem. Like I could do a few thumbnails and have some nice, you know, silhouette and, and bring that composition. And it's, it establishes uh, the setting and the feel and tone of, for the story. So now we have here pound two montage. Oh, changing tones. Okay. Montage use as much space as needed. Okay. So I can maybe do a large panel on the side. Uh, use on uh, uniform borders or not. Okay. So I can do the first panel with a stroke as a salt panel and do what we showed earlier with like with an eagle and do like the next scene as part of like the background is the full page illustration. That's some that's an option that he's presenting me here. And that's something that I can overcome based on already, you know, the complexity of this scene. So it gives me some more breathing room. So with that, we have montage uh, shows that uh, what the mage is telling the thief about well, what you were saying sorry, just earlier, maybe go sepia to show this happened in the past. Yeah, of course, we can do that. Black and white faded, whatever best suits you black and white do pencil, keep it as pencil rather than ink, you know, to make it look like, you know, that it's in the past. All great techniques, even watercolor. I know a lot of artists that do that too. And uh, my preferred is like, I like to go pencil. So that way it looks like sketch. It looks like the past and it gives a nice haze. So that's a little trick to save you some time. You just keep it as pencil and not ink it for anything that's like in the past. And just clean up the pencils. So for the next part, Monte shows what the mage is telling the thief about how the witch was turned into a monster by her mentor. And now he placed a binding protection spell around their unborn daughter encased into a blood gem that we know that is on her forehead based on the character we designed last weekend and to keep her safe from the mentor. And in the end, the thief will figure out the mage in the story is the man next to him as we return back to the present in the next panel. Ooh, it's a good, a nice twist. This I like because that way it's like, you know, I could set up uh, a certain 
look and feel like that mage i can do like i could do it age his clothing how he is with a thief and then in the past flashback make it look pristine and mint so that's uh, like it shows a passage of time so that's a visual thing that helps you know, as you know as like for a reader and that was like it's not like a brand new character just appear but it's enough of a hint and reference so that way there's a relationship a visual relationship and association with the narrative so next of course there is that uh okay where we were is uh yeah, where the mage did all uh, all this in hopes the thief will help him free the blood gem from the witch monster. I'll break down the montage into numbered sections for clarity. That's appreciative. And then the letter is note. You use different colors to identify the mage and thief's captions. Uh, the captions are those floating boxes, you know, like, you know, to, that we talked about. And Howard showed that uh, with the Doctor Strange segment there in the uh, Iron Man comic. So it's like, uh, and we explained the use of captions. And it's, it's a bit of a cheat, but, um, you know, it gets the job done. And honestly, captions are, you we see it in video games all the time now. So I have no problem with using caption boxes, none at all. So if you want to use them by all means. So for Montas section number one, so we're doing, this is like composite illustration. I know, so this is, it is best how our laid out. And you know, I appreciate this for the panel. It's like the first panel will be solid. And this background homage is going to be part of the background. And the next few panels, I'll have them floating over top of that illustration. So with this montage section, I have to illustrate next. So for this panel two, this background, the young witch and the great serpent sorceress happily casting a spell together. As the mage applauds or cheers, both the young witch and her mentor are lurking his way and smiling at him. So there's some good emotions here, so I can use something that's suggestive. I think I'll probably go a little watercolor with this. So the caption, a witch being trained by a great serpent sorceress fell in love with a nomadic mage. It's a council story. Onto, now we have section two. So we know it's like I have to do panel one, them at the entrance, and then flowing here to them, the story. So on the right hand of that first row, it's going to be a story there, kind of like smoke or something, and probably go have it to a campfire. We'll see what how what Howard writes and see how, how how they're placed so montage section two next part of that story in the flashback the mage is before and greeting uh, the mage is before and greeting the great serpent sorceress he looks at the witch behind her but it seems that he's looking at the great serpent sorceress the great serpent sor what so the witch behind her is it break What's going on here, Howard? Great. First question. So think of it as three people, uh, serpent sources in the middle. Uh, she's facing the mage. The mage is facing her, the witch is behind the serpent sorceress. The mage is actually looking at the witch because he's in love with her, but the serpent sorceress thinks she's he is looking at her. So miscommunication of nonverbal communication, if that makes sense. So the serpent sorceress believes that the mage is actually coming to visit her and seeing her and courting her all this time while he's actually courting the witch. So far, so good. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... So usually what I would also do sometimes is use my... You can see that I have a bunch of toys in the background there. I would tend to think like sometimes take a photo <laughs> of what this... Like of, of a really generic camera shot scene of this and make notes. It's saying like, this is the mage. She's looking at the witch, but the super source thinks she, she's being... She, he's looking at her, giving her the doughy eye thing, uh, making her fall in love with him, but he's actually in love with the witch behind her. If that means, yeah, so basically- See, like this, a, this is why like, I would have to ask Howard, like what's going on here? Because with the actions here was actually like, I understand, but it's like, I could just do them and they're all looking at each other like straight, but I have no context as to what, what is what is going on a bit. So it's like asking Howard, like what's going on here? It's like, is this a, like plot the murder? Even though it's like, I'm not, I haven't read the whole thing as of yet. It's just that visually I need to see like, I'm trying to imagine like a like a movie, like each scene how it flows. So that way there's everything has an osmosis to it. So now it's like here's like the witch is like wearing loose clothing to hide the fact that she is pregnant. So it's like concerning like, you know, how we can design the character, it's like, yep, I know how I can do that. It's very suggestive. Uh so we have here for months we visit uh caption the great serpent sorceress in order to see the witch, their love blossom, and she was with child. Montage section three, the mage and witch next to each other with the great serpent sorceress facing them. 
She is furious and pointing at the witch. There is energy collecting around her fingers. Her finger, her the mage and witch are holding hands. The witch has her other hand up open. We can first see that she is pregnant. And then of course the caption, none known to all. The great serpent sorceress had feelings for the mage when she discovered her own apprentice was in love with the mage and was with child. Montage four. That's quick. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna have to skip ahead. It's like, huh. How much am I drawing? So now it's like I'm seeing like, you know, I'm gonna have to play with quite a bit of composition. We're gonna to get to that shortly. Okay, so uh, uh we're here at Monta section three, the mage and witch next to each other with the great serpent sorceress facing them. She is furious, pointing at the witch. There's oh we went there. Monta section four, apologies. The great serpent sorceress cursing the witch into a monster. Maybe shows her half transforming. Now that's our that's the what I'm looking for. Is what's the big dramatic scene in the page? The what the, the, the eye catcher. It's like what then I then that helps me to set up my composition panels so that way the focus. So we have here like our incredible Hulk moment. So we and so with this here, section four. So right before I proceed anymore, I'm just doing a quick thumbnail. If it'll let me draw. So for those uh, wondering, is all this dialogue and any text that I wrote in this script, is it like that's the final one? As you saw at the beginning, this is the first draft. Uh, I literally will edit. Like there's, this is every writer's different. I literally will edit dialogue all the way to the last minute. Um, because it's sort of like what you do it in film or television, you keep editing it to be refined until it's there's no more time to do it. Um, in this case, for comic books, it's <laughs> there's a two it's a two edged sword. You edit because you make it better, but you also edit because the art will change, the flow will change. Dom has all full control at this point. He can literally go. I'm going to just draw your montage as one thing or two uh, two scenes and it'll be done and it'll be just as effective and now you have more space for dialogue or you might add the uh, pan i don't think he would but he could technically add scenes or add more panels and now i have less space for the dialogue that i have and i will have to tweak it so it's not like he has to follow word for word what i wrote down in instructions and also for how much space he needs to leave for my dialogue um but because we are working live, he can ask me, is this line in very important? If not, you can, we can, if we can shorten it, and I can do something different. Uh, so that's what Dom is trying to figure out is what makes it best for a visual storytelling. And then he'll come back to me and maybe have questions about taking things out, adding things, or maybe shorting my dialogue, which is totally fine. And what he should do as well, as well as you guys, you definitely are welcome to throw your hat into the ring and do the same thing. Do your version of this. I'll be very excited as well as Dom to see what you guys come up with this. Um, one caveat is I know I added some characters to the, to the story that have not been drawn. Don't need to draw them. Just draw them as stick figures because in reality, they would have been designed long ago for this stuff. But because of this being just a workshop, we're just going to just use stick figures or whatever and only keep uh, the... Well yeah, we're just uh, doing stick yeah. first for a layout, and then we're gonna get actually to uh, quick drawing. Like by in about, I would say like by when it gets to about a quarter after eleven, I'm gonna go in with like almost like uh, I'm gonna go Ken Lashley with like Copics markers, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's great because like you you go like the Ken Lashley method, and you know he has his he has white, gray, and black. You get your yeah. dark tones, yeah. your mid tones, and you get your highlights. And it's like, that's that's how I tend to work for the breakdown for thumbnails. And then you go in later and you can polish and add the details. But it's here what I'm trying to uh, get is see if I can get an homage to Incredible Hulk, like, you know, a bit of an idea. Like if I can use the character of the transformation break, you know, and then uh, with the story and like the battle scene them at the entrance. So right now I'm just trying based on the description of the script to see how much room I have. Uh, the play. So I know like here in this first panel, they're going to be at this uh, this entrance. And it's like, yeah, I know you can't see, but it's like, it just that way just gives me an idea like, okay, panel one, this one, these guys, this montage, them battling small, like about that size to montage two, and then montage three. And then this would be like four. So I'm just going to switch 
color for a moment. So that way, I always see the montage would be one is here, two, three, four. So going now, I return to the script. Now that I see here for this dramatic moment. And now here's like we get into dialogue. So section four, okay, Grace of Source Bursting the Witch into a Monster. We know that. So her other hand, this is where we were. The other, her other hand is up and in the claw position is glowing. The mage and witches on board child has been separate and is surrounded by the same glow emanating from the other hand, but only half. Uh, the mage is casting a binding protection spell around his unborn child at the same time, encasing him and her into blood uh, into a blood jam, which it makes up the other half. Thinking it was a target for over the unborn child. So what I have here is like this is great. I can make her like, you know, as the transformation scene, like foreground, and then have like like a perspective with the action scene. So the other characters are like in the midground and background. So that gives me something that works for that layout. So we're still we're going with the rule of two, the rule of Z, Z. Now she cursed her in that caption, she cursed her into a monster, plan on taking the unborn child and the gem. Uh, because see, this is great. This is another reason why it was key that Howard wrote different colors for the caption boxes, because that means I don't have to draw necessarily the, the mage and the thief. It's like, you, you know that it's like a voiceover, it's a narration. So it's like that way it's like, you know, if I can do that and when I color, uh, then I can give like the thief a blue cape and his caption box is blue. And it's like, you know, the mage can have like, you know, some like a mostly yellow or green like cloak. And it's like, I can have a similar like lime green color to that too for his caption box. And it's all about visual association and staying consistent. So here's like, we have here panel three. So now the panel three is going to be in the third row in that section MCU of, uh, MCU of the thief looking at the teary eye, desperate looking mage. Thief emphasizes with what happened to the witch and the mage, and we can see in his expression, thief and the image and servant sorceress. So it's like a nice close up shot. Okay, so that I love doing this. After a dramatic scene like that, that's great. So I can do something nice and calm, no background, and just, you know, having that uh, look and and then to have uh, what we showed earlier with like the fish, we can have like the thief like looking like I am now looking towards the left. So that way it goes into panel four, which is the bottom right, which is what I want. Disappeared and was assumed dead and has been looking for a master thief to help free his, do uh, his my daughter. That's it, that's great. Panel four, uh, major thief in front of the cave's entrance. The thief has his hands up in the air in shock. The mage has hands up in mid spell casting. Skeletons litter the ground around them with various types of armor, swords, and other types of weapons. The witch monster has emerged from uh, the cave, partly out of it. She's screaming violently. We see the blood gem embedded on her forehead. Uh, my mother was a witch. Uh, thie oh, thief. My mother was a witch, mister, but I already told you that at the pub. Fine, you got your thief. Let's get your dog and then roar. Okay. So. Right here is like for the action scene, like, you know, have it like a scene at the end like that. There's like, I, I want to do something a bit more dramatic. So now it's like that, that bottom corner gets a little tight. So now I've got to think about what I had in mind doesn't really work. This is quite, there's quite a lot that's, that's happening in this page. Not impossible. Just about where you want, where you want the focus to be. So in this case, normally I would like, I would uh, call up, I would call, I contact Howard and do a few thumbs. But since we're doing this live, don't have to do that. I can just ask him right away. So I'm just gonna play this. And so there's some drawing. Okay, so first things first there is we know like a, and this is my thumbnails and we always have like four or six on the go. I'm just going to do quick four thumbnails there to get an idea how I'm going to break down and tells me also where, where I can draw. So this one, we'll try this, this one here, try this.
Yeah, I'm with a question in the chat of how how is any advice for choosing colors? And for me, I mentioned that it would be dictated by the story's tone. So if it's like a dark, sad story, it'd be muted colors. Is there anything else you would like to add to that? Because um, I kind of cheat because uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not an artist, you know, in any in, in, in right, but. Uh, for, I mean, for color palettes, I usually go to good old Google and do a color palette generator <laughs> for, for my help. Um, I don't know, is there any suggestion uh, that you would give to, to the people out there? For, for colors there, it's like, if, if you're gonna go with a color palette, it's like one thing is that uh, if, if you're doing it by hand, it's, of course, it's like digital is a lot more forgiving and the basic for digital is uh, I would say, it's like try to limit your color palette. So it's like you try to choose no more than like five or seven colors. Now, first work you can, the beauty part about working digitally is that you can work with gray tones. So you work with your grayscale and you can do a layer over top and set the color or overlay. And then you can just go over and you get, because you already got your shadows in from your, your grayscale rendering. And that way you can go in with another layer for highlights. So you have your basic flat, like digital, you would do an overlay, like here's your flat colors, your, your fillers. Then the layer over top, you would set it to saturation, like if it's a cityscape or some of that. Now saturation, what it does is that it will, whatever color you put, it's like the hue. It's like a, like a hue, that's the same thing with that filter, it's like an afterglow, you know, reflective lighting. So that ambient color. So like, you know, like uh, from a street lamp or a neon sign, it's, it's, it's excellent for that. That way it's like, that's how I, the trick, how to get like, like some airbrushing over and it's like light of, you know, like the blue light on the skin. You know, that's reflecting off a neon sign and from a window in the rain you set to over to overlay uh you set layer to uh saturation and then put your color now if you were to do that by hand now the first thing i would do is like if you're depending on the medium that you're using um so it's like uh for hold on i'm gonna so that way i've realized i'm talking to a camera i'm doing a screen share uh, if you're going to be using like, you know, uh, inks, uh, one thing is just like for colors that's quite forgiving is using gouache. If you use gouache as your base and you go over top with your inks afterwards, you're like, you can go one, one gouache is terribly forgiving for one. It's like, it's, 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 it's when you know how to use it, using a little exacto blade, you can scrape up some of the edges, a little water and it, it dries matte. And it's like for independent comic book makers, and I've seen this in Europe, and they go over with an ink brush afterwards, and it's still porous enough to take on like ink brush. If you're that old school, that's a great approach. And it's like nothing beats old school. Like, you know, if you just stick to old school, but if you're going to go like the, with the comics that Tyra and I uh, grew up with, uh, you know, you're going like a manhua, you're going with a brush and then like, you know, what I would suggest is like with the colors that go with your inks, dry, 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 dry. Just make sure you don't bleed like with that black ink but the black ink could could you know i would actually go reverse and go light to dark so if you can put your basic hints of color if you look at uh early uh, ma wing uh comics they're like storm riders he would just put blobs of color it's just blobs and let the natural watercolor bleeds work in his favor like pushing there's a jawline and then this would all be plain like what's called naked it's just like it's untouched it's the natural paper, but it's enough of a line with jaw. And then he'll go in with his black and that's how he did his combo covers. And it made it look like amazingly detailed, but if you really break it down, his color approach is quite simple. So it's like for colors, if you're gonna go with hues, try to limit it. So it's like, if you're gonna stick, it's a cool scene, night scene, stick with cool colors, that's it. And then if you're gonna go with daytime, stick with warm colors based on environment. Green, complementaries. Always ensure like, you know, if you're going to go like, you know, hint of green, if there's a lot of red, so I'm going to go back to share screen. We're going to get back to drawing. So like for here, there's like, I'm trying to, uh, figure out, uh, essentially, uh, like to, to draw the eye and I'm going to draw some panels. There's so, like, you know, that's absolutely like, I know for a fact, these are not going to work. And then I'm going to go in with my blue. So my blue is like going to be, I'm just going to go and switch to marker. So that way we kind of get an idea about how much room we have with some characters. So 
I'm just putting like some blobs here so I get my idea of my, my shapes. So cave entrance. Obviously, it's going to be some debris and this here I would have to go with some kind of like purple, maybe bluish like hues. And one thing is like if you're going to use like purplish hues, then you use little hints like fireflies. That's why you see like sometimes when you see in Comptoir Dark when you, uh, oh, it's so nice and magical, like purple and the fireflies. We, it's just adding hints of like yellow. Yellow makes purple more purple and it makes yellow more yellow. That's the beauty of like, using complementary colors. So the reason why I'm doing this is like I'm uh, right now for the first panel, it's like just different perspectives. So it's like I would have the characters here further away from the cave entrance in this panel. So that was like, you know, they're walking towards it. This one here is like a bit lower the rings and, you know, you expect Gandalf to speak friend. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. You want and it just shows... Do you, want me to share, do you want me to share the uh, photos, refs for this, for the cave and stuff, or? Yeah. Favorite? Yeah, can, do you have samples of for the cave? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, I was trying to dig in my old photos because it actually was in Iceland <laughs> at the cave, but let me see if I can use mine and then I'll grab some of them for the internet. There's no, you know, for anyone who's like here, obviously there's no right or wrong for photo reference. You can use your own, use things in the internet. Yeah, let me see if I can get that. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to actually get started on uh, uh, the thumb because I'm going to show you some of the panels that uh, I realized like it would not necessarily work. Oh, yeah. For sure. And, and by the way, I'm just doing this on 8.5 by 11, guys. Like, you know, it's like doing tests at home. Um, the whole point of this is like, you know, to just figure out where to lay everything out. So, uh... oh, those rocks. Yeah, these rock. This is a black sand beach from Vic uh, at in Iceland. I was there uh, overnight with my wife and kids, and we walked over here for breakfast. Uh, well, close by to it for breakfast. You can't really leave there. It was actually a, a kind of a secret picnic table in the middle of nowhere on the beach. Okay. Which honestly, I can't. you've asked me where not right now where it is. I could, if I could probably find out. But it's sort of the same thing. When I was at the Great Pyramids, I found a great spot to sit. We could look at the pyramids and not be bothered. Or could hopefully we didn't get stung by scorpions and stuff because we're playing in the sand because you know my kids were young anyways moving on so these kind of rocks be kind of cool i think visually and somewhat easier to draw possibly maybe not i don't know i'm just like this is kind of a, a nice visual where like the sand is black so it gives that mood and tone because we've been we, i think most people have seen the silica normal silica sand which is all you know kind of that weird like beige color right so this kind of the sand it comes because it's a volcanic well Basically, Iceland is basically one giant volcanic island, really, if you think about it. Um, with other hot springs and stuff like that, which are which are very sorely missed right now with the, with the weather we've been having, uh, besides the last two days, I guess. <laughs> so, these are the kind of sand beaches and stuff like that. Um, well, it's weird. I don't know why I couldn't share the other screen. I wonder if I can do that. Because I thought... I, are you guys seeing one screen or two screens? Now I'm very curious. Let's see the uh, one screen. Let's see the uh, shore. Ah. Okay, let me get back to the cave then. Da, 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 da. So I'm gonna use. I'll look at this cave. This is a different. This is a different place. It's obviously. Um, well, you can see it right here. The famous cave where you can walk behind. You know, famous waterfall you can walk behind it. So I did that. Um, when were we there? We were there, September, which was uh, still a little cold, not freezing though, but. Um, so you actually walk for this for this waterfall. You can actually walk behind it, which is really cool. Uh, so there's actually a, a path back here. Uh, you come up from the side here and you walk around. And so I I'm sharing this with you because this could I don't know now or maybe in later, most likely later, that it could be a POV from uh, Murder Usa's view out from inside the cave, kind of thing. Like inside the cave, it's dark and gloomy, but outside, it's it's not too too bad. Even if that makes sense. So it's a dichotomy of her life where she's like hidden inside this weird shell, in K AK her monster form, and outside is where she wants to be and be a part of kind of thing. So um, I don't know if I have any other shots of that, so I can use that. This is from the other side, on the outside. So I'm not sure if this this might be something that might be more appealing with you with the waterfall aspect of it. You don't have to, right? Um, you know, 
just gives you some uh, ideas. Some ideas. That, the waterfall, yeah, there's going to be some cascading. I think this guy's going to give some motion there too. Yeah. So it depends if you want to do that. And then for ledges, I don't know. I'm, I'm just scrolling through my photos in Iceland right now. Um, that's Vic as well. I don't know if there's any ledges actually. Yeah. Uh, supermarket stuff that's wonderful oh, More no, the, i'm uh, actually thing. starting the a rough on panel one so that way i can get started on so for ledge here that's actually me for reference anyways this is where is this this i know this is iceland but uh yeah this is it's good for a sense of scale yeah so basically they would be here in the cave might i don't know wherever you might think obviously you would flip it because it's page one so we'd be looking to the right so you would flip the image so the guys would be on the left looking down at the cave at the right if that makes more, you know what I mean, right? We were basically mirroring the image, so this image wouldn't be right because then you'd be looking away from. <laughs> if it was panel one per se, you would flip the image so that the people be here to care. Actually, there's people right there. Christ, we're looking at the cave over here, so the eyes would be drawn into the Z pattern that we mentioned yesterday and today and last week. No, not last week. Yesterday and today. So that'd be like that. So that may be good for that. This, if you want to know where the Black Sand Beach is, that's where it is. Actually, the picnic table is near here, somewhere. You can drive, sort of somewhat drive to and do a little bit of hype. So there you go. I don't think there's anything else I can use here for that. So, again, vacation photos are very useful. <laughs> this is actually the Black Sand <laughs> Beach as well. Uh, that was my lunch, that's kind of gross. Um, I don't know. It's another scene. It's actually from a farmer's land that I kind of might have stolen water from his, stolen water from his little creature. But um, <laughs> this is another scene that you, another scenic scene that you can possibly use. I don't know. I uh, almost got something here to show everyone. I'm so, almost ready. I'm just actually just roughing in my mage and thief right now. So you know, there's like always anything you can use for 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 this kind of stuff. Um, you know. And in, in, in all honesty, there's no wrong ref visual reference for your artist or for yourself. I mean, I'm using vacation photos or you can use Google, whatever. I just so happened to be in the location that I wanted uh, uh, to show that anything and everything can be used uh, for this kind of thing. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Dom. I'm going to go back into the messages to see if I missed anybody. And, make it and I'm gonna show you guys what I have started here. So let me just pan out. So right here, just trying to get like a bit of an idea. Of, uh, looking, I'm just gonna go back to my thumbs, my tests. So like looking at the panels here is like trying to get the the establishing ideas that this idea was gonna be was. Uh, like I would say, I'm just gonna write here in red. Number one, um, I love this program, of course. Hey, Tom, as, as, as you struggle with Adobe, the your, uh, the question from um, Haley, uh, what was the name of the Photoshop freeware you mentioned before? Because they didn't catch it. Uh, oh, the Photoshop freeware. Yeah. It's like, yeah, there's uh well, this for, for sketching, there's uh, I'm going to say the name and then I'm going to explain what it is. GIMP. Oh, wow. GIMP. Oh, I haven't used GIMP, GIMP. forever. Yeah. Graphic image manipulation program. It's basically it's it's it, it's free GIMP, G-I-M-P. And it's like a monkey, but it's it's Photoshop <laughs> CS2. I, I will throw it in the chat. I, I know GIMP. I haven't used it forever, though. So you can use that one there as a Photoshop substitute. It's, it's basically Photoshop, definitely Photoshop 6, if you use that older one. And uh, uh, Photoshop CS2 is what I would compare it to. So, so uh, in, in terms of the layout, um, just to like how in panel one, I, I, I changed the composition. So it's like, I knew I need something small here because it flows to them. I have to do something like them talking and then it can kind of flow to the story. So the only thing is that I'll show you what I did wrong. I was like in my new rough that I realized. So before we get into the module and the backstory, and, and back here I was trying to be clever with the panels, and then you can't do that. You might as well go all out or all in. And one of the things here is that in, uh, especially, uh, I recommend this book if you guys uh, are interested, like, you know, for getting some kind of reference guide, is Brian Hitch's Ultimate Comic Studio. The man does everything. So, and Brian Hitch, 
if you guys are fans of the MCU films, heavily inspired by uh, his run during uh, uh, Marvel's Ultimates, and which was an attempt to give an alternate modernization reboot for a new audience, younger audience, and also at the same time, a more mature audience. So this, uh, here he talks about uh, like some iPhone stuff, but sorry, I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to find the one that was here. It's too small. It's a little rough, but see the, what he would do is the circles were representing each character. When a writer would say this character is doing this and doing that, that's when I was asking Howard earlier about what's going on in the scene. So it kind of helps me if they're in motion and doing stuff. So I just could get a bit of a perspective. So just like here, he writes like how he, you know, combines these different poses. So that's something that's like I'm trying to figure out here, but at the same time, it has to flow. So what I realized here when I was rereading the script and these panels, this one here has the two approach best but this panel here is terrible uh wanna give this you... one has a z but that, not really there's one thing i want to uh throw out to you there dom mm -hmm. is that for the montage you don't have to treat it as each separate scene as in like you're blocking them out um we could treat it as like a like a, like a long scroll like a chinese painting like a long scroll oh that's happening. what i figured yeah this is, right. is so, all part of the background so these yeah, are so, the, so the, yeah sorry? yeah so Sorry, but the, you know, so the, so you, <laughs> it's, it, this is for production uh, speed. You can technically use the same background for the whole thing, or have no background because it's just a retelling of a thing. So technically, you can just have a black background, or how you use uh, a, a granular uh, tone background, whatever. It doesn't matter because it's just literally the mage telling the thief uh, what we know, why he knows all this stuff, and. In the in a, a, a secondary reason why he's doing it is to convince him to help him, uh, you know, help him save his family per se, right? Um, so you don't have to draw, you know, you know, for montages in general for everybody out there, it doesn't have to be drawn like in panels like a comic book, not at all. It, it definitely can be drawn in it very artistically uh, because it, it it's just to convey what's what would convey what's the meaning and message that you want to do technically if i if i wanted to i could delete all the dialogue from the montage completely uh, and it'll still work completely fine um because comics is a uh, heavily visual narrative um in essence uh even like the way i would review things if i had never asked to review things when i read a comic book sample uh, from someone's portfolio, I don't, you know, as a writer, it's terrible. I don't read it first. I look at the art. I look at the storytelling. Can they tell a story visually? If you can't, that's kind of a really telltale sign that they need help. And you, then that's where you give the pointers of where, which sections of the help that they need. Uh, the second part is when I go back and read it. Why do I read it? Not necessarily for the story or the dialogue or style, because style is very subjective. It's why did, are they using the real estate and i call it real estate but you can but the space that they have per panel and and to say these specific words is there any reason for it um in essence comics to me is less is more in general there are many times where you break that rule where you overwrite and do wordy stuff because maybe the character is a blabbermouth and you have to show that literally it's word, word balloons right then you have to you then should do that but it's a really weird marriage between visual and, and text. So um, the script that I gave to Dom and for everybody else here to, to look at and, you know, if you wish to work on as well, it is not perfect. It's purposely not made perfect. It's one of those scripts where I, in essence, I would show this to someone and telling them so they have an idea where it's going to go and then give them the, the and I use in quotations, the final version. But a version I know that is definitely very doable and very flexible for an artist to work with versus what I did now because it's very challenging. Even I know by when I wrote it, like this is going to be tough to do in a page. It's most likely very better for a two pager and not necessarily from page one to two, but more of a page two to three thing. But it is part of the process to show you, you know, how it works because a lot of times you don't have time. Uh, and then you throw a, a first draft to the artist and then we have to work it because of time constraints. So what Dom's doing is incredible. 
uh, it is not normal. I suggest we. I think we both suggest not to like speed up your process at the get go. Like take time to figure things out so you know what works for you and what doesn't. Exactly. So that's why I do like like almost like these quick、uh, grayscale storyboards. Like I'll refine and I'll refine and I'll refine. I'll add more details. But then here is like I wanted this left to right composition so that way it establishes like that world. You know, it's like the coldness of it and like the just the. Just the harshness of the environment. When you have two figures, they're obviously alone, and like in this in this world. So it's like one thing's like I want to convey from the script the most. So that's what I'm doing like here. And then as we get here to the montage, so you know, like you know, I got I got enough room here to do like cave. So now that Howard confirmed, like for the montage, I don't have to go anything too 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 crazy. So there's a lot of lot of things like this. There's where.、Um, I find the script there's like there's there's a lot of back,、uh, back for a lot of context, a lot of story. Now the caption boxes is like it's it's going to be relatively easy. So in here I have to draw quite a few characters. I have to draw a battle scene, have to, a dueling. I have to draw、uh, a few quite a few challenges. So that's why it's like this is this I would have liked this more if this was written as a spread because it gives me more room to showcase those those scenes. And it's like it's a lot of information that you know, but like how we're saying, it's a challenge, and we have to condense that into you know what what well the editor would tell us. You guys can we you know, you guys only have one page, and it's entirely for several reasons. It could be like you know you pick and choose your battles. Like you know there could be one one scene that's really nice and it goes with the flow, but you know this could be that you know even though we want it, it's more the. The, the telling of the story, the written aspect, and the visual aspect is where it carries more weight. So here's like where I have to revisit this montage and see about、uh, how I'm gonna、uh, represent it, illustrate it. And basically, it's that the way I see it is that I'm gonna do almost like four columns to show like different periods. So I'm just gonna go in back here with my rough, just to give you guys a bit of an idea of my layout, my thinking. Because personally, for first panel at this, I found like you know to have like a cave and have them walking is important. So I'm just kind of like approaching like each montage is going to be like you know, a section onto itself. Because down here I have what how we're showing earlier with、uh, Medusa in the cave. And it's like you know the perspective, and we want to have those two characters here, and obviously someone is looking out to the cave and sees them. And then、uh, here's like them, you know, like they're facing the cave, and they, you know, they're talking. So for the montage, so it's like here I have to figure out like in this part here how I'm going to do this. Now keeping these guys in boxes down here, I find like okay, that sits you in the present. And Howard's suggestion about going full page with the background, like I don't have to go too detailed and just do like you know as part of it and going black and going with some whites. Actually, really helps because that way it's like I'm only drawing. I'm drawing backwards. I'm drawing from or using only highlights. So that's that. And now I'm going to start breaking down my figures. I think it helps, you know, especially in comic books that were for if you're a pure writer、uh, <laughs> to try. It can't sound silly, but to try to draw what you wrote because if you are struggling to figure out a composition. Or the details of how to fit everything on a page, your artist will have this somewhat the same struggle. And why make it more difficult for someone <laughs> versus letting them have、uh, more breathing room and space on the page to do their thing per se, right? So you always, you always find ways to do that. I mean, I think I mean I joke and and I've seen this too. Oh my god, I should essentially draw it, which is crazy. It's like if you go to an artist, like I'm going to have a great battle scene. Hundreds of ninjas in a library, books flying everywhere, and pages, you know, being torn and in the air, and blah blah. And that's I mean, that's like, you know, like I've seen that last for a few pages. Your arch is gonna like die.、Uh, they, <laughs>、um, they won't be doing that really quickly. So you find ways to convey the same kind of energy and scene, but be realistic, you know. Unless your artist is not, you know,、uh, you know, really into that and loves doing that, you know, why do that, right?、Um, well, we have a bit of a challenge now. I have to design a great serpent sorceress. 
Yeah, no, you don't have to. Just do a stick figure. It doesn't. Matter. It's a holding character right now. I mean, in reality, uh, we would have had more time to create all the characters before we did, we went to this stage. So, well, it kind of ties into like you know we were talking about last week about like certain details to help define. You know, even yeah. still, what you were recognized. So I'm gonna go with her like a cobra. Yeah, you know, with on. the. You can have a snake, a snake body with arms, whatever. <laughs> Can we get well, just like if it's sorceress, sorceress, you know, like they see the like on the top here, we just have to have the yeah. fan out like a cobra. Well, yeah, you know. Yeah, and then have like you know this tunic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you don't have to like, yeah, be just... more serpentine, serpentine like yeah. eyes. Yeah, exactly. You know, you don't, you don't have to go bonker nuts because it's no, 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 just movement, yeah. just like sorceress. But yeah, almost like you see like a half worn hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, yeah, we can do that for the source. The high collar of Cobra Command. No, uh, well, it's, yeah, exactly. Cobra, uh, what the hell? <laughs> That's not Cobra <laughs> Commander. Uh, I screwed that one bad. Oh, my 80, my eighties me is like crying now. Oh, God, Sepentor. Oh my God, how did I forget that? For name? shame. Oh, you remember his battle cry, but I won't repeat it. Um, <laughs> that was the one of the most bizarre things in childhood. This when he did his battle cry, I'm like, well, now they have one. Terrible, but now they have one. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But coolest character from that, from that, from that storyline was definitely uh, Nemesis Enforcer. He was pretty badass, if you ask me. His little bat wings that were laser proof doesn't make sense whatsoever, but whatever. <laughs> There's so many things like my, my in college there, I had a roommate and uh, he had the aircraft carrier, he had the shuttle. Wow. Unbelievable. That is madness. That's it's huge. huge. Yeah, because it's, like a, it's the size. Literally, the aircraft carrier was the size of our coffee table. Because it actually fit the jets on. Oh my god. That's yeah. Crazy. His parents had too much money. Um. No, he was actually. <laughs> oh. Wait, was he was he adult yeah. buying this stuff? Or uh, actually, he was he was very smart. He was using it to pay rent. He was he was trading on eBay. Uh. So what he would do is he would he would get those collectible toys, but then at the same time, what he would do is that he was using like first he loved them, and he was he was studying uh, illustration and sorry, this there's kind of watching on me. There we go. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would just like get the parts, and in each time it was like you know the typical eBay thing. It's like you, know, you start with a paper clip and you walk away with like you know like a telescope. He just kept trading and trading, and then uh, he got Fortress Maximus, even the knockoff versions. It was like Buddhas all around our living room, all these Fortress Maximus. But this, I have to say, the aircraft carrier was nice. It was huge, but that space shuttle base, now that was well designed. That's a gorgeous toy. I'm going to sneak in and I'm going to put a uh, spotlight on Rob here. I don't know if you can see Rob, or did I just mess it up? Did I mess it up? I hope I didn't. I just mess it up. I'm spotlighting Rob right now so I can see his his work. He's actually working on it right now. So I can see it myself here. Uh, nice. Oh man, she he's literally just created the uh, <laughs> serpent sorcerer. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can uh, see uh, Rob's uh, Rob's stuff. Good, cool. There we go. Can we do uh, spotlight on Rob? Hi. There we yeah. go. There we go. Okay. Nicely done. Oh, that's cool. Love it. I like the angle. That is nice. That is cool. Oh, look at that. Hey. He, he, Hi. Hey Hello, Rob. Hey, hey, everybody. Yeah, I thought, how can I show she's a serpent sorceress? Because she's got a bloody big snake. <laughs> <laughs> that works for me i mean yeah I'd like you know I it's really fun. funny because like uh you guys were talking uh don was saying oh give her serpent eyes and i was like hey i've just done that <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I, rob i was watching you don't worry i know i mean <laughs> ideas you know what the funny thing is for people who are like whose idea is it when when it comes to final production for whatever it may be as a matter of media media yeah. or medium you're working in you don't know uh because a lot of things get done in, in uh i guess behind the scenes i guess would be the easiest way to explain it like when i created the character uh uh for the for the marvel thing i did which was based on my kid i uh, want both my kids uh, 
original colors literally for her suit was blue and white and gold so that they it, for me it was for me i was to, to separate the visuals between iron man and her when they're on the same scene and stuff because you don't get muddled but then um joe q <laughs> it was crazy this is this is like name dropping but they because they are in, they're they're in marvel marvel comics so uh, joe katessa and dan uh, dan buckley it's like no, this is Iron Man, this is Stark's text, so it's going to be his color. So these are the colors you're going to be using. He's like, you can add the white uh, to differentiate, but it has to be red and gold, period, done. Mm. So, you know, when when the Godfather is uh, Marvel, uh, Marvin Marvel says, uh, yep, okay, we're going gonna to do that because <laughs> that's where we're going. Do they get credit for that in the book and stuff? No, not at all. So. A lot of things happen like this. So even with a design of a character like the uh, uh, Serpent Sorceress, because I have no description, by the way, it's just the name, right? I just, I just threw in a, a holder name. It has happened when we create characters. It's not one person. It's not just me and a artist. Sometimes it's like a whole group of people doing it together. So then we start incorporating different ideas together. So it's 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 like uh, you know a creation by a team, not uh, a person or two yeah. people. Here's an idea. Absolutely. How about the Chinese character? The snake. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nicely done. Oh, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, Rob, uh, wait, wait, you're, you're, still in, wait, you're still in Germany, right? Yeah, I'm in Germany okay. now, but I spent time in Taiwan. There you go. So that, <laughs> but he's originally, <laughs> he's originally from the UK. <laughs> so, um, I got about he, a bit. <laughs> so Rob, Rob is, a, is a man of mystery, similar from like Jason Bourne with art. Um, <laughs> that sense. Um, so when I found, I think you speak Cantonese too. I think if I'm right. Uh, uh, but I speak uh, Mandarin better than I do Cantonese. Unfortunately. That's what I heard too. <laughs> it's like I was gonna say, like, dude, already your Mandarin is way better than mine. But you know, oh, yeah. I can I I can understand you, Rob. I can hear the accent, but I think I have the same accent, so don't worry uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about that. But no, it's that's what I was. What I love about these doing these these workshops like this because you never know where people are from, and even where they're right. where they are now, their backgrounds are like all over the place. Like, such. Oops. We one well, world was different when we traveled, especially back to Hong Kong or anywhere Asia. They assume certain things. When they see Dom, they probably say, oh, he only knows English. But then, you know, it goes beyond that. They see me, it's like, oh, you're going to speak Chinese? I'm like, I can kind of do that, but more likely English and mm. really bad French. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, Google Translate, let's do this. So it blows people's minds, especially when I was doing work in Hong Kong. And it's like, so how do you know that people like it over, like, like this kind of stuff back in North America? Because I was born and raised there and I watched these cartoons about in English and edited. And I was talking about like Gotcha Man, there were, you know, uh, Battle Planets here and how Robotech was actually a redrawn version of Macross. And I have to explain this stuff to people who are from the company that created these things to do work. And they're like, so they existed there? I'm like, yeah, from the long time ago. I'm old. I'm that, it's not from the 90s. So it goes a little further back. And that's because, when they're like, that's when yeah. they connect and they go, so there's actually a culture that loves this. I'm like, I do. That's why I want to do this. I'll mm. still, but I'll be still doing it for money, but I just still really want to do this. So it's, it's a weird, wonderful world where we live in where no matter where you are in the world, there are commonalities between things. Like for Rob, I can try to speak Cantonese and then we'll, you know, see, you know, perfect each other's accents and, and whatnot. And tell, uh, tell war story because I spent, uh, I think 12 days in Taiwan with my wife and kids and we drove, we rented a car. So we drove around literally physically around all Taiwan in 12 days, which was crazy oh, wow. and cool and fun. And, um, cool. almost died once in that trip, but, uh, that's a, another, yeah. that's, that sucks. Well, not, like, obviously we didn't, uh, but, <laughs> but almost <laughs> did, uh, you know, when you drive up the mountains of Yilan and then mm. there's no guardrails. And then it's oh, like right. one, yeah. one, one, one like, so it's technically meant for one and a half car and you're going, you're going down, down it. And a guy coming up is like literally speeding up, you know, cause you think there's no car here. So I did the, whoop, and I went around at the edge and then went oh, back yeah, in yeah, and yeah. I was like, oh, that was dumb. <laughs> yeah. the, the back of your mind, sort of like, I'm going to avoid this accident, but there's no guardrails. You could literally just, you know, go, go. off the edge. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, yeah. 
Ooh, I got, I'm going to slow down now. And then, you know, after that, we took a little bit longer to get off the mountain. But uh, that was that was one of those, the best trips I think I had where driving was fun. And it was crazy because people just kept on saying, driving Taiwan's crazy. He's madness. <laughs> You, you know, people won't let you in and out of lanes and stuff, mm. but total opposite. We were helped by so many people when we got lost. It's absolutely a wonderful place. I don't speak a lick of Mandarin, nor do I read Chinese at all, really. So for me to navigate there with limited language and finger pointing, we, I was totally fine. So definitely yeah. go there when things get better. Absolutely. Definitely a place for that. And the food, oh my God, you'd be gaining yeah. weight if you wouldn't believe. Yeah. <laughs> I love Taiwan. I mean, I spent three years there and uh, but my wife's from the mainland now. I mean, like my wife's from the mainland. Uh, we met here in Germany, but uh, yeah, if I had a, like a good, a well-paid job, a good opportunity, I'd probably say, yeah, I'll go back to Taiwan at any time. Yeah. Do you, did, you hear, did you say that you speak uh, Mandarin as well, Dom? Oh, barely. When I was like, when I was a kid, but I've lost it all like, oh, because God. most of my family is now like in Hong Kong. So it's like most of the family that I used to keep in touch with uh, in mainland China, mm. they all kind of, all just kind of like the, well, you know how there's different dialects. Mm -hmm. I just can't follow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but right. It's like in Canada with Quebec French. It's like you got Quebec French, you got Udaway French, you got uh, Maritime French, Acadian French. Like here, where I am in Ottawa, we call it Joal. <laughs> Joal. Franglish. We oh, speak of the Franglais. Oh, c'est Franglais, ça. <laughs> Franglais. You know, you throw some English like you're in there, like, how you doing? You know, Rob, ça va bien? Uh, oui, c'est oui. un bon dessin. I like uh, what the, 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 the doodling uh, thing. <laughs> it's like yeah, this Franglish. Yeah, doodling. <laughs> oh, my God. That... Qu'est-ce que vous faisiez le weekend? Oh wow! You <laughs> oh, you can, oh, you can say, exact, exact. That's exactly it. It's like you don't say fence man, you say the weekend. Oh my god! For those who are from the states, I wonder if they're blowing their minds. There's actually different versions of French right now, but uh, there is, and unfortunately, um, depending on your teachers teaching you, you could be speaking some. I wouldn't say offensive French, but a version of. <laughs> I, let me put it this way. Any French you learn, especially in Ontario, and you try to go to France and start speaking it, they will, all, all of them will give you the look. And yeah. the younger generation will be like, so are you from Quebec? I'm like, no, I'm from Toronto. Like, And then they, they, you, you see it explains why it's so terribly bad. Uh, you just speak English to me now. <laughs> uh, but French, so awesome. sorry, but the French have got that, chip. French speakers have got that chip on their shoulder. If it's not perfect, it's like, no, don't, don't you speak that French with me? No, no, no. I, I speak a perfect English. So why don't we speak English with each other? You know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I kind of find it funny when I speak to uh, French people from France because uh, they can hear the Quebec and everything, and I uh, totally guess. But we also do have proper French. Alors, quand je rencontre quelqu'un qui vient de la France, je vais parler un peu plus doucement, un peu plus lent, plus calme. It's just like it's more calm because when they start getting that Parisian French, it's just like it becomes jibber jabber. It just it's. But it's like it's proper French, but you're just speaking for the sake of speaking. Like it's it's just I find like you know, you don't have to just calm down. That's Canadian. It's like the Canadian. It's like yeah, that's what we kind of like we're mellow with our French. Where's like, where's you can like tell the, instantly in Montreal. You yeah. walk around, you could you could tell like auditory like when someone French or French from France because it was like oh so come on, it's very fast. But in, and then it's like yeah, it's like true French and it's like those that speak proper French in Canada. It's like c'est juste très douce. C'est pas c'est très relax. C'est très relax. The more you do that, the more the visions of Pepe Le Pew I have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I got a skunk. I named him Pepe in my backyard. Every time I see him, I was like, I'm having a yes, yes. I'm sorry, boys and girls. I am smoking. But New Year's resolution: I will quit. But every time I go out at night, it's like hmm. There's Pepe, and it's, mm. he just nonchalant walks because I live across the street from a Popeyes. <laughs> oh, that's that's uh, that, that's a double-edged sword right there, my friend, uh, for sure, with the chicken burgers and all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's a pizza pizza. He's eating and stop. Pepe is doing great, and there's a bunch of stray cats around. I'm just waiting for that one stray cat with a painted white stripe. 
Oh, that's awesome. You can help with that probably. I'm kidding. Don't do that. That's terrible. <laughs> So what do we have here right now? I'm looking at your screen. So I'm just doing like a bit of an idea for the montage, how I'm going to break it down. So when I do like, you know, watercolors later is that, you know, if I were to do this scene is that uh, essentially I'm just going to pan out real quick. And then I'm going to go in later with my box of color before the end session and do some, uh, some nice contrast. So I'm just going to pan out. So based on this is them walking like this is just my, this is my guys, this is what I always do every time I do a page. I just like, I try to do a bit of a, a rough. And so it gives me some idea for text and where I'm going to lay it out. So concerning here is that I was thinking like, okay, they're going to the cave. So we have going from left to right based on the sample how we provided. So I'm going to do the rocks in the summer aspect. And they're about to walk towards this entrance. Obviously this is going to be adjusted later. Um, here I figured like I'm going to zoom back in. It's quite rough. I'm going to go in with my blue. So for the rough here, basically what uh, I'm doing is that the scene calls for uh, the mage like uh, observing. So so if there's other people, attendees that are watching, these are just columns that I'm going to use for whatever they're in to help separate each montage as a visual separator without drawing an actual panel. So I have here the back view of the serpent sorceress uh, deal dueling with the witch, the nice dramatic uh, perspective shot so that way it's still going from left to right and then that's for montage one montage two is the mage back view so that way it kind of reflects the top so you're going to have some readers going to have some kind of visual association like certain details like the sash wrapped around the shoulder that's a certain color here it would i would draw it looking mint since it looks like in the past but here where the mage is it's like i would have it look more worn so it's almost like the backstory and see like the hood and there's the witch uh, would be here and the serpent sorceress, you know, with this cobra, like, you know, shroud and arms, you know, like royalty cross folded over. So looking majestic. And this is like the background that I would have, like, you know, for the interior of the temple and see the marble calm thing still kind of works. And then it flow here to the next segment of story. Where not this proportion, but it gives me an idea of them like kind of a moment, Roma Juliet tragic love story. Uh, the witch will be obviously like, you know, pregnant. And the back view of the serpent sorceress ready to cast a spell and the attack and leading to montage four, where the, the witch would be like obviously like on her knees, back view, and suggested with lighting that she's transforming into the monster while this energy that's obviously like like life, like an amoeba is forming to become the gemstone, which is the unborn child. And of course they're the, you got the serpent sorceress there and doing her thing here or the witch. So that scene, so it's like a top view. So from the perspective, stand up. Uh, the panel layout, I'm still getting my Z's saying that is how busy the montage is with uh, information. So I'm ready to do comment down down here. So I got my my two, my Z. So now that like, I can go from here, I can go into those panels that are here, which is like, you know, them talking. And I really wanted that this one to be as big as the top for balance, which you is that actually. cave entrance. No, you can do that by putting the second last panel uh, inset into the last panel because it's just talking heads. So you can go totally Wally, uh, <laughs> Wally Wood uh, on there. Uh, well, I yeah. want to give like their view. Them here is uh, to both of them talking. And this is them, their view looking at the entrance cave. And the other view here is from inside the cave. Where you can see part of her monsters kind of, kind of come after them. Yeah, like in silhouette yeah. here. Yeah. Um, but you, you can inset the panel, the, the previous panel, the talking heads and stuff like that into the, so they can enlarge that panel. Because it's because most of it is just a cave that's uh, Framing the panel, the last one, you can actually enlarge the last panel big enough so that you can inset the other two into it. 
then before you can have that big scene because the last that's panel, right so how everybody's saying is like i can incorporate like the illustration of the scene there and have because they're these guys are just talking just have these guys in here exchanging dialogue and have this nice elaborate scene like the monster form Oop, missed up my pen there so oh. if i was do highlights of the monster instead of cave so i'm trying to find uh, i don't know if i can find the actual okay long time ago um i a wonderful, wonderful artist um named Wally Wood drew a guide sheet called Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work that and he stuck it on top of his uh, desk and other people's desk, I guess, uh, for people who said, I hate talking heads they are so boring. I don't want to do this. And um, the original was bought by somebody. I forgot his name. God bless him because he put it online for free. I'm trying to find uh, this might be it. OK, so I'm going to put it on the chat. And this is like 22 panels of talking heads and how to make them dramatic. I'll put it in chat. So for those who know, like artists that I work with, so that's uh, let me write the name, uh, who know about Wally Wood's 22 panels. Uh, I write that down as I talk and I don't mess it up. Uh, that always work. Um, I, when I say, you know, go Wally Wood with it. It really means just draw the talking heads, but you can, then you basically already know that you have at least 22 ways of expressing that and making it work uh, without me going in and describing his, you know, this person standing in the foreground, this one's in heavy shadows and this one's in the, you know, because you can see that, you can click on that link. I think you can download it from there, I'm not sure, but there is a link somewhere from the guy who uploaded, I forgot where it was because it was a million years ago when I did it, um, where it applies to practically every possible talk to tech, you know, talking head scenes that you can think of in comics, to be honest. So when I mentioned that to Dom just now, like you just go Wally Wood with the you know, talking heads and inset uh, into, uh, you're welcome, Jason, uh, into the last panel. Inset means you're putting a panel inside a panel. I know it sounds weird, but it works in the sense that if you're if you put a giant dramatic panel, a big one, like the one we just talked about for the last one, you can put other panels inside it that are not large. And then it becomes um, a functional thing. The last panel that can be bigger and can show more. The inset panels, the word balloons technically could stick out of from the panels, which is not usually the case. So you can sort of cheat your way into writing more dialogue if you wanted to that way as well. I don't think I missed, did I miss anything from for, for, from doing this, Dom? I can't think no, of it. No, that's perfect. So that, that's exactly like when I drew the thumbnail, that explains like when I did, drew the big panel and then like squeezing these guys in. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the last panel, here's a tip. Uh, the last panel of every page, except for your last page, you try. Don't force it. If you force it, you will, you will, you'll, everybody will notice it. You're trying to make it into a page turner panel. So page one, obviously, would be the bottom right. Page two and three, because they're facing, do you need it on page two? Not really. You should, you could, but you definitely need it on page three, because that's the last physical, physical page you see as a reader. So. We're looking at page three, page five, and all the odd numbers until the last page where the last corner of that page, bottom right, you hope that you, when you script or draw, it becomes the page turner thing. You know, so here I have uh, the two gentlemen, the mage and the thief that he convinced to help uh, at the entrance of the cave of the, uh, of the witch monster who is, well, technically will tear them apart. That's why I have it written in the description where there's like a bunch of skeletons in front of her cave because in, in front of her cave because there are people who tried to steal her gem, with, aka her, her unborn child from her. And she obviously didn't like that. So it basically gives you hopefully the sense of, okay, is this going to pan out? Uh, is the thief going to die? Is the mage going to die? How would you know? You got to turn the page. So it's basically what we you do in uh, television, I guess, as well. When you do the arcs, we have story arcs in television, where the end of an arc is sometimes 
not necessarily a ending, but more of a, it's sort of like the old Batman TV show. It's like, you know, find out, you know, in the same bad time, same bad channel next week, whatever, how this concludes. So you, you make it so that people come, you know, force them to come back. And our job is to force, sort of force and encourage, I said force, I should encourage the reader to physically turn the page. So as much as I write it, it's really very art heavy for it to make it work because uh, an artist can mess it up and I've seen it. And it's like, you're reading it, you're getting excited. You're, you're more excited about the middle of the page. And at the end, you're sort of like, oh, it filters off. And you're like, do I really want to find out what happens next? I guess. And that's then you know you can you definitely need to retool that page a bit, uh, be it visually or through text. Oh, it looks great, man. Oh, I'm loving the the view. Oh, I can actually make it all black. That's kind of. I just realized, Dom, that uh, you could technically use the cave's background, how it's all dark, and just frame the whole page, possibly. Great minds think alike, Howard. Yeah. Great minds think alike. <laughs> and that's how I want to figure it's like, okay, I'll do the montage. It's like the mist there. It's like, okay. You can always do like mist there from the waterfall, the entrance. Oh, there you go. Right the top. Nice. It's like very Will Eisner esque from the, you know, the, the old spirit today, uh, the spirit days. That's right. Oh, man. Old school stuff. Still works, man. Still works. There's nothing like old school. That's why I, was, I kept pushing like Bob Ross. Like, guys, just watch Bob Ross. Just even play him in the background. He's he's, he's gonna is subliminal learning, and it's uh, honestly the theory that he's teaching. It, it works. So everyone like, how do I do this background? How can I do this scenery? Just watch Bob Ross. And it's exactly it applies for digital everything. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no, you know, you don't have to buy the news book uh, for anything, for art or writing. Anything that works, works forever, really. I mean, uh, as Dom does this, I will, you know what, I'll, let me grab them out. I, I, can, I showed this yesterday. I will just talk about the books that I use that it's both for writers and artists, if you ask me. This yeah, yeah, recap, you had some, uh, some really yeah. good ones. Yes, yes, yeah, that was so, the one. So I'll just spotlight myself. Uh, so you can. Yeah, let me um, just. I'll do uh, stop sharing, and there you so, go. So first one would be understanding comics from. Oh, I just covered stand. That's terrible. Uh, understanding comics: The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. It's a great introduction to do everything about comic books in theory, and it's all written as a guess it comic book. So it's easy to read and fun. And is it a page turner? I guess so, because you're trying to learn comic books. He did another version of it called Making Comics, which took out all the theory. So you get all the practical technical stuff. So I don't love this book, but I like using it because I know everything from this book. That makes sense. So that becomes more of a, I don't need to go through a lot of stuff. I just get to pull what I need from this book. Um, I, will, I mentioned Will Eisner. So he, he has two wonderful books that you should have in your bookshelf as well. One is Will Eisner's Graphic Storytelling and Visual Narrative. And again, it's a lot of samples of his old work in here and it was descriptions of how it functions. And the other one, because we're talking about kind of books, is Will Eisner Comics and Sequential Art, which again has a lot of samples of his art, but also how and why it functions. Ooh, I just had, I think I just passed one of the pages where I was grabbing, grabbing some infra, grabbing some inspiration. So if you look at here, now I can't see in my screen because I literally have this in front of my camera. So hopefully you can see this. If you look how he's framing the panels here, as well as integrating it with the word balloons or caption boxes. I mentioned one uh, yesterday that caption boxes can be any shape and size. This is a great example where it integrates everything into one visual slash formatting for text and it flows really well that way too so yeah these are like old books but they're very useful they're on my shelf where i can grab them really easily definitely you know try to get them from the library i don't know if the digital versions i would assume they do maybe on amazon uh um, this you'd be surprised there's quite a few especially in toronto there uh I guess there's so many creators there that are in in libraries. So it's like, yeah, you can find the Will Eisner one. I think you can find the, even the Steve Rude one. Well, yeah, exactly. So you, there's always uh, a bunch of books out there. But I'm, I mean, the ones I mentioned are, you know, not necessarily the only ones you should get, the ones I have on my shelf. I mean, I switched it back to Rob to see what he's doing there. 
Uh, ooh. This is interesting. What is that, Rob? This little, that, I think it's an energy, energy thing with things sticking out of it, I guess. I see some serpents. Oh, wow. He, I believe he's doing a panel, a borderless panels here, if I'm right. I uh, am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the montage. My yeah. microphone on again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what can I do to see them like learning magic. So what I've got here is going to be a flower pot where you can see different plants in various stages of growth, like shoots. But then you can see that they're using magic to make one of the plants grow quicker, you know, like uh, fully formed. So these, this is that part where the mage is watching as the two girls, like you can see they're, they're younger here. So they're uh, learning their powers and he's in the background clapping. Nice. That's like that. Yeah. That is brilliant. So it's a completely different take and I love it. I mean, this is, this is the whole, uh, it, this is like the, uh, the great aspect of any memes, like the translation of some of one person to another person can take on us just reveal the story in a different light and it, that's why we have all these different versions of things right and i love it because this will always be a version for somebody and that's why we do it and it, it, i i i i you know employ employ everybody here who's at this workshop also and also to your friends and family that you know, you will have that one person. You can only watch this version of the show, um, like Umbrella Academy. I mean, I love the comic book series. I love it to death. Um, you know, and the art is beautiful. But the, the Netflix show is completely different. <laughs> like, they took literally just the names of the characters and just went to town. And, you know, I'm all for it. I love the show. And my and my wife and kids love the well, show. Well, I'm not going to lie. I have to agree with you. It's like a disappointment. Like, oh, he doesn't have the ape body. Oh. Well, he's an ape like body, but not the yeah. ape body. But I love the show for what it is, for, for not not for what it what it's not, right? Because if they literally just translated the kind of word for word, scene by scene, live action, there's no surprise for me as a fan of that world. It's that's right. Like, you know, I know it's going to happen. I know how it's going to look. I'm like, oh, it's like, oh, they changed that. Oh, they changed that. But it kind of works, you know. And you and you and you see. I mean, I, I mean, I love it for what it is. And my wife and kids didn't read the comic book, so they would, this is their first exposure to it, and they love it. And then I tried giving them uh, the comic to read, and they're like, this is not the same thing as the show. I'm like, nope. <laughs> and they actually like the show better. And that's totally fine, because it's still the work from the original creators, just a different version of it, a different translation of it. So I love it. I'm all for it. Do you ever see any of the different versions of... Uh... Uh, COG, uh, Journey to the West, uh, with the Monkey King. If I mean, I grew up at this. It's interesting you you mentioned Battle of the Planets, and we had Battle of the Planets in I guess the seventies, late seventies, early eighties, maybe. Um, and that was you know completely different to the original Japanese version from what I've read. Oh my god! Uh, yeah. They just they just used the uh, used certain scenes, cut certain episodes, and gave them completely new dialogue. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we grew up in the UK uh, in the 80s with Monkey, the Japanese version of Monkey. And I've seen the I've seen the Chinese, I've seen parts of the Chinese versions uh, that were produced at different times. And I gotta say, I still love the original, not the original, I still love the one I saw first, which is of course the Japanese version. It's so comical. And even that was different to the original Japanese because, of course, it had these <laughs> really fake Chinese accents by British actors. Uh, but if you can find the Japanese version from about the 1980s, uh, yeah, the British translated uh, Japanese uh, Japanese version from the 80s, it's it's pretty hilarious, actually. I don't know if you ever saw that, Howard. No, I haven't seen that one. I'm going to try to dig that up. Um... And for the link, I'll send it to you. And for those who don't know, there's actually a Japanese version of a live action Spider Man TV show, which is <laughs> wonderful for all the wrong reasons, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, it's Power Rangers. It's basically, basically, Spider Man was a Power Ranger. He has a giant robot uh, that he pilots. <laughs> I know. I know. It's Why 
Why would be- they? Because it's from Japan. <laughs> but look it up. It's on you. There's little scenes on YouTube. It, you watch it. You'll 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 have lots of questions. There's not a lot of answers for those questions, but you you take it in as you as as much as you can.、Um, I spoke to Dan Slott a million years ago, and he was working on Spider Verse when he was building. He was building the storyline where he was bringing Spider Men from every single media that he could、uh, legally get his hands onto when he was doing it, and that was one of them he couldn't get for the longest time that everybody wanted him to bring because, like, it's a giant ass robot, and it wasn't even called the Spider Bot or anything that's remotely insect like. It was like the Leopard. Well, shoot, Leopard Con? No, Leopardon. Dom, you remember what it's called? <laughs> I just remember the name didn't make any sense, and it's like every time I he would scream out the name, I heard everything from、uh, Leopardom to like to like、uh, one time I thought it was called seriously Leap, like Leaper Drone, but he just couldn't pronounce Drone. <laughs> I don't know what it, I just I didn't know. I just like it's the Spider Voltron. Like my brothers and I just call it Spider Voltron. Voltron. Oh, that's great. I mean. That's a weird poll, but I was、uh, in a used toy store. I guess that's be the best way to say in Japan. And I saw and like like an old school metal diecast of it, and I was like, "Do I really want this?" <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the price. I'm like, "That's a lot of digits before that period there." No, but you know, it was just fun to see that it had such an impact that there were people who collected it. Had the box was perfect. It was crazy. The box had like, no scratches or tears in it. So it was nuts.、Um, but yeah, these weird things, these translations, may not always be the be for everybody, and sometimes it's only for a select few. But it connects with you for whatever reason. And you know what? Why not? You know,、um, like. Here we have a page. Here, hopefully, a bunch of you have worked on your own story, perhaps, or maybe on on my really badly written script. <laughs> We'd love to see, you know, at the end of this, you know, what you guys have been working on.、Um, be it where you're still working on the script, maybe you're still working on your character, whatever it may be. I would love to see how it goes, because it inspires us. I mean, I hope you know. As much as、uh, what Dom is doing here and what Rob has shared to inspire others, it's the same thing for us. We get inspired by other people all the time.、Um, that's why we, you know, mainly miss conventions. That's why it sounds bad. This is why we miss conventions because we get inspired by fans. Honestly, I mean, how many people have you know? Think about it. Everything between Dom and Nan, myself, I mean, we get people coming up and showing their portfolios or asking us questions or just geeking out, even right. But then it sparks an idea or helps us、uh, complete an idea. Going, I you know, I always wanted to do X, but never figured it out. Oh, that's a good idea. How to fix that problem? I can now do it. And then you know, go home. And exactly, exactly, guys. Like when, like when Howard and I are at the, the con, and I, I, don't, I used to, I used to be like that guy that would be at the booth. It's just like it's like I, I, I never. Like my name tag or anything, so you don't see me. Like I don't do,、uh, like you know, like Mike Ruther or some like like Mike Ruther and I,、uh, Casey Parsons, we went to school together, and、uh, Chip Zdarsky too. Like I'm, I'm always more like graphic design and marketing aspect. So when you see me around, it's like you know,、uh, that's why I, I tend to answer more questions because I don't, I'm not there to promote anything. So when you see Howard and I, especially like you know, when we're, we're there, we love engaging with you guys. We love answering questions. Like we both like doing these workshops. I used to teach as well. So it's like when people ask questions, you know, that's how you start. That's how we started. Like you know, by asking questions, asking our peers, and now we're actually friends with a lot of the people that we we grew up admiring. It's like you know, it's like now it's like you know, I can call Richard Pace a friend, and he kind of helped set me my trajectory. So you、uh-huh. never know, guys. It's like it's a、uh, it's a very welcoming industry. It's true that there's some there's always some negative. There's always some、uh, sour elements, if you will. But for what we try to do here is like to spark creativity. And if you have any questions, like you know, Howard and I, we love would love to hear from you guys and answer those questions. Anything we can do to help? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, whatever you guys make, we get to see, we 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 become fans of it too. So we have more stuff, you know, to have on our shelves. I mean, I still have some space back there, so you know, definitely <laughs> keep creating, keep making stuff for sure. You know, that's the whole. That's it. You also you just gotta keep. Yeah. It, it, You know, it's basically it's like you know, it's the first rule of thumb to any story making is have an idea, and then put idea to paper. That's it. Absolutely. 
So right now there, I'm just gonna go in with some black script just to for these two last panels. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna I want to do a little mist, and that's the idea is that this could be mist for the montage, and I'll separate that and see it kind of flows with the top, but then facing the water waterfall cave. So I changed the perspective on the top panel, so it's back view, like there are animants with cast shadow, and there's the water, the shield. And this I can fill it in later with like this uh, caption box. But this I know is like I'm, I'm going to put if I need to put anything, I can put it here in the top left hand corner. And I can always fill it in with more details of the beautiful rock face. And uh, here I'm just going to add some. Come on, Ben. There we go. Where? Oh, yeah, maybe I should set my opacity to full there. Okay. So here I'm just going to get. Mage. Please from like facial reaction knows the truth. Although I'm going to flip these, honestly, it's like I realized that these two panels, I actually they have them backwards. This one here where the mouth is like asking questions should be on the top. And the mage here saying that was me. And then the thief, the, like the reaction the behind him. So that way when I do the caption box, because the mage here is like, has the eyes, I can do the caption. I couldn't have some fun. So later on, I'll flip those two. So that's what the challenge for these panels. And then from up here, you can revisit. The telling of the story. So we know that, you know, they will have. You actually, I already drew that. I guess super, you probably just the front of the layer. Yeah, I just want to play. There you go. I'm just going to take out the bottom part because I already know I drew that in. And this here is just so that I, I know for myself personally that this is like mist. So it's like playing with the opacity that that's going to be mist from the cave. It's going to rise up around the rock face to kind of tell the story. Where we have these events that took place prior to the confrontation. So when I pan out, when I know now, like generally where the text is going, as we see from how it's draft here. So panel one, so how's the monster know of and Gemma's head? So we could do the two captions do the characters here easily. And I can add more rock face and show that it's daytime. Uh, the battle scenes, how I broke it up into the montage. We didn't have to go too crazy as long as it tells a story. Now having what he was suggesting with the panels here kind of brings the reader back to reality. So it's here, the top one I would have uh, to show consistency. I would have a line like, you know, I would have a, uh, an edge like, oops. I would definitely give it an edge, like a stroke. So it's like, you know, this, this panel would be, would be, would be square. And so basically, it's like the only three solid panels would be. I'm just going to switch to red right now. So my main panels would be like, you know, this one, this one, and this one. 
So like these are like floating panels that I would move around. But I know now in terms of my layout, as as I'm penciling this, is that this whole background piece is going to be an illustration. So it's like how I have here, you know, I have the witch and the monster form suggestively light with our, our characters over here in silhouette with the waterfall. So then of course the mist is like, you know, everything kind of flows. So we're having that two or the Z in terms of left to right, top to bottom. And this, even a montage, there's a lot of information. It feels as a whole. So it's like, as in terms of narrative of the story, everything's consistent here with the serpent uh, sorceress. So it's like with some of the challenges, like, you know, when I'm looking at it, I would dent then what I would do next step is take this, uh, well, I pol normally I polish it up a bit more. I would put in at least another hour or two. And then once I have it broken down and I would send this straight away to Howard. And then we would do, uh, the next step would be a quick mock up with the word balloons. And because sometimes we may have the opportunity to add more text, to add a little, little hint of detail, you know, a little fact order or something. So if that in the event of this, as you can tell us, like, you know, we could add a caption here on right above the monster if we wanted to. But the way the smoke and the way the composition is, is that this will lend to bottom right hand for you to flip the page. So that's like for here, when we have from the top panel of left to right and our two uh, characters are standing at the, as they're approaching the cave entrance with the slow drip waterfall. And, you know, and then it has like the accounting of the story. So it tells like a bit of a visual narrative. Here, the thief turns to the mage who's cut away. So we're focusing the eyes. So we have that emotion, emotional connection because it says a lot without saying a thing. And then, then, you know, it's like, you know, what happened? That was like, well, I flipped it. But it's like with the close of the mouth is what happened. So you don't need to see just by the eyes, the mage's reaction. And then people, oh, that was you, you know? And then them, and then the, the looming fear that awaits. And that's that suggestiveness because the next page is like, well, what I'm trying to do. And it's like, I know what Howard's trying to do is the big reveal of Meta Ursa. And that's the whole point. It's like, we're trying to do with this panel. It's like, give some backstory. So that way, when the reader flips the next page, you get that, like that nice, like, you know, that uh, great shot and reveal and majesty with proper lighting from the perspective of the two characters. So you're like, you're journeying with them to the cave. So that's some of the challenges when it comes to panel work is to have us to make sure that if I were to take these panels, like this one here and flip to the middle or have them side by side, it would kind of look a little, it would disrupt a bit the flow, but in terms of hiding some of the artwork in the background, the fact that characters suggested because they're not the most important thing in this panel, it's the monster, but just the idea to know that there's two characters around the other side of that wa wall of water. That's all you need. That's that's background, their background. And then your mid ground would be like, you know, the water, but the foreground is the monster, the highlights. That's why I put the whites, you know, just enough, enough there to, to entice you to want to turn that page. So with this here, like the montage, what we did was just very straightforward because we're just going with a, a story. But as you can tell, I'm trying to do it with the motion of left to right. So that everything makes sense. So it's like a bit more center in terms of like, you know, looks different angles of the characters. Give them some uh, some dimension light because, you know, kind of a tight panel. So you can't do too much in those cases there when you can do it's just with their with your terms of your, your drawing is that as you can see it's like these guys are great lay that over fine as a jpeg keep that locked in the background if you want to turn it off and on if you're drawing by hand which I, I used to do i would suggest uh non photo blue pencils start off with your underlayer with the blue pencils which is like these colors this is a classic thing that uh, in animation we used to do all the time and it's like with these blue pencils it's because you can actually set the scanner to not read the blue but I find that unlike the gray, the non-photo blue doesn't smudge when you're drawing. So you know you don't have to wear these gloves. I'm a left I'm left-handed, so we're notorious for having like content graphite on our pencils and all shiny metal. Same thing as like right-handed people. So if you knew, use non-photo blue pencil, one of the things I know is unlike graphite traditional pencils when you're doing your under, just to get your your lay of the land, is that it doesn't smudge. So it's just like you can work away and then you can erase it easily. So then you would do like, you know, with your non photo blue pencil, which you can get at any art store, stationary store. And that's when you see guys, uh, 
you know, when they would draw like these, like this, and then we go over with the black because the black would be so obviously a contrast, but the blues kind of help hide. So guys, when you're doing your original artwork, if you're worried about little hints of blue of your blue pencil showing, you know, honestly, it adds character. You can clean up as best you want. You can actually go into digitally and say a disable cyan and it'll, it'll make it ma go away like magic. But if you're going to do it by hand, you know, don't don't fret. It blends with the paper quite well and it's easy for it to hide the mistake before you know it. You know, it's like there's so much black. You can't even tell that, you know, there was any like, you know, much blue that was there. And by the time you add, say, a color. It's just going to end up hiding it. here see digitally you set a layer over top color and you can just hide that <laughs> if you really want to. so there's all these little tricks that you can do so i wouldn't i wouldn't worry about it so if you're going to draw by hand we we used to use blue pencil all the time and same thing with animation and they're dirt cheap they're really really dirt cheap and they last and the best thing i would suggest is if you're going to if you're going to sharpen them um I'm going to turn, I'm going to go back to camera because I'm going to show you guys some tools. Just to mention on that point, I use retractable ones and uh, the leads for the blue retractables are pretty difficult to come by here in Germany. Uh, there's not yes. much call from apparently, so I had to send off for them. And I think I got them from either Japan or from China. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, they're very, very, uh, very hard to get because all of them, all studios are taking them, but I just use a, a standard pencil. And I find like, if you're going to use, you know, a sharpener, use the ones that like, you know, that turn and so like it won't, it won't break the lead as much, which is frustrating or just use a box cutter or mm -hmm. a, like a, you know, exacto blade that way you can control the edge. So you can get it really, really fine and get a, a wider edge too, just as you would like a calligraphy pen. And one thing too is that these guys, these technical pencils, a lot of us swear and live by. And it's it's not that similar to when you're using a stylus, I find. Like even though it's just weight and bulk, but the terms of the the thickness, the application of the lead. So with this, these uh, this is a stabler pen. These are technical pencils. And uh they're 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 pretty remarkable. It's like, you know, you just you what you do is here and it's like prawns at the end that hold the lead. See? You can bring it back a little bit. Their focus is a little blurry. It's going to sound weird, but if you get a little closer to your face, you probably can be better focus on the pen, pencil. Oh. oh. But, uh, you know, that's a funny thing you mentioned about tools and stuff because, um, oh, should I mention it? Yeah, screw it. We ain't going to care. So Adrian Fona, uh, who works on Runaway, who, work, who worked on Runaways as well as helped create Miss Marvel and drew a slew of those uh, stories, um, was also a friend of mine too. Uh, because I hung out with him before all this stuff at his at his studio slash condo, um, I could see how he works and stuff as I wait for him for lunch for like four hours. Um, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> fun times. Um, he uses uh, a eraser, like the, the uh, plasticini kind of eraser, which is a lot of ours is used. You probably have that. Maybe you can pull apart in shape because it's sort of a fidget toy, I guess. But what he uses to draw, he uses digital, but mainly he uses traditional stuff first. So his all his line work is stuff is done by pencil. And he uses the same mechanical pencil since he started drawing since high school. Um, he actually has a, I think he has, I don't know if he still has it. He had a storage of them because he was always afraid that if the, the company went south, he couldn't draw anymore because he's, that's the only pencil he knows how to draw with. So, and the thing is, if you look at his work, it, it's phenomenally amazing. It's literally his distinct style, right? His lines are not straight, uh, purposely, but they are in a way they're, they're, they're like squiggly straight lines. Ah, it's really weird to say that out loud. But there are like weird, straight, squiggly lines that somehow work. Um, and watching him do it, sort of like, is the most bizarre way of you know, watching some work because you would, you know, like, like Dom or other people who are very traditionally trained, you see the same, you see these like key tools that you're trained to use. 
then you see, and then you have the other spectrum where it's like, I'll just pick up whatever crap pencil I have at home and then just go to town. <laughs> and, and, and then you, you figure out how to work it. So if you can't afford or have access to these tools, don't worry about it. Use anything. Um, and start doing it, and you can make it work. Because you know, if someone can be prolific, a prolific, and do things that, you know, still wow people now with <laughs> mechanical pencils that he's used in high school, you can do it too. So don't limit yourself. But at the same time, don't be don't don't go. This is the only thing I'll use forever. Because then you're locked into that. You keep experimenting with other things, right? Um, I mean, absolutely. yeah, you know, for, absolutely. You know, like even for writing, there's like different software besides Word. Oh my God, besides Word is yes, Google Docs. But it's also free uh, software and apps for script writing. For, for Usually it's for film and radio plays, which no, I don't think anyone really writes anymore and other things, but you can convert that into a comic book script format for yourself. So you have a lot of tools for every avenue of the production line of comic books, for sure. Um, like even when Don mentions, like everybody knows Adobe, products but there's also GIMP which is free uh, if you wanted the a paid version of a really good graphic software I would say Affinity Affinity um, is really good we don't get paid from it for saying this at all we wish we did because I found out about them because I, I just didn't want to pay a subscription based on Adobe because I couldn't afford it because I'm not a full-time artist but I still needed to look at art and do tweaks and stuff so Affinity was at that time I guess it still is actually a very well packaged uh, software uh, a line of software actually uh, that works really well with my laptop that I have. So it's not, you don't have to go after certain key things, be it software or tools or apps and stuff. Use what you have in front of you. I, I won't, now this one I won't mention because they don't want me to, I know they wouldn't mention it. I know an artist who paints Hollywood books and the paint they use isn't like any special paint you get from an art store. It's usually those crappy set paint uh, palette things you get from you know when you buy a when you go to the dollar store and you buy one of those you know paint by number things it, because they figured how to use it and work it and then the way they scan it it makes it look more uh more, I get they want to more more polished than it should but because it's the because it's so cheap and easily access it means from the dollar store right for one thing you'd be Easy shocked hit. guys how many guys are still using the old tips and tricks that they did when they were like poor failing college students <laughs> like we still use the same same thing we're so stingy with our tools we, we we're creatures of habit so it's just like it's it's a tool so it's like anything can be a tool and howard howard's heard of this there was like mike ruth and casey parsons knew all too well i used to do this i used to take coffee stirrers from the second cup and jam them into a straw and cut them like into a fine and then take an elastic band made my own brushes mm. and it's like was i cheap Yes, but I was also, <laughs> but I was also wanted something like to be a multi calligraphy pen that almost did like tattoo, like tattoo needle. And I wanted like a Chinese approach to a piece. So I made this brush, dip it in the ink, and it did like grass. I, I was, I just wanted to do this feel of uh, beautiful grass and then I can flick and have little blades and have little all dots. And it was just a bunch of coffee stirs that I cut in an angle to, to pick up ink and shove them into a straw and tie it with an elastic band. I kept that thing for 10 years. <laughs> well, well. Oh man, Mike, oh Mike, if you ever want to see someone ink with non-traditional tools, you look up Mike, <laughs> he's actually a great friend of ours. He inks with everything and he gets basically, he, cha he gets challenged. So I've seen him ink things, everything from a pine cone to a stem of a leaf to I think a broken toy. Like he'll ink with anything. And the thing is he's not inking commissions necessarily. He's inking covers for like Ninja Turtles. So he's a professional <laughs> paid work. He's inking with crap that he literally just finds on his desk to prove one thing. He's not necessarily the tool that makes you a better artist. It's the skill behind whatever you have at hand. And I truly believe that. And and that's why I love about him because he's like, I'm doing these big projects with these big companies. I'm using the, you know, a piece of wood I found along my walk from my, you know, home, here, done. And he's, he's going at it. And he, he shows the whole process. He has a whole video thing. And he's like, you know, I always laugh. I'm like, Mike, you know, you're probably have spent like zero uh, on your art supplies besides ink. And I wouldn't know if you even pay for that. Do you make your own ink now? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> 
it, it just proves proves a concept that you don't need the you know every single professional tool. And a lot of artists, young artists, go for that. I like I, it makes me kind of cringe because I'm like, I know you're spending so much money on that, but spend more time refining like your skills to find what tools you should use. Because some people only want to work in watercolor because that's what the, that they have a connection with it, and they perfect that to the point where it's crazy. And watercolor, oh, like perfect. David Mack, yeah. Yeah, David Mack is insane with watercolor. It's like he's been doing that mm. forever, and there's like stories I could tell you about him that I've heard from his studio partner uh, Andy Lee. He was who this like when he when he were like st- literally legitly starving artists, and then just painting and drawing 24/7 and sleeping in the studio and stuff for them to be do that. Now I'm not saying you should do that, but. The thing is, it's always that time and effort you you put behind your skills before you go. Okay, this is the tools I need to do what I, I you know I figured I can do be well at this moment. So you know, don't don't kill yourselves over like even the books I showed you. I'm pretty sure in the library. Like when I started out, I just borrowed books from the library, both comic books. Believe it or not, there's comic books. Yeah, the library is your best friend. Really is. Like in terms of like for the comic guys, like you know, it's like you know, for the mainstream. You guys are in the process. It's uh, you know, it, as as you can tell now, it's like the the main like the it's it's all cross, it's all transferable. Like all these skills that we're showing you guys, like even though it's like people will talk about like comic book the lingo and industry, yeah, the print and publishing terms, but the approach in terms of like you know, you get your idea, you have your your five Ws covered, you know, who is who is this character, you know, what's their motive. You know where does this take place when you know it's like so how how do we approach this and like, okay okay and you know, of course the why the motive is like you know the why is everything's like you know how does writer would come with that and now with the drawing aspect see like how we take the script and like why certain comic books were in certain panels why you could look at now i don't i don't like to bash the man like i don't I like to do that but just because it was something that was known before but it's like about bad comic because like everyone knows the name Rob Liefeld. Everyone, <laughs> like, everyone likes to like you know to go on right well, Rob Liefeld. But, but you have to give the man his due. Now he's not the best comic artist in the world. He does what's comfortable with him. People would tear him apart. Like this guy can't draw wrists. He can't draw feet. Everyone has a Michael Jackson nose. But it's like this totally disproportion. Yet, his he he did what worked for him when he started off in the nineties very bold no background very simplified he hasn't changed in all those years but he knew the characters he wanted to create so like when he created cable when he created deadpool we love these characters and now it's like the style we could see the the irony that he was going with he was self-aware for someone who had no art training bear in mind that's one thing people forget but they put as a given uh, they say as a downer rob liefeld had no art training formal art training he used what worked for him and he's been consistent for decades. So you gotta give the man his dues that you know that that's a life build when you look at it, that's a Rob Liefeld comic. And it's like, you know, and he does draw it and he has his approach. And that's the same thing we want to do with you guys. Like, don't let haters, don't let yourself be a hater to yourself. Just have fun. You know, you're doing this for a reason because you have a passion for it. You have to fuel that passion. And all we're doing right now is like, we're just giving you some of the basic theory there that us as professionals do this approach for comics. And what we look at when we look at other people's work, it's like, it's a craft, essentially. And these are little, just little tips of trade there for like this craft that we want to be honest and transparent without like the, we've seen in the exposed, the over elaborated workshops in the past where people talk about it, it sounds like a Tony Robbins seminar. It's like, it's not even about you guys with the story. It's about very formulaic writing and approach. But storytelling has been around there for centuries. It's part of human nature. And when you say like, oh, these story elements repeat themselves, of course they do. They're the legends and mythologies that we love and we endear. So repurpose it. Tell it in your own way, in your own drawing style. If you're Aboriginal, and we had someone who was with us, there's like, I would love to see an Aboriginal art style graphic novel. Uh, Howard and I, we want to do stuff like La Manoir, the Chinese manga comics that we grew up with. We want to, we're working on something that's along those lines because it's something we always wanted to do. And I encourage you guys to do, you know, with that same devotion, the same passion to follow through with your projects. And I hope that everything today has been like what we've done has been some insight as to 
how comics are like being made. And you can find us on social media. How Howard is is readily available. Like you know, he's got blog posts, a lot of information. He's a wealth of articles. I recommend that you check out. And for myself, I'm much more humble. But if you reach out to me and send me a message, it might not be right away. But I will get back to you, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. On that note, wait. Did you just call me not humble? But anyways, oh. no. I said you're humble. <laughs> okay. I thought you said not. I said mine is humble. Uh, My social media is humble. Okay. Uh, sure. But on, I mean, I don't put a lot uh, of artwork. I put a lot of food. Like this, this video is me dressed up in a Godzilla suit. But that's 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 a good point. Actually, <laughs> on that note, on that note, is, does anybody want to share uh, what you guys have been working on? Because we'll yeah. love to see it. Let's go back to Rob. Go ahead. You take over and spotlight Ooh, Rob. Hey. Anyone wants to share stuff, just let us know in the chat or right, yell out. Go here, yeah, Rob, Rob, Rob. Where's Alrighty, Rob? so. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, I concentrated on. Uh, I haven't done the final two yet. So we got these guys outside the cave. Uh, the cave here, if you can see that, skeletons outside. And then uh, moving on to, I think, what everybody's seen already. Uh, which is this main panel with the uh, uh, the montage of the girls learning their craft. Uh, not totally clear from this sketch that the mage is eyeing up <laughs> his uh, young protege and not really uh, paying that much attention to the uh, serpent uh, sorceress. But the serpent sorceress, oh yes, that's right, uh, that's the... Uh, the uh, witch is covering her bump here and then when the serpent sorceress finds out of course uh, she ain't too happy and then uh, here if you can see it the serpent sorceress um, cursing the cursing the witch and there's the unborn child there uh, I don't know if it'll help anybody but if I'm okay uh, then I just wanted to show what I do with with any scripts that I find that other people do uh, write uh, if I have to work them. So I, I worked on a book this year, uh, an anthology, and my nephew sent over some uh, some scripts, so I worked with those. And um, where's my Zoom meeting? Am I okay to share? Oh yes, mm -hmm. there you go. Okay, so basically this is this is Howard's script, and it just makes it so much easier for me to see. Yes. Yeah, like yeah. break it up. So, for example, there's the intro, and then panel one is, you know, one uh, one row of an of a uh, word file. I just use tables just to make everything like really, you know, like uh, so I get a good overview of everything. Mm -hmm. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you've got the um, yeah, you've got the dialogues here, and so it just makes everything easier. Uh, there's this clear let's see clear borders between what's going on yeah just in case anyone hadn't come up with that for themselves maybe it'll help somebody out there oh yeah i mean that's an excellent point i do i do something similar everybody, oh, yeah. has, own, everybody has a, a system or should find a system that works for them a lot of uh artists including writers we make notes on the you know the borders is where everything happens but yeah a lot of artists you know you should you shouldn't i'm, I'm gonna put this if you print it or you keep it digital, a script, it's for you to mark up. Go nuts because you have to make it easier for you to work, to do your thing. You shouldn't be spending a bulk of your time trying to remember, what did he just say? What did he write? Huh? <laughs> That's That means you didn't do your, your initial job because you want to make it easy for you. You want to be able to be like how you go to your car or your front door and just shove the key in the keyhole without thinking about it. Do I need the key? Is the key supposed to be facing up? Is it supposed to be facing me? Wait, no, because once you do it, once you go through it once ago, I know if I hold my key like this, it's going to go in the keyhole. I turn it and I'm home <laughs> and I'm doing whatever. And it's it's funny how a lot of uh, a lot of people don't mention that uh, with to both writers and artists is that you know make notes, circle things, oh, yeah. highlight it, whatever works for you. You know, it's like if 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 you know, I know some people that like, I highlight stuff, but it's really confusing. I just follow this person's system like that don't highlight like, but he taught me that. No, he taught you a, a one of millions of ways of how to do it is to illustrate how you can. If you're better with, you know, making pen marks, go for it. You know, 
no scripts, no like even if when Dom like if, if, when, like you know, in the real in the real world Dom would send me his his uh, layouts and stuff, his roughs, I might go, no, we need this scene. You can you know you shouldn't have cut this out and make notes like right on top of it or draw on top of it. So I know I should envision it like this, whatever. Maybe this would be better or find visual references from Google and then slap it on top of it. Does that mean I'm just you know by destroying his work? No, I'm literally going. This is you know we're basically adding things to the story that I at the end of the day you're trying to make a story the, the best possible story possible. Exactly, uh, and no, Haley. No, really, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying like I noticed like, that Haley was just fine or fine like you know it's, it's like her story is all uh it's, you say that it's all in my head still. That's fine. That's and it's like was. it's it's just like uh, what Howard is saying is exactly the point. It's like you know what? Yeah, yeah, it's in your head, but. Yeah, in a little notebook, just write some notes and do the mind map. If, if you remember last week's session with Howard, when, when he was doing, he was doing some doodles and just random words for the story. Uh, and then, but it was incredibly helpful. And he, you know, eventually he scratched things out. So it's, it starts with pen and paper. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have it around, but I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out as we talk. But it doesn't have to look nice. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, but I mean, it sounds really weird that, but I see so many portfolios where people are like, this is my work and this is how I develop my ideas. I'm like, that's that's totally a lie. But um, like, what do you mean? Like, so you don't have a worksheet or like you know, chicken scratches, anything like that? Like, uh, but who wants to see that? Uh, I do. Um, if you if you want me to look at how your your process is and if it works for you or not. Um, and, and, and it's really bizarre uh, that people don't want to show that because they're afraid that you know you're gonna get laughed at or whatever uh, and whatnot. I'm gonna share my screen in a second here, so I show you. And the thing is, this was from, from the carrot development workshop that we had last week. Yes, it was last week. Come on, here we go. So this is actually. I mean, I start in a. I always start in the top left of the page, and I always go. I never make it. Uh, I always go. Oh, like, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bailey, you remember this? <laughs> so, so at the end of the day, it looks it, it looks like a horrid mess at the end of the day, really, right? <laughs> but I know how it flows because it's my worksheet. You don't have to work it. My worksheet, without drawing columns, if you look at it, it technically starts out as a column, but then it will just veer off into other things. I have ideas popping up because I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I might do that. And I'll start out with something. Go, no, you know what? I'm going to change it to this. I usually don't scratch out like this. I usually do the line so I can go back. But when I know it's definitely that I really not the direction I want, I can do that. And I circle things. Like my own system, I do like circles and boxes, and they mean different things for me. And then I don't have to highlight because if I start highlighting it, I don't know. I, it, to me, I, it's, it slows down my speed. As I said, it way works differently. I want to pop my ideas down as fast as I can. I don't care a crap about spelling because definitely could change that later. You know. Um, Do you mind if I uh, take over share screen for a second? Because guys, I just want you to look at what Howard has here. And you saw that drawing. Now we went from that. That was number one. And that was from last week. I'm just going to go back here. And then I had mine that I started. Yeah. Exactly. So that's like from the panels. And then from that, we had our. I'm just going to get rid of this here. And then I started off with. See, that's I took a screen chapter. I realized every note. So there's Howard's notes. And from that, I had you saw the other one. And then I started working on a breakdown to get this shape. Even though we I didn't know how much this this monstrous form will appear. I just need to know a bit of an idea aesthetically of what the characters look like. So the witch here, we have like the monster form and suggestively the human features with this mask that I envisioned early on. And then from there, once we got the script, so this sets the tone, looking at the garb and everything and how we how we designed it. Now we have this whole sequence that we've roughed out, you know, to but we can actually start penciling. And that way we have an idea also for the text and where about the word balloons. So from that, well, it all started with the writer Howard's notes like this. From that, all these points for this world building of a story into now what where it starts where you actually start actually making a comic book and you can see how the panels and we have the now you know the theory about why we do things with the layout why certain panels are facing a certain direction you guys now get you know like the thought process and and to be honest we're just validating what you guys deep down already know and what you guys suspected we're just reaffirming that 
and the, the doubts that you have you know we're hoping that those have kind of alleviated and it's like you know with the notebook Haley I, I saw that you got yourself a brand new uh, notebook for your ideas I'm really excited to hear that and it start, all starts from that I, I have stacks of notebooks too you know and Howard Howard's got yellow pages <laughs> no. yellow pages of text I mean I, I I use anything to write to be honest with you I mean if you if you if you do the back to school my god this is like back when I started working uh, back to school stuff you know you get like shipping notebooks from you know that in staples or you know i still i still have like a huge stack of like lined paper since like high school because i overbought them when they were like a like i think a penny uh for a pack and stuff so i have that since high school for christ's sake i'm still using them my kids are using them but i use them for everything because it doesn't matter what you write on you just want to like translate that what's in here on a page so that it sounds weird so other people can see it and then add to it um and yes you can you know do it vocally and stuff like that but when you put it on the page it makes it uh it concretes the idea we want to start it so you can start building on it because when you build a foundation that's when you can build your story from that so definitely you don't be afraid to pop out all your ideas it could be bad i mean i changed my stuff four or five times all the way until the, the script before i sent it to to dom today so it happens that's how it works so and that's it and sometimes like some scenes you're just going to test it out that's why this whole breakdown with the panels is that before we commit going into like heavy detail be it a battle scene that's what we could figure out and that's what like, obviously it's like you know normally I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys if we were doing something for dc or marvel right now i'd probably be given on what uh we have a week mm -hmm. this sort yeah this yeah. sort of like from final pages to ink it's like here's the script here's the breakdown and you don't get like a full week it's a business week it's a monday to friday thing how they see it so normally we catch up on the weekends so when you see some of us on social media like are doing drawings that can't last like that it's because during the week, there's all these talks and means to figure stuff out. And then once it's figured out, you see, like, after a while, because practice and Ken is very, very candy. He says, like, I do poses that I know I can do on the fly because he's done so many. And it's also because he knows like, if I, I just need to bend the knee and there we go. And then I just have to do this. So he does. He picks his battles. So if he's doing a whole comic, certain pages seem repetitive, but he'll change a certain detail to make it different because he knows that his main focus is the scene where the whole Justice League is just at the watchtower. They're all talking. It's a very tense moment. Meanwhile, there's stuff going on. I mean, and then scene requires a lot more detail, a lot more focus. So it's, with this, it's like, you know, that's that's the difference between mainstream. But I'm telling you, you guys can do your independent comics, do your own style, whatever is best comfortable for you and for the tone and stuff that you guys want to do you don't have to abide or conform to any form of standard but the theory is sound i will say our and i are always empathize because we're old school the theory for sequential art because of the fact that you can transfer the skills to other medium is sound so it's like we're hoping that you know you guys took something from us today and uh you know, all i can say is like happy drawing i cannot thank you guys enough uh, for joining and I look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. I mean, um, thank you for uh, attending uh, Making Comics for the First Time Part 2 of 2. This is it for us for...